Chapter 10 Boriskir Bridge The four riders, Sirik, Dalzell, Adon, and Kelimvor, stopped their horses at the crest of a bluff. After three rigorous days of riding, their uneasy alliance was still intact. The night was a moonless one, but the clouds, which were drifting into and out of different patterns of geometric precision, quivered with milky incandescence. The result was a shifting, silvery light that illuminated the land with a dusk-like gleam. The bluff overlooked the shimmering currents of the winding water. Ahead and to the company's left, five stone arches spanned the river, Boriskir Bridge. In front of the bridge, the remains of a perpetual tent city hugged both sides of the road. All that remained of it now were fire scars, a few charred horses' carcasses, and the fire-blackened foundations of the city's only two permanent buildings. On both sides of the deserted settlement, brush as high as a man's head covered the river's floodplain. Kelimvor didn't even wonder what had happened to the nomadic city. In these times of chaos, it could have been anything. The winged horses are over there, Adon said, pointing a hundred feet east of the bridge. Two pegasi were cavorting low in the sky. Then let's go, Dalzell ordered gruffly, urging his horse forward. Ten minutes ago, when they had first seen the pegasi, the four had debated the wisdom of chasing the winged horses. Adon had won the argument, claiming that the pegasi were as intelligent as men and might have seen some sign of midnight and Bahal. Unseen to the four riders, the objects of their search were lying hidden in the closest fire-blackened foundation. Midnight was asleep, bound and gagged, her head resting on the saddlebag with the tablet. Bahal was watching the frolicking pegasi, his eyes burning with an appetite for their lives. Finally, the Lord of Murder could resist the temptation no longer. He decided to go after the winged horses. If Midnight tried to flee while he was gone, it was just as well. Mirkel's plan called for her to escape near Dragonspear Castle, but Bahal could see no harm in letting her go earlier. The fallen god thought about taking the tablet with him, but decided against it. If the mage woke and found it gone, she would realize he had lied to her about it being worthless. Besides, it would only be in his way while he hunted. Bahal's contemplation came to an abrupt end when he heard a horse nicker in the brush ahead. The pegasi were still sailing through the air, but he was sure that the sound had come from the ground. That meant someone was out there. Without making a sound, the Lord of Murder climbed out of the foundation and disappeared into the heavy brush. A minute later, when she was confident Bahal had truly left her unattended, Midnight opened her eyes. She sat up and began pushing her hands back and forth in her bindings. The magic user had been working her hands against the leather thongs all day and had finally stretched them far enough that she now might be able to free herself. Meanwhile, several hundred feet away, Dalzell's horse reared at the edge of a dry gully. On the opposite bank, something rustled the spindly bushes. The Zentish lieutenant reached for his sword, then a man's form leaped from the hedge. The horse reared again, lashing out with its forehooves. Two sharp cracks sounded as it struck the attacker. The dark form growled, then grabbed one of the horse's forelegs. There was a hollow pop, then tendons and cartilage began cracking. When the horse dropped back to the ground, whinnying in terror and pain, it was missing a leg. Dalzell leaped free as his mount collapsed. On the other side of the fallen horse stood Kay Deverell's form. He hardly looked human. His body had bloated and taken on a doughy texture made more sickening by the silvery light of the luminescent clouds. Because it had been used without regard to preserving it, the body was covered with wounds and bruises from head to toe. The fecund air of infection hung in the air around the Avatar. The four riders immediately knew they had found Bahal, or rather, Bahal had found them. Choking his gorge back, Kelimvor spurred his mount forward and lifted his sword. Bahal raised his fist and rushed forward. Kelimvor transferred his free hand from the reins to the saddle horn so he could lean down to Bahal's level. They met with a crash and Kelimvor's sword sliced into soft flesh. However, Bahal's fist also found its mark. The warrior slipped from his stirrups and landed on his back. The impact knocked the breath from his lungs. 
Sirik came next, leaping over Kelimvor the instant the fighter hit the ground. The thief's sword flashed. A sharp hiss sounded as its red blade bit into the avatar. Bahal roared in anger and turned. The lord of murder grabbed a handful of hide, then tore a long strip of flesh off the flank of the thief's horse. Sirik's mount screeched an alarm and kicked, throwing its rider. As Sirik fell, Bahal retreated into the hedge on the far bank. Adon spurred his mount forward, barely clearing Kelimvor as the warrior tried to rise. The horse's hooves landed in front of Kelimvor's nose, then Adon galloped on in pursuit of Bahal. The cleric's horse crashed into the hedge and slowed to a dead stop, unable to penetrate the thick brush into which Bahal had disappeared. The horse then slipped down a steep bank and stumbled, spilling Adon onto the creek's bed. By the time the young cleric and his three companions recovered, Bahal was gone. Sirik's horse had run off. Kelimvor's and Adon's mounts were nervously pacing up and down the dry wash. Dalzell's horse lay on the ground whimpering, its left leg had been snapped off at the knee, leaving a white, rounded knob exposed. Approaching the wounded beast from behind, Dalzell quickly ended his mount's suffering. Afterward, he said, No animal should have to face the likes of that. Nor any man, Adon replied, but here we are. Sirik quickly joined them. His eyes sparkled with excitement, and the blade of his sword was deep red. Dalzell, take the point, he ordered. Kel, Adon, take the flanks. We'll flush him out. And do what? Dalzell demanded. The burly Zentilar seemed a prudent and not altogether evil man, and Kelimvor had trouble understanding why Dalzell followed the likes of Sirik. In the three days they had ridden together, Kelimvor had come to regard the man not altogether unkindly. We'll kill Bahal, of course, Sirik said. You're mad, Kelimvor replied, shaking his head. Sirik turned. Mad, he exclaimed. The thief lifted his sword, being careful not to appear threatening. He merely wanted Kelimvor to look at the blade. Mad? Perhaps. But with this, I wounded Bahal. Imagine, I injured a god. We chased him away, Adon said. That's all. He picked something out of the sand, then held it up for the others to see. It was a dirty, bloated thing, a hand severed at the wrist. We can hack the Avatar to pieces, but we'll never kill Bahal. No, Sirik insisted. I can destroy him. I can feel it. Maybe we'll kill Bahal and maybe we won't. Kelimvor grumbled, but that's not why we're here. We came to find Midnight. Look! Adon pointed skyward. The clouds had arranged themselves into a mass of perfect rhombuses, but that was not what had excited the cleric. The pegasi were flying away. They're fleeing, Adon said. They must have seen Bahal. Kelimvor nodded. We've got to hurry. Why? Dalzell asked. Adon just said we couldn't. Bahal has midnight and the tablet. He could be leaving, the green-eyed fighter replied. By the time Kelimvor finished the sentence, Sirik was halfway up the bank. Kelimvor was soon close behind the thief. Adon and Dalzell had no choice except to follow. At the top of the gully they split into two groups. Dalzell and Sirik took the left flank, Adon and Kelimvor the right. In the heavy brush, the two pairs soon lost sight of each other. Kelimvor and Adon moved as quietly as possible, as much to hide their position from Sirik as from Bahal. Midnight was here somewhere. If they found her, the thief would turn on them the instant she was safe. They preferred to make that eventuality as difficult as possible. Dalzell's surprised yell announced that he and Sirik had found the Lord of Murder. Kelimvor and Adon went toward the scream, moving as rapidly as possible without making much noise. When they finally reached the battle, it nearly took Kelimvor by surprise. Dalzell's burly form rushed past him a few yards ahead, his black armor gleaming in the glowing cloud's silvery light. Bahal was only four steps behind the Zentish lieutenant. Then came Sirik, slipping noiselessly behind the foul god, maneuvering for a surprise attack. Kelimvor started forward, but Adon quickly pulled him back. Let them deal with Bahal, the cleric whispered. 
We should find midnight. Without warning, Bahal stopped and spun on his pursuer, jabbing at Sirik with the sharp bone protruding from his severed wrist. The fallen god followed the jab with an open-handed strike from his other hand. Sirik barely dodged the blows, then returned the attack with a wild slash and backed away. Dalzell finally noticed his pursuer had turned on his commander, then stopped and turned around. Moving cautiously but quickly, he advanced on Bahal's back. The Lord of Murder ignored the other Zentilar and moved toward Sirik. The god's attention was focused intently on the red blade, as if it was his only concern. The thief stopped, then made a foolhardy lunge. Bahal dodged easily, but Sirak followed the blow with a ferocious kick and caught the avatar in the ribs. Bahal did not fall. Instead, he grabbed Sirak's leg and grinned. Remembering what Bahal had done to Dalzell's horse, the thief turned and tried to dive away. Luckily, Sirak pulled his leg free and landed in a somersault. Bahal sneered and advanced, moving out of Dalzell's striking range just as the Zentilar lifted his sword. Afraid to take the time necessary to stand, Sirik continued forward with a series of rolls. Bahal followed three feet behind, prepared to strike the instant the thief stopped moving. They need help, Kelimvor whispered. Do you think they'll help us? Adon objected. No, but— Save your strength, the cleric insisted. Whether it's Bahal or Sirik, there's no doubt we'll have to kill the winner. If Sirik had been fighting the god of assassins alone, Kelimvor would have honored Adon's wish without hesitation. The thief deserved to die. But so far, Dalzell had treated them fairly. Kelimvor did not like standing by while the Zentish lieutenant risked his life. Sensing his friend's thoughts, Adon suggested a more compelling reason to stay out of the action. Now's our best chance to free Midnight, while Sirik keeps Bahal busy. Kelimvor sighed and nodded. Then let's go find her. Adon started crawling around the melee. Only two hundred feet away, Midnight had finally pulled a hand free of her bindings. A few moments earlier, she had heard a scream in the brush and knew that Bahal was attacking someone. Though Midnight had no idea who the victim was, the magic user wanted to help him. She freed herself from the leather thongs and her gag, gingerly laid the saddlebags over her raw shoulder, then peered over the edge of the foundation. As Kelimvor and Adon circled around the battle, the warrior could not help pausing to watch. Dalzell finally caught Bahal and swung with his mightiest stroke. His blade whistled straight for the avatar's neck. The Lord of Murder ducked the attack with casual ease. He turned and met Dalzell with his stump, plunging the sharp bone deep into the soldier's shoulder. Dalzell screamed and dropped his sword, but did not fall or retreat. Instead, the Zentilar stepped forward to wrestle the god, tearing at the avatar's eyes with his left hand. Sirik used this respite to good effect, standing and moving toward Bahal. Once again, the avatar had turned his back to the thief. Sirik lifted his sword and charged, hoping to take advantage of the distraction Dalzell provided by wrestling with the fallen god. Adon grabbed Kelimvor's shoulder, tearing his attention away from the battle. Who's that? The cleric pointed at a dark silhouette creeping toward the battle on its hands and knees. Through the heavy brush and in the dim light, Kelimvor could not see the shadow well enough to see who it was, or even if it was a man or a woman. I can't tell, Kelimvor said softly. But whoever it is, he's interested in this fight. He glanced back to the battle. Sirik was at Bahal's back. The thief attacked with a vicious slash he hoped would cleave the avatar down to the breastbone. But Bahal heard him coming and, easily breaking free of Dalzell's hold, pivoted out of the way. The god of assassins caught Sirik's arm, then used the thief's own momentum to throw him ten feet into the brush. As Sirik sailed past, Dalzell snatched his sword off the ground, then plunged the blade into the avatar's ribcage. Bahal snarled and kicked the Zentish soldier in the stomach. Dalzell fell backward and landed with a crash. The Lord of Murder casually plucked Dalzell's sword from between his ribs and tossed it aside. Then he leaped onto his opponent's prone form, thrusting the splintered stump of his wrist into Dalzell's throat. 
Dalzell screamed once, then fell quiet. Sirik scrambled to his feet, shaking his head. He had heard Dalzell's scream and knew that Bahal had killed his lieutenant. Though the thief did not feel anything resembling grief, there was a hollow sensation in the pit of his stomach. Dalzell had been a valuable aid, and Sirik would miss his service. Upon hearing the terrible scream, Midnight knew Bahal had killed again. Then, through the brush, she saw the Avatar rise and turn toward another victim. The magic user could not see who Bahal was attacking, for the evening's silvery light was too dim to reveal his face at this distance. But whoever it was, Midnight did not want to abandon him to the fallen god. The magic user summoned the incantation for a lightning bolt. Since imprisoning Bahal at High Horn, she had not used her magic successfully. There was no reason to believe it would work now, but that did not matter. She could not help Bahal's victims any other way, and if she did nothing, the Lord of Murder would kill them anyway. As soon as the proper gestures and words came to mind, the magic user stood and pointed at the Avatar. Adon and Kelimvor both saw the silhouette rise, then they heard a feminine voice reciting an incantation. Magic! The men hissed the words in the same instant. They pressed their bodies flat to the ground. Neither knew what to expect, but both were sure it would be hazardous. Midnight finished her incantation and a lightning bolt shot from her finger. Then it abruptly gathered into a brilliant ball of sputtering light. The bright sphere rose over the thicket, hanging behind Kelimvor and Adon like a tiny star. The shining globe illuminated the ground within a hundred yards as clearly as if it were the midday sun. In the bright light, Kelimvor and Adon immediately recognized the dark-haired spellcaster. Midnight! they cried, rising simultaneously. Bahal and Sirik also noticed the tiny sun's appearance, but could not see what had caused it. The globe hung between them and midnight. All they could see was a circle of brilliant light. Sirix swore, then focused all of his attention on the Avatar. He did not know what had caused the light. What he did know was that, without Dalzell's aid, he was no longer a match for the Lord of Murder. The thief wasted no time cursing Kelimvor and Adon for abandoning him. He knew he'd been a fool for expecting them to come to his aid. After squinting at the miniature sun for a moment, the Lord of Murder nonchalantly turned back to the thief and advanced. Sirik slashed. Bahal easily dodged, slapping the thief's sword hand aside. Sirik kicked, hoping to keep his attacker away. The Avatar blocked the foot, then stepped in close and clipped his opponent's jaw with a fist as hard as stone. Sirik's ears rang and his head swam. He tried to swing his sword, but Bahal hit him once more. The thief felt his body going limp. The Lord of Murder struck his jaw again, then his stomach, then continued pummeling Sirik until he dropped his weapon and flopped to the ground in a half-conscious heap. While Bahal battered Sirik, Adon and Kelimvor rushed toward midnight. The magic user's miscast lightning bolt hung at their backs, its overpowering glow casting their faces into deep shadows. It did not matter. Midnight recognized their voices and rushed to meet them. "'How did you find me?' the raven-haired mage cried, hugging Kelimvor. She spun him around so the miniature sun was at her back and she could see his face. "'Never mind. It's just good to see both of you. I'm so glad you're still—' The magic user broke off in mid-sentence. She was going to say, "'Alive,' which returned her thoughts to whoever was currently fighting the god of assassins— she still had not seen his face. "'Who's fighting Bahal?' she asked, hooking a thumb over her shoulder. She still could not take her eyes off Kelimvor's face. Kelimvor and Adon looked toward the fight, squinting against the glare of the miniature sun. Sirik, Kelimvor answered. "'We're working together.' Midnight raised an eyebrow. "'Together?' "'It's a long story,' Adon said." We don't have time to explain. The miniature sun flared brilliant white, sending daggers of pain through the eyes of both Kelimvor and Adon. Then a thunderclap sounded, and a shockwave knocked them to the ground. After the blinding flash, the thicket grew relatively dim. Only the silvery incandescence of the geometric clouds lit the brush. Bahal dropped Sirik, 
battered and bloody, and looked to where the globe of light had been. Fifty feet away, Midnight was picking herself up off the ground, but her two companions still lay holding their hands over their eyes. You escaped, Bahal called to the mage. I'll have to punish you for that. Without responding, Midnight looked from Bahal to Sirik's bruised and bloodied body, then back to the Avatar's face. Without taking her eyes off the vile god, she retrieved the saddlebags from where they had fallen, then laid them over her shoulder. To her friends, she hissed, Get up! But Kelimbor and Adon had been looking toward the ball of light when it had burst. When they opened their eyes, they saw nothing but white. I'm blind! Kelimbor cried. To his left, Adon groaned, I... I can't see anything either. Then be quiet! Midnight said, don't draw attention to yourselves. The magic user did not need to worry. Bahal was thinking about other things. It had never occurred to him that, upon slipping her bonds, Midnight would not flee immediately. Now he had to recapture her, or the woman would know that he had let her escape. If that happened, she might figure out what he and Miracle really wanted from her. The fallen god walked toward Midnight. Stay where you are. Midnight warned. Bahal snickered. Why? You don't have the power to kill me. Yet. Before Kelimvor's eyes, the white faded to gray. Perhaps his blindness was temporary. We've got to do something, Adon whispered. His vision had returned enough so that he could vaguely see a shape advancing toward Midnight. What? Kelimvor responded. Attack. Perhaps Midnight. We can't. I'm still blind. Adon fell silent, knowing Kelimvor was right. Unable to see clearly, they would only get in the way. As the Lord of Murder walked toward the mage, Sirik began to stir. The thief was surprised he was still alive, for Bahal's blows had felt like hammer strikes. He ached from head to toe, and the simple act of breathing sent waves of agony through his torso. Still, Sirik knew that if he did not act, he would lose his chance to capture Midnight and the Tablet of Fate. He retrieved his sword. You've tasted Bahal's blood, he whispered. If you want more, help me. Yes, more, the sword responded. I'll help you. The words came to mind in a sultry female voice. The sword's hilt warmed in his hand, and Sirik felt vigor and strength flow back into his body. He rose to his knees, then stood and stumbled after the Lord of Murder. Bahal stopped moving forward. Surrender, Midnight. As an afterthought, he added, And give me the tablet. No, Midnight replied, stepping away. You have no choice, Bahal said, gesturing at Kelimvor's prone form. Midnight summoned the incantation for another lightning bolt, then pointed at Bahal. I have plenty of choices. Most of them involve killing you. The Lord of Murder studied the woman uncomfortably, knowing she might be able to carry out her threat. Destroying my avatar will kill your friends, and possibly you, too, the god said. You know that. Midnight frowned, remembering the immense power that Torm and Bane's destruction had unleashed outside Tantris, and Mistress Death had leveled a castle in Cormir. This time, at least, Bahal was telling the truth. She could not kill him without destroying her friends. Then she saw Sirik creeping up behind Bahal, his sword poised to strike. The thief's body looked battered beyond recognition. Midnight found it incredible that Sirik could still move, much less move as silently as he did. You have no choice, the Lord of Murder repeated. Before Bahal could notice she was looking elsewhere, Midnight returned her attention to the god's face. I'll destroy you anyway, she said. What do I have to lose? Sirik was only two steps away from Bahal. Midnight let the lightning bolt drop from her mind, then called the incantation for a teleportation spell. The mage knew that her plan was born of desperation, for she could not remember the last time her magic had worked properly— but if it worked at all, the results would be better than surrendering to Bahal, or dying in the explosion if Sirik's attack were successful. Bahal twisted Deverell's torn lips into a smile. 
If you do as I ask, your friends will live. Sirik's boot scraped a rock. The Avatar's face betrayed alarm and he whirled. The thief brought his red blade down and plunged it deep into Bahal's breast. You fool! the Lord of Murder screamed. The blade's color deepened to vibrant burgundy, and the fallen god howled in rage. His roar was as loud as thunder and as eerie as the wail of a ghost. At least I killed a god before I died, Sirik said triumphantly through clenched teeth. At the same time, the raven-haired mage uttered the words to her incantation. Bahal's scream ended and his body exploded. Then the earth dropped away beneath Midnight and her allies. A flickering ochre flame. A candle stuck in a bottle in the corner of a wooden table, its wood gray and cracked and as dry as tinder. A flimsy, unpadded chair in a dark, wet room hidden in the sewers of Waterdeep. This was what his glory had come to. Ao would pay, Miracle swore. The Lord of the Dead did not enjoy modesty in accommodation, he did not enjoy hiding from mortals, and he most certainly did not enjoy being confined to the realms. For all these indignities, Ao and Helm would pay. But he had to be careful. The Lord of the Dead had seen what came of carelessness. Tantris had been a disaster, and it had only been through his foresight that Mirkel had not suffered the same fate as Bane. He was in the realm of mortals now. In a certain sense he was mortal, for now he could perish, as Bane and Mistra and Torm had perished. Imagine, the ruler of the dead dying. The thought would have made Mirkel laugh, had it not been so unnerving. No, it would not do to go meeting rivals head to head. He had to remain hidden, where enemies could not find him, where they had no reason to suspect his presence. He had to work through agents, to plot out intricate plans and alternate contingencies, as he had concerning Midnight and the Tablets of Fate. It would have been a simple matter to kill the dark-haired magic user and take the tablet she held. The Lord of the Dead had agents and priests all over the land, and no one could survive the unrelenting series of attacks he could bring to bear. But then his followers would have had to deliver the tablet to him in Waterdeep, and none were as capable a delivery person as Midnight. Of course, Mirkel had no intention of letting the woman keep the tablet. He would not feel secure until both tablets of fate were in his hands. Indirectly, that was why he had not ordered the magic user's death. He needed her to go to Bone Castle and recover the second tablet, too. The Lord of the Dead had plans within plans, and they all depended on the woman. Bahal had simply wanted to capture Midnight's entire company, then use her friends as hostages to force her to recover the second tablet. But so far, Midnight had displayed an alarming fortitude, and Miracle believed she would easily thwart such crude methods of persuasion. It was wiser to trick her into doing his will, to make her think that retrieving the second tablet was her idea. To accomplish this, Bahal had captured her, then let her trick him into revealing the second tablet's hiding place. Even this plan had a weakness, and the Lord of the Dead was not blind to it. Once the woman had both tablets, she could easily return them to Helm. To prevent that, Mirkel had instructed Bahal to let her escape near Dragonspear Castle once she knew about the castle's hidden entrance to the realm of the dead. At Dragonspear, Mirkel had prepared a trap to recover the first tablet. This trap would also force Midnight to go to the realm of the dead to recover the tablet in Bone Castle. Of course, no strategy could foresee every eventuality. That was why Mirkel made a habit of contacting Bahal to confirm that everything was proceeding according to plan. The Lord of the Dead concentrated on the candlelight. The flame wavered and flared. Mirkel waited, expecting it to coalesce itself into the ugly, bloated head of Bahal's avatar. But the flame remained aflame. Mirkel tried once again to work his variation of a commune spell, and again the flame remained aflame. The Lord of the Dead considered the possibility that magical chaos had caused his spell to fail, but rejected the idea. 
If the failure had been due to chaos, the magic would likely have misfired somehow. His spell had simply failed to go off. That could only mean Bahal had perished. The Avatar had been destroyed and the Lord of Murder's essence had been dispersed through the realms and the plains. The thought distressed Mirkel, and not only because it reminded him of his own mortality. Of all the gods, perhaps he and Bahal had been the closest. Bahal presided over the process of death and killing, while Mirkel had dominion over those already dead. Theirs was a symbiotic relationship. One could hardly exist without the other. Mirkel allowed himself a moment of distress for his fellow god's passing, then turned his thoughts back to his plans. The last time they had communed, Bahal had reported that the woman knew about the entrance to the realm of the dead. Therefore, she would be going toward Dragonspear Castle. His plan remained unchanged, save that the woman would arrive at the castle unescorted. He could still spring his surprise and separate her from the first tablet. But Mirkel was far from happy. If she had defeated Bahal, Midnight possessed the power to counter his trap and take the first tablet with her into the realm of the dead. Then, if she succeeded at Bone Castle, she would have both tablets. After returning to the realms, it would be a simple matter to find a celestial stairway and present them to Helm. If that happened, Mirkel would be defeated. He and Bane were the ones who had stolen the tablets of fate. By now, Ao had surely discovered that, and Mirkel doubted there would be a reward if he returned what he had stolen in the first place. Though the Lord of the Dead had not revealed this to Bahal, he had no use for either of the tablets. His sole purpose for recovering them was to be sure that no one ever returned them to the plains, for Mirkel suspected the overlord of the gods would destroy him as soon as the tablets were recovered. But the Lord of the Dead knew that preventing the return of the tablets was a temporary solution. Sooner or later, Eo would grow tired of waiting and deal out his punishment anyway. If Mirkel wanted to survive, he had to strike first. And that was why, through another complicated series of plots, the Lord of the Dead had arranged for Midnight to recover the second tablet. After stealing the tablets of fate, Mirkel and Bane had each taken one and hidden it away. Bane had placed his in Tantris. Mirkel had hidden his tablet in Bone Castle, in the heart of the realm of the dead. To prevent anybody from stealing the artifact, the Lord Mirkel had placed a trap on it. The minute Midnight took the second tablet out of the realm of the dead, she would release the realm's denizens and all the spirits of the dead. When that happened, Mirkel intended to be waiting. He would kill Midnight and take the second tablet from her. Then, utilizing the same methods he used to power Bane's avatar in Tantris, he would harness the souls of the dead, this time for his own avatar. After that, he would be prepared to meet Eo. Mirkel was far from certain that even given the energy of millions of souls, he would prevail. Above all, the Lord of the Dead hated to reveal himself to his enemies. Still, this desperate plan was his only chance to turn defeat into victory. But, if Midnight took her tablet to the realm of the dead, Mirkel's plan would grow even more dangerous. When she returned to the realms with both tablets, it would prove difficult to find her in the confusion accompanying the emergence of his denizens. The mage would be able to slip away and take the tablets to Helm. The safest plan, Mirkel knew, was to make sure she did not take the first tablet into the realm of the dead with her. He would have to take extra precautions at Dragonspear Castle to ensure the mage lost the tablet she had recovered in Tantras. The sword remained in his hand. Siric knew that and no more. His thoughts drifted aimlessly through the fog that had become his mind. He felt as though he had been beaten to death. Fists. Fists as hard as stone. Bahal, beating him senseless, smashing his jaw and ribs and nose, finally stopping and leaving the job undone. Then Sirik remembered rising to his feet, despite his serious injuries, and stabbing the Lord of Murder. That had been his undoing. The Avatar had turned white and flashed into oblivion. Sirik wondered where he himself was now. Probably the realm of the dead, he thought for an instant. No, he was alive. His head hurt too much, and the agony in his ribs came only when he breathed. 
he felt as though he had been trampled. The hawk-nosed man opened his eyes and found it was dark. He lay face down in snow, apparently in the middle of a road. Around him three figures were rising to their feet. "'Where are we?' Adon asked, studying the snow-covered fields on both sides of the road. His vision had completely recovered. "'Farther up the road to Waterdeep, I hope,' Midnight answered wearily. "'That's where I was trying to take us, anyway.' Her limbs felt heavy with fatigue. Her last incantation had been taxing on her body. "'How did we get here?' Kalamvor muttered, rubbing his eyes. His vision had partially returned, but the fighter still saw spots of light dancing across the snowy landscape. "'I teleported us,' the mage replied. "'Don't ask me to explain how.' Sirik decided to remain motionless. He was outnumbered three to one and doubted that he could have moved even if he tried. With the return of full consciousness, his pain had grown worse. Kelimvor chuckled, a bit nervously. "'It's good to see you again,' he said, hugging Midnight. Back at Boriskir Bridge, their initial greeting had been too hurried for his liking. "'I can hardly believe you're alive.' "'Why should that surprise you?' Midnight asked, returning his hug warmly. Assuming a stern tone, Adon grumbled, "'After the way you ran off—' "'It's a good thing I did,' Midnight interrupted, freeing herself from Kelimvor. She could not believe how quickly the cleric's condescending manner had set her nerves on edge. "'Or you'd both be dead!' "'We'd be dead!' Adon exclaimed, stepping backward in frustration. "'Bahal didn't!' Before the cleric finished, he tripped over Sirik and crashed to the ground. Only Adon's scream of astonishment kept the wounded thief's muffled groan from being heard. Sirik kept his eyes closed and did not move. His only hope was to convince his rivals that he was harmless. Kelimvor came over and casually kicked Sirik's body. "'Look what's lying here in the road like a dung heap,' the warrior growled. He felt the pulse in Sirik's neck. "'And he's alive!' The thief made sure he had a solid grip on his sword. Sirik, Adon hissed, standing and turning to midnight. "'Why'd you bring him?' "'Believe me, it wasn't intentional,' Midnight snapped, frowning at the thief's immobile body. Besides, I thought you were working with him. We were, Kalimvor said. His sword scraped free of its scabbard. But we're finished with that now. Sirik peeked out of a half-opened eye, trying to find the strength to lift his sword. Adon stepped between Kalimvor's blade and Sirik's body. We can't kill him in cold blood. What? the warrior demanded. Ten minutes ago you wouldn't let me fight Bahal with him. He tried to step around the cleric. At that time he was dangerous to us, Adon said, shuffling to keep himself between the warrior's sword and the motionless thief. That's not true any longer. I saw him slay a drowning halfling and torture another, Midnight objected, pointing an accusing finger at Sirik's head. We can't kill him while he's helpless, Adon insisted. He looked past Kelimvor and addressed the magic user. Midnight, however, was not easily convinced. Sirik deserves to die. It's not our right to judge our fellows, Adon said softly, still holding off the fighter, any more than it was the right of the Harpers to condemn you and I to death. Kelimvor frowned at that memory, then sheathed his weapon. During the Battle of Shadowdale, Elminster had disappeared— the locals had leaped to the conclusion that someone had murdered the sage, then falsely accused Adon and Midnight of the crime. Had Sirik not broken them out of jail, the pair would have been executed. This is different, Midnight insisted. He betrayed us, and he played me for a fool. She reached for Kelimvor's sword. The warrior placed a restraining hand on his hilt. No, he said. Adon's right. If we kill him— Adon said, waving a hand at Sirik's helpless form. We're murderers, just like he is. Do you want that? Midnight pondered that for a moment, then jerked her hand away from the sword. Leave him, then. He'll die anyway. She turned and started up the road. Kelimvor looked to Adon for instruction. We shouldn't kill a helpless man, the cleric said. But we don't have to help him, either. 
He can't do us any more harm. He's lost his men, and if we hurry, we'll put some miles between us before he wakes up. He started after midnight. Let's hurry, before she disappears again. They caught Midnight quickly, then Kellamore asked, Where are we going? Midnight paused. Though just barely, she was still within Sirik's earshot. Had she looked at the thief, she might have noticed him turning his head to hear her answer. I'm going to Dragonspear Castle, the raven-haired mage said, her hands on her hips. Then we're all going to Dragonspear Castle, Adon noted calmly. Are Kelimvor and I going to have to split the watch to keep you from sneaking off, Midnight? The gods themselves are against me, the magic user warned, looking from the cleric to Kelimvor, then back again. You'll be risking your lives. We'd be risking more by leaving you alone, Adon retorted, a smile growing on his face. Kelimvor caught Midnight's elbow and turned her so he could look straight into her eyes. Gods or no gods? he said firmly. I'm with you, Midnight. Midnight was warmed by the devotion of her friends, but still was not ready to accept their offer. Though she was talking to both Adon and Kelimvor, she looked only into the warrior's eyes as she spoke. The choice is yours, but you'd better hear me out before you decide. Somewhere below Dragonspear Castle there's a bridge to the realm of the dead. In Waterdeep? Kelimvor cried incredulously. He was thinking of the city's famous cemetery, which was properly known as the City of the Dead. No, the Realm of the Dead, the mage corrected. Then Midnight looked at Adon. The other tablet is in Mirkel's castle. Kelimvor and Adon stared at each other in dumbfounded silence, hardly believing that she meant the resting place of souls. Don't feel bad if you choose to go home, Midnight replied interpreting their astonishment as hesitancy. She gently removed her elbow from Kelimvor's grasp. I really don't think you should come anyway. I thought the choice was ours, Adon said, snapping out of his shock. Aye, you're not going to lose us that easy, Kelimvor added, taking Midnight by the arm again. It was Midnight's turn to be astonished. She had not allowed herself to hope that Kelimvor and Adon would want to accompany her. But now that they had declared their intention to do just that, she felt less lonely and immeasurably more confident. Midnight threw herself into Kelimvor's arms and kissed him long and hard. Chapter 11 Dragonspear Castle The rise was so gentle Adon hardly knew he was walking uphill. Halfway up, the cleric stopped and shifted the saddlebags with the tablet to his other shoulder. It was the most exciting thing he had done in almost four hours. Along with Kelimvor and Midnight, Adon had been traveling along the desolate road for five days. To the west, coarse stems of tall golden grass rose from a prairie of wet, slushy snow. A mile to the east stood the dark cliffs of the high moor. Ahead, running mile after mile, was the straight and endlessly boring road to Waterdeep. Adon had never thought he would long to feel a steep mountainside beneath his feet, but right now he would have gladly traded a mile of easy road for twenty miles of precarious mountain road. Despite a hard morning's march, Adon's toes were shriveled and numb. Three inches of slushy snow covered the road, soaking through even the well-oiled boots High Horn's quartermaster had provided. Judging from the pearly complexion of the sky, more snow would soon fall. Even accounting for their northward progress, the season had changed early this year. A white shroud already blanketed the high moor, and sheets of ice crowned the streams that poured from the wild country's heart. Adon felt as if the nature gods were conspiring to make his journey difficult and cold. It was far more likely, he realized, that the unseasonable cold was a reflection of the absence of those gods. Without their supervision, nature was running rampant, randomly changing as one mindless force gained supremacy over another. The unpredictable weather was just one more reason he and his companions had to succeed in their quest— Without an orderly progression of the seasons, it would not be long before the farmers lost their crops and whole populations starved. 
As Zidane pondered the importance of his mission and the dreariness of completing it, a sharp bark sounded from the other side of the rise. He immediately turned and waved Kelimvor and Midnight off the road, then began searching for a hiding place himself. The land was so barren he finally had to settle for kneeling behind a scraggly bush. A band of gray appeared at the top of the rise. The cleric squinted and looked closer. Twelve wolves were walking abreast in a straight line. Another rank followed the first, and then another and another, until a whole column of wolves was marching down the road in perfect step. As the column advanced, Adon wondered whether he should run or continue hiding behind his pathetic bush. One of the wolves barked a sharp command. The first line drew abreast of the cleric's hiding place, then each wolf snapped its head to face him in a perfect dress-left maneuver. Each succeeding line repeated the drill as it passed. Adon gave up hiding and returned to the roadside, shaking his head in disbelief. Kelimvor and Midnight joined him. Nice parade work, the fighter noted, observing the wolves with a critical eye. His voice was as casual as if the trio had been watching an army of men instead of animals. With studied disinterest, Midnight asked, I wonder where they're off to? Baldur's Gate or El Turel, Kelimvor observed, turning and looking to the south. How would you know that? Adon demanded, frowning at the warrior. You haven't heard? Midnight asked. She lifted her brows to indicate incredulity at Adon's ignorance. The sheep are revolting in the south, Kelimvor finished. The cleric put his hands on his hips. What are— Both Kelimvor and Midnight burst into fits of laughter. Adon flushed angrily and turned toward the road. There's nothing funny about the breakdown of order, he snapped. Midnight and Kelimvor only laughed harder. Adon turned away, but after five minutes of watching the column pass, he chuckled. Sheep revolt, he muttered. Where did you come up with that? Why else would you need an army of wolves? Kelimvor asked, grinning. Finally, the last rank of wolves passed, leaving the trail black and muddy. Kelimvor stepped back onto the road and sank past the ankles in cold muck. He cursed, then said, We need horses. True, but what can we do? Adon asked, stepping into the road. We'll never find horses out here, and if we stray off the road, we're likely to get very lost. In five days of marching, they had met only one small band of six hardy warriors. Although the small company had been kind enough to confirm that Dragonspear Castle lay ahead, they had refused to part with even a single horse. At this rate, the realms will be dead a year before we make Dragonspear Castle, Kelimvor complained, his humor now completely drained. Don't be so sure, Adon responded. We should be close. It might be over the top of that rise. The cleric was determined not to let the fighter's sudden bad mood infect him. Kelimvor snorted and kicked at the mud, sending a black spray toward the roadside. Close? We're not within a hundred miles of the castle. Adon stifled an acid reply. Despite Midnight's return, the cleric still found himself serving as company leader— it was not a position he enjoyed, but Kelimvor had shown more interest in keeping midnight company than in assuming command. As for the mage, she seemed content to let someone else guide them, though it should be her, by all rights, who was the group's leader. Adon didn't understand why the magic user shirked the responsibility, though he suspected the reason might concern Kelimvor. Perhaps she feared the fighter could not love a taskmaster. Whatever the cause— Adon was left to play the captain. He felt distinctly uncomfortable in the role, but he was determined to do his best. "'I'm sure Dragonspear Castle is close by,' Adon said, hoping to buoy Kelimvor's spirits. "'All we've got to do is keep putting one foot in front of the other.' "'You put one foot in front of the other,' Kelimvor snapped. He turned to Midnight. "'You got us away from Boriskir with a wave of your hand. Why don't you try again?' Midnight shook her head. I've thought of that, but it's risky to teleport, especially with magic so fouled up. I only did it because we would have died anyway. We're lucky we didn't appear in the middle of the great desert. How do we know we didn't? Kelimvor muttered. 
Midnight stepped onto the edge of the muddy road and started up the rise. I'm sure, she said. Midnight was relieved that the teleport incantation had worked, and not only because it had saved their lives. It was the first time that her magic had worked correctly since High Horn. In Yellow Snake Pass, her wall of fire had resulted in harmless stalks of smoke, and at the ford she had animated the ropes by accident. Even at Boriskir Bridge, her first incantation had failed pathetically, producing a ball of light in place of a lightning bolt. The mage had feared that she misunderstood the change in her relationship to magic. When she summoned an incantation, only words and gestures appeared in her mind, never any indication of the proper material component or what to do with it. At first this had disturbed Midnight, and she had feared that she was misinterpreting something. But each time she tried to cast a spell, there was never a need for material components. The magic user had finally decided that, because she tapped the magic weave directly, no intermediary agent, like a spell component, was required to transmit the mystical energy. The horizon suddenly seemed distant, and Midnight realized that she had reached the crest of the gentle rise. She paused to look around. Even though it was barely noticeable, the rise was the highest ground nearby and afforded a view of the terrain ahead. Twenty yards behind the magic user, Adon was still trying to encourage Kelimvor. For all we know, we're only ten miles away from Dragonspear Castle. Actually, Midnight interrupted, studying a sprawling ruin to the right of the road, I'd say we're closer than that. Adon and Kelimvor looked up, then rushed to her side. Nestled against the base of the high moor, atop three small hillocks, stood the deteriorating walls and toppled spires of an abandoned citadel. From this distance, it was difficult to say how large the castle was, but it might have rivaled the fortress at High Horn. "'What have we here?' Kelimvor asked. He was looking down the road, but neither Midnight nor Adon noticed. "'Dragonspear Castle, what else?' Adon replied. He had no way of confirming his guess, but he suspected there were no other ruins of such size on the way to Waterdeep. "'Not the castle,' Kelimvor snapped. He pointed down the road, where, over a mile away, ten caravan drivers had just left the trail. They were slowly fleeing toward the ruined castle, pursued by a dozen sluggish attackers. "'Someone's attacking a caravan!' Midnight exclaimed. The battle's not moving very fast, Adon said, watching the two groups. Maybe the attackers are undead. You're probably right, Kelimvor said, turning to look at the cleric. And the drivers are moving slowly because they're probably tired after a long chase. The warrior's eyes betrayed his desire to intercede. Adon silently cursed his companion. While the trio could easily destroy one or two undead, there were a dozen attacking the caravan. Even with Midnight's magic, they could not defeat so many creatures. He wished Kelimvor would consider the value of their own lives, as most men would. But the fighter was no longer a common man. If he ever had been. A common man would not be looking for the entrance to the realm of the dead, nor would he have undertaken a mission that made such a journey necessary. We can't get involved, Adon said thoughtfully, pretending to think aloud. If we get killed, the realms will perish. Adon suspected that Midnight would not involve herself with the caravan if he said not to, but Kelimvor would resent an order to abandon the drivers. Therefore, the cleric wanted the fighter to make the decision for himself. Besides, Adon had no wish to let the burden of abandoning the caravan rest upon his shoulders alone. Midnight studied the scene for a full minute, weighing Adon's words against her desire to help. If they abandoned the drivers, she would feel guilty for the rest of her life. But the mage also knew that helping could endanger the tablet. "'We can't interfere,' she said, turning away. "'There's too much at risk.' Adon breathed a sigh of relief. "'I don't know about you two, Kelimvor grumbled, eyeing his companions with disapproval. But I can't abandon innocents to their deaths. I've done that too often. Think with your head, not your heart, Kel. Midnight's words were surprisingly gentle. She laid a hand upon his arm. With the gods themselves against us, we cannot— 
but they'll die, Kelimvor objected, pulling his arm free. And if you allow that, you're no better than Sirik. Nothing could anger the mage more than being compared to Sirik. Do what you want, she snapped, but do it without me. Midnight's outburst upset Kelimvor, but he didn't let that prevent him from starting toward the battle. Before Kelimvor had taken a dozen steps, Adon called, Wait! The cleric could not allow the company to separate again. No matter what danger lay ahead, they stood a better chance of survival if they faced it together. We can't let the undead into the castle, or we'll be cut off from the realm of the dead. True, Midnight muttered grudgingly. She didn't know whether to be angry that Kelimvor had forced Adon to change his mind, or to be happy that the cleric had found a way to justify saving the caravan. As slow as the battle's moving, we can reach the castle before the undead, Adon sighed. Perhaps we'll find the inner ward in defensible condition. If we do, Kelimvor said, we'll let the drivers in and keep the undead outside. That's the caravan's best chance. And ours, Midnight agreed. She had misgivings about intervening in the fight, but at least Kelimvor was willing to do it safely. If we're going to do this, we'd better hurry. The three companions started toward the castle at a trot. Ten minutes later, a lone rider approached the top of the rise. After his one-time friends had abandoned him, Sirik had crawled off the road. There, sustained by the vigor of the sword, he had fallen into a slumber more deep and profound than he believed possible. It had not been a peaceful sleep, filled as it was by the stench of death and the screeches of the damned, but it had been a restorative one. Then, after two days of walking, he had met the same six riders that Midnight's company had passed. The thief recited a cleverly fabricated story of how the trio had robbed him and left him for dead. The riders sympathetically reported that the scoundrels were on the road ahead. Despite Sirik's clever story, however, they refused to give him one of their horses. Instead, they offered to allow him to ride with them until they reached the nearest stable. That same night, the thief had killed all six, five of them in their sleep. Then, taking a horse, a bow, and a quiver of arrows, he had turned north after Midnight's company and the tablet. When Sirik reached the top of the rise, he realized that he had caught his enemies just in time. Dragonspear Castle stood to the right of the road, and Midnight's company was just slipping into the outer ward. Then the thief saw the caravan moving toward the gate, their awkward attackers following. Noting that there was about to be a battle, Sirik strung his stolen bow and spurred his stolen mount. He did not want to miss the chance to put a few arrows into his old friend's backs. In the outer ward of Dragonspear Castle, Midnight had almost given up any hope of defending the crumbled fortress. The outer wall was so pocked with holes and breaches that nothing short of an army could man it. Fortunately, the inner ward was in better condition. All four of its towers still stood, and the walls remained more or less intact. The inner gate hung askew on its hinges, but looked as though it could still be closed. After a quick inspection, Kelimvor declared, We can hold the inner ward. Midnight, go to the southwest tower and let us know when the caravan reaches the outer wall. The warrior stepped behind the inner gate and inspected the hinges. Adon and I will close this when the time comes. Midnight quickly climbed to the top of the wall, then went to the southwest tower. It was the tallest and most secure of Dragonspear's remaining towers. A spiral stairway ran along the wall facing the courtyard, and the only entrances to its rooms were from the staircase. The stairway itself had only two entrances, one from the top of the wall and one from the courtyard. At one time, each entrance could be sealed in case the courtyard or walls were overrun, but the doors had been battered off their hinges long ago. Midnight entered the tower's staircase and climbed to the top room. It had once served as the office of someone important, perhaps the steward or bailiff. A heavy, age-worn desk sat near the door, and the remnants of tapestries, now moth-eaten and faded, hung on two walls. In the center of the room hung a rusting iron chandelier, three of its sockets still containing the stubs of ancient and yellowed candles. 
So that the chandelier could be lit easily, it was suspended by a grimy rope running through a pulley system and tied off to an eye hook in the wall. The room had two small windows. One overlooked the outer ward, and through it, Midnight could see the path from the outer gate to the inner. Through the other window, she could see the inner ward and the inner gate. Kalimvor and Adon had found a long beam and were using it to lever the gate closed. Midnight could see that there would always be a gap between the gate and the wall, but she still felt more secure. The gate would certainly make the inner ward defensible. Despite her increased sense of safety, though, Midnight was upset with Kalimvor for dragging the company into this conflict. To satisfy the warrior's sense of virtue, he was risking all of their lives and letting the fate of the world hang in the balance. Still, Midnight wasn't surprised. The fighter had always been a short-sighted, stubborn man, and that had not changed when Bane lifted his curse. The only difference was that, instead of seeking payment for even the slightest favor, he now insisted upon correcting each and every iniquity he encountered. Even if it was frustrating and inconvenient, Midnight thought she could live with Kelimvor's stubbornness, but only after the tablets were returned to the plains. Until then, even if it meant distancing herself from her lover, she could not let her feelings interfere with her duty any longer. But at the moment, Midnight's duty was to make sure her friends were not surprised when the caravan arrived. As long as she continued watching Kelimvor and Adon, she was neglecting that duty. The magic user turned to the other window. Fifteen minutes later, the first caravan driver reached the outer gate, leading a string of four frightened pack horses. Midnight saw no sign of his undead pursuers, though she had not expected to. Zombies were slow and easy to outrun, at least in the short term. The trouble was that they kept coming, eventually exhausting their prey. Midnight went to the rear window of the tower. "'They're at the outer wall!' she called. Adon and Kelimvor, who had just pried the heavy gates into place, drew their weapons. They stood to one side of the narrow gap. In his imagination, Kelimvor was already listening to the drivers proclaim their gratitude. But Adon was not thinking about the drivers at all. The saddlebags containing the tablet were slung over his shoulder. He wished he had given the artifact to Midnight for safekeeping. In addition to being exposed to theft, it would only get in the way during battle. Unfortunately, it was too late to do anything about that now. Midnight returned to the front window. The ten caravan drivers were lurking at the outer gate, peering into the ward as if they feared the inside of Dragonspear Castle more than what pursued them. They were a strange crew, wearing striped hooded cloaks that kept their faces hidden in dark hollows. Midnight was surprised at their lack of urgency. The undead could not be so far behind that they had time to waste. Finally, she yelled, You in the caravan! Run for the keep! Without any hurry, the drivers started forward. The caravan was halfway to the inner gate when the first corpse clambered through a gap in the outer wall. The zombie wore the same striped cloak as the drivers, though its hood was thrown back to reveal a coarse braid of black hair, eyes lacking any spark of life, and doughy gray skin. Midnight assumed a terrible creature must have befallen the caravan, slaying half or more of its number and setting the dead against their fellows. Four more zombies climbed into the outer ward and continued after the caravan. The drivers didn't look back. Instead, they concentrated upon leading their horses toward the inner gate. Down in the ward, Adon and Kelimvor laboriously opened the gate a little more to admit the horses as well as their masters. The zombies were pursuing so slowly that Kelimvor had no doubt that there would be plenty of time to close the gate after the drivers reached safety. From the tower window, Midnight watched as the last zombie climbed through the outer wall. The chase seemed wrong to her, however. The whole thing had been too slow and too relaxed. Nor did she like how the drivers had responded to her offer of help, without a word of acknowledgment or thanks. As the first driver reached the gate, an overpowering stench of decay and death filled Kelimvor's nostrils. At first, the odor puzzled him, for the zombies were not close enough for him to smell them. Then, thinking about how slowly the caravan moved, the warrior began to suspect the drivers were not what they appeared to be. 
Close the gate, he yelled to Adon, grabbing the beam they had used to lever the door into its current position. What do you mean? the cleric demanded, confused. Like Kelimvor, he smelled something foul, but he assumed it was merely the horses, or something in their packs. The green-eyed fighter cursed and pushed one end of the beam toward the cleric. They're zombies, all of them. Now, close the gate. Comprehension dawning in his eyes, Adon took his side of the beam and turned to position it beneath the heavy gate. But he was too late. The first zombie pushed through the gap. Beneath the driver's striped hood, Adon saw a bloated face and lifeless eyes. The thing's thin lips were pulled back in a grotesque grin, revealing a set of broken yellow teeth. It raised an arm and clawed at the cleric. Adon ducked and grabbed his mace, but dropped the beam. For a second, the cleric wished that he was still in Sunni's grace, still able to turn undead. That wish passed as two more drivers pushed through the gap. Kelimvor grabbed his sword and hacked at the first zombie's neck. The thing's head rolled off its shoulders neatly, but the body remained standing. It began swinging its fists blindly. Then the next two zombies attacked, both focusing on Adon. One landed a savage blow in the cleric's ribs, and the other backhanded him so violently that his ears rang. Run! Kelimvor yelled. He slashed a zombie's arm off, then backed away a step. Adon started to obey, but stumbled over the beam and nearly fell. He swung his mace, hitting the closest zombie. Bone cracked and the creature's temple caved in, but it did not fall. Two more drivers stepped forward, one to either side of the cleric. Midnight heard several dull thuds as her friend's weapons struck the zombies, then ran to the window overlooking the inner ward. She saw Kelimvor hacking at three of the undead that surrounded Adon. Two more drivers were pushing through the gate, and the mage knew plenty more were approaching outside. Kelimvor slashed, tearing the cloak from the head of a driver. Its eyes were dull and lifeless, and its skin doughy and gray. The fighter slashed again, and the driver lost an arm, then pressed forward to counterattack. Midnight knew her misgivings had been justified. Adon and Kelimvor were as good as dead and the tablet lost, unless she could pluck them from the midst of battle. Remembering the heavy chandelier in the middle of the room, the mage went to the wall and released the rope. The chandelier crashed to the floor. She drew her dagger and cut the rope free, then hastily coiled it. Down in the courtyard, Adon thought he was doomed. The cleric was surrounded by three zombies that seemed impervious to his mace, or at least immune to the damage he was dealing with the weapon. More undead were entering the courtyard every few seconds. He smashed a driver's ribs and felt them break, then cringed as the zombie raked at his face with four filthy fingers. To Adon's left, Kelimvor's sword found a target, beheading a zombie and temporarily clearing a small path between the warrior and the cleric. Adon seized the chance to fling the tablet to Kelimvor. The saddlebags struck the fighter in the shoulder, then tangled around his left arm. Intent upon recovering the artifact, the zombies turned toward the tablet and left Adon alone. Although Adon and Kelimvor did not know this, before his destruction, Bahal had told Mirkel where Midnight kept the tablet. Accordingly, the Lord of the Dead had instructed the zombies to recover any saddlebags the heroes carried with them. Although Adon did not know the source of the zombies' information, it took him only an instant to realize they wanted the tablet and knew where it was. Run! he called to Kelimvor, stepping forward and cracking a corpse's skull. Get out of here! Kelimvor thought his friend was merely being noble. No! the fighter cried, slicing into a zombie. The thing did not fall, then two more stepped to its side. All three undead lashed out at the warrior, and he had no choice except to back away. Nevertheless, still having failed to notice that Adon was no longer under attack, Kelimvor yelled, I got you into this and I'll get you out of it. I doubt that, Midnight yelled. She stood atop the wall behind Kelimvor, the hastily coiled rope in her hands. The magic user dropped one end of the rope toward the courtyard. She ran the other end through an arrow loop in the closest merlin and began tying it off. Kelimvor slashed at a leg, slicing deep into an attacker's knee. 
The zombie pressed forward, completely unaffected by a wound that would have crippled a living man. The fighter's other two attackers landed powerful blows in his ribs, then two more zombies crowded around and began flailing at him. The warrior retreated another few steps, and a moment later his back was pressed against the wall. Seeing what Midnight intended and realizing he could do little to help Kelimvor, Adon screamed, "'Up the rope, Kel! I'm safe!' With that, he turned and ran for the nearest stairway. Midnight finished her knot, then returned to the wall's edge. The rope ended eight feet off the ground, easily within Kelimvor's reach. However, the warrior was so busy fighting zombies that he could not start climbing. The magic user climbed onto the rope and slid down, stopping a foot before its end. Midnight knew she lacked the strength to pull the warrior out of battle, but she hoped that with her aid, Kelimvor could grab the rope and quickly climb out of the zombie's reach. "'Kel, give me your hand!' she cried. The warrior glanced up and saw Midnight's outstretched hand, then the zombies landed several blows. He swung his sword viciously, buying himself a foot of breathing space. Immediately, he lifted the saddlebags and placed them in Midnight's hand. "'Take it!' Kelimvor yelled. At first, Midnight didn't want to obey, but then the zombies turned their attention to her, simply trying to walk over the warrior. She accepted the saddlebags, slung them over her shoulder, then started up the rope. The warrior stayed on the ground and continued slashing at zombies. A few seconds later, Adon arrived at the top of the wall and helped Midnight climb up the last few feet. After she was safely on the wall, she turned and yelled, "'I'm safe, Kel! Come on!' The warrior immediately sheathed his sword and, ignoring the zombies, turned and grabbed the rope. He pulled himself to the top of the wall as quickly as he could. Midnight cut the rope behind him, then said, "'Follow me!' She led the way back to the tower, entering the first doorway she came to. Though this room lacked an iron chandelier and an age-worn desk, it was similar to the one from which she had taken the rope. As soon as they were inside, Adon asked, "'What now?' We've got to think of a plan, Midnight replied, sheathing her dagger, and we'd better do it before the zombies find a way to get up here. Kelimvor went to the window and watched the zombies stumble around the ward. I'm sorry I got you into this, he said. I just thought, oh, damn it, I just didn't think. Don't blame yourself, Adon responded, gripping the fighter's shoulder. Those zombies would have attacked no matter what you did. Somebody sent them after the tablet. It was Miracle, Midnight sighed. I told you that he and Bahal were working together. Well, he must have tried to contact Bahal and discovered that I had escaped with the tablet. Whether Miracle sent them or not, Kelimvor grumbled, I should be skinned and roasted alive. He took the saddlebags from Adon and started to remove the tablet. Maybe I can trick them into following me. The scarred cleric pushed the tablet back into a saddlebag. No, Kel, we stand a better chance of surviving if we stick together. Adon had purposefully left the tablet in the warrior's hands. In the coming battle, he thought it best to have it protected by their most capable fighter. Kelimvor frowned, and, when Adon did not take the saddlebags back, threw them over his shoulder. Sensing the fighter's mood, Adon added, It's better things worked out this way. Otherwise, the zombies would have attacked us by surprise. Adon's right, Midnight added, touching Kelimvor's arm. There was nothing to be gained by making the warrior feel bad, and she did not enjoy watching him vilify himself. Let's just see if we can find the entrance to the realm of the dead. After all, we were headed here anyway. Where do we start? Kelimvor asked, peering out the window. To his alarm, the warrior saw that many of the zombies had stumbled onto the stairs and had reached the top of the wall. Worse still, they were coming toward the tower. The fighter stepped away from the window, saying, "'We'd better get out.' A loud clatter rang through the room, startling all three of the companions. Midnight grabbed Kelimvor's arm and jerked him out the window, then pointed at an arrow lying on the floor. On the stone wall was a fresh scratch where the arrow had struck the stone. Kelimvor nonchalantly picked it up. "'Zombies don't use bows,' he said. "'Where'd this come from?' "'We'll figure that out later,' Adon said, fearing the zombies were only one part of Miracle's trap. "'Let's get out of here!' He led the way down the stairs. 
They descended the spiral staircase past three rooms, not pausing until they reached ground level. Here, the heroes took a moment to peer into the room on the ground floor. Its only door was the one they were now standing in. We'd better go down to the basement, Adon noted frantically, continuing down the dark staircase. Wait, we'll be trapped, Kelimvor objected. We're already trapped, Midnight replied, following the cleric. And the zombies will probably go up first since they saw you and Midnight go up the wall, Adon added. Maybe we can sneak out when they climb the stairs. Kelimvor nodded, and Adon led the way down into a dim, dank basement. The muffled whisper of running water echoed from the walls, though no one could identify the source of the sound. High in the middle of the inner wall, a small window opened into the inner ward at ground level. The little light the room received entered through this opening. Adon briefly considered trying to escape out the window, but quickly rejected the idea. It was large enough to provide ventilation and light, but far too small to accommodate Kelimvor's broad shoulders, or even Midnight's, for that matter. The room contained only moldering debris. There were sacks of spoiled grain and casks of rancid wine, obviously left by wanderers who had used the tower as temporary lodging, empty rotting barrels and a coil of moldy rope attached to a worm-eaten bucket. The room's wooden floor was decayed and spongy. While Adon and Kelimvor listened to the zombies ascend the stairs, Midnight explored the room, occasionally picking away pieces of plank with the tip of her dagger. After five minutes, Adon shook his head and cursed. The zombies aren't doing what we'd hoped, Midnight. The ones from the courtyard are still on the ground floor. The cleric paused and looked at Kelimvor. We're trapped. I'll lead the way up, the fighter growled. Maybe we can fight our way out. Not yet, Midnight said, puzzling over the floor. The other rooms in the tower had not had any rot, and she didn't understand why this one should be any different. Then she thought of the bucket and the rope, which were similar to the ones used in wells. She went to the center of the room. Kel, use your sword to pry up one of these planks, quickly! Although puzzled, the warrior did as asked. A section of floor three feet square came up. The thin, muffled whisper echoing from the walls changed to a quiet roar. What is it? Kelimvor asked. An underground stream, Adon answered, kneeling next to the warrior. Pointing at the bucket and rope, Midnight added, It's an emergency water supply, used in case of siege. Adon smiled and pointed into the hole. The zombies won't follow us down there. If we have the courage to go ourselves... Kelimvor stuck his head into the blackness. "'What do you see?' Midnight asked. "'A cavern,' he muttered. "'But it's dark. I can't see the bottom.' He pulled his head out. Midnight kneeled next to her friends and looked into the hole. She could see nothing but darkness, but it sounded as though the stream running under the tower was fairly large. Kelimvor grabbed the rope and bucket. "'I guess we'll have to trust this thing.' He tied one end of the rope around a beam on the ceiling— then grabbed it and pulled himself off the floor to test the strength of his knot. Adon scowled. Perhaps we'd be wiser to look for something. The room grew a shade darker, as though something was blocking the light. Without finishing his sentence, Adon turned toward the cellar window and saw a man's form kneeling on the ground outside. The man had a familiar hawkish nose. Look out! Adon screamed, realizing he was the only one who saw Sirik. The scarred cleric lunged at Kelimvor and shoved him to the ground. Midnight turned. Something buzzed past her ear and struck Adon with a wet thump. The scarred cleric groaned loudly and dropped to his knees beside her. "'What is it? What's wrong?' Midnight asked. Adon didn't answer. His eyes rolled back into his head, then he pitched forward into the hole. Midnight lunged and caught him by the shoulder and the bloody shaft that protruded from his ribs. The stick snapped and the cleric's body slipped from the mage's grasp. A moment later, she heard a distant splash. Adon! she gasped, unable to comprehend how she had come to be holding a broken arrow shaft in her blood-smeared hand. Kelimvor understood perfectly. He was looking at Sirik, who was knocking another arrow. I'll kill you! the fighter roared, rushing to thrust his sword out the window. 
You missed your chance, the thief replied, easily retreating out of Kelimvor's reach. But you should know that I was aiming for you just then. That foppish cleric got in the way. I haven't missed my chance, Midnight hissed, turning to face the window. At the sound of Sirik's voice, her heart had turned as cold as ice, and she had thought of the perfect way to kill him. The incantation for a cone of cold appeared in the mage's mind. She pointed her finger at the window and called upon her magic. Sirik hit the ground and rolled, expecting to meet some hideous magical death. Instead, a wave of black frost rolled out of the window. As the thief cringed on the ground, the frost coalesced into a black ball and zipped past him, ricocheting from one of the keep's walls to another. Wherever it touched, the stones sprouted hoarfrost and icicles, then crumbled to dust. The ball finally bounced over the wall and, leaving a trail of icy destruction in its wake, went bounding off into the high moor. Breathing a sigh of relief, the hawk-nosed thief scrambled away from the window. Now that Kelimvor and Midnight knew he was on their trail, it would be much more difficult to kill them. After watching Midnight's spell misfire, Kelimvor peered out the window. Sirik was nowhere in sight. You missed, he reported, still too numbed by Adon's death to react. Midnight did not respond. She lay curled up on the floor, gasping for breath and sweating uncontrollably. Her body ached from head to toe, and the magic user felt as though willpower alone held her spirit inside her body. She recalled Bahal's warning that she would burn herself up if she did not learn how to wield Mistress Magic. That was exactly what it felt like she had done. Any spell wore a magic user down, and part of a mage's training involved increasing her body's tolerance to magical energies. But Midnight, newly gifted with the ability to call upon a limitless supply of magic, did not yet have the endurance to withstand such energies. In theory, she could call upon her magic to do almost anything, but she now understood that the effort might leave her a lifeless husk of flesh and energy. When he turned around, that was exactly what Kelimvor feared he was seeing. Midnight, he gasped. For the first time since Adon had entrusted it to him, Kelimvor set the tablet of fate aside. He dropped the saddlebags, knelt beside Midnight, and took her into his arms. How can I help? the fighter asked softly. What can I do? Midnight wanted to tell him to hold her, to keep her warm, but she was afraid to speak. Right now she needed her strength just to stay conscious. Kalimbor heard the shuffling of heavy steps on the stairway, and he knew the zombies had discovered their hiding place. His first thought was to charge the stairs, but he knew the undead would tear him to pieces. That would leave Midnight alone and at their mercy. Instead, he cut the bucket away from the rope and threw it aside. The fighter tied the free end of the rope around Midnight's waist. He intended to lower her into the cavern, then climb down after her. He quickly realized he did not have time. The first zombie appeared in the door just as he slipped the mage into the hole. Kelimvor ignored the thing and began lowering Midnight. Two more of the walking corpses entered the room. Midnight only knew that Kelimvor was lowering her into the darkness and that her strength was slowly returning. With the cavern walls echoing its bubbles and gurgles back toward her, the stream sounded incredibly large, more like a small river. A few moments later her descent stopped and she found herself hanging in darkness. Though it sounded as if she were only a few feet above the stream, there was no way for the mage to confirm or deny that suspicion. Midnight looked up and saw a dim square of light. There were forms dancing around it, but she could not make out any details. Back in the tower's basement, the first zombie ignored Kelimvor and picked up the saddlebags containing the Tablet of Fate. The fighter finished lowering Midnight, then grabbed his sword and hacked at the zombie. The thing's arm fell off and it dropped the tablet. But before Kelimvor could retrieve the artifact, the zombie's fellows joined it and all three attacked. The fighter slashed at them to no avail. He connected solidly with the one whose arm he had already lopped off opening a gash in its abdomen and temporarily stunning it. Heedless of their own safety, the other two corpses closed in, flailing wildly. Forced to retreat away from the tablet, Kelimvor stumbled into the pit in the middle of the room. 
He grabbed the rope to keep from falling, then leveled a vicious slash at one of his attackers. The zombie's head flopped off its neck and dropped to the floor. Another of the undead threw itself at the hand Kelimvor was using to hold on to the rope. The fighter instinctively slashed and connected. Then the stroke continued past the zombie's body, and the warrior could not draw back quickly enough to avoid cutting the rope. Midnight heard Kelimvor scream, then the rope popped and went slack. She dropped into the stream, felt the current grab her, then began fighting to keep her head above water. Though she was still exhausted from the misfired spell, she knew that she had to find a reservoir of strength or drown. Two splashes sounded to Midnight's left as Kelimvor and the sword he had dropped hit the water in quick succession. The mage tried to swim toward the disturbance, but she was too weak and the current was too strong. A moment later, Kelimvor called to her. Midnight! Where are you? Here, she croaked. In the rushing water, she barely heard her own voice and knew it would not be audible to her lover. Midnight tried to swim toward the fighter, but the stream simply swept her away. Kelimvor had more strength than Midnight, but he didn't try to swim out of the current. He knew that the mage had to be downstream and was determined not to lose her. Allowing the tablet to fall into Miracle's hands was bad enough, but Kelimvor was unwilling to face life without midnight. The warrior swam downstream with all his might. He paused every now and then to cross the current, hoping to find midnight. It was a good plan, but the fighter had underestimated the power of his strokes. He was quickly so far ahead of the mage that he stood no chance of meeting her. Kelimvor continued his search for fifteen minutes before growing so exhausted that he could only concentrate on survival. For another quarter hour, the stream swept the fighter and the magic user farther into darkness. Sometimes it rushed into long passages completely filled with water, and both Midnight and Kelimvor believed they would drown before they bobbed back to the surface, exhausted and gasping for breath. At other times, they bounced against rocks or the cave's walls. Despite the pain of such encounters, though, they always clutched and grasped at the slick surfaces, hoping to latch onto something and pull free of the current. Neither one drowned nor pulled free. Both Kelimvor and Midnight continued into the darkness, cold and blind, aware of nothing but the rush of the stream, the weight of their soggy clothes, and the fetid water they swallowed with every other breath. After a time, Kelimvor could not say how long he'd been in the water or how many miles he had floated. The stream straightened its course and grew more quiet. The fighter started to remove his clothes, for their weight was only contributing to his fatigue. But a strange slurping sound echoed off the cavern walls, and Kelimvor paused to hold his head above the water and listen. The noise was coming from the middle of the channel. He swam across the stream, then the current grew faster and the slurping grew louder. Kelimvor turned his body away from the noise, then stroked harder and harder as the current spun him around. Finally, he felt himself being pulled back up the stream. The exhausted fighter lowered his head and swam with all his strength. At last, he broke free and continued downstream. The twisting current had been the edge of a whirlpool, the warrior realized. It had been a small one, or he would never have broken free, but the effort still left him exhausted. Then Kalimvor remembered Midnight. Midnight, he called. There's a whirlpool. Swim to the right. He called this warning over and over again, until at last he could no longer hear the sucking sound of the whirlpool. Even if she had been close enough to hear the warning, Midnight could have done nothing to avoid the danger. She was too drained to swim or even pull off her heavy clothes. Her limbs were numb and clumsy with cold and exhaustion. Her lungs burned every time she took a breath, and her mind was incoherent with fatigue. When the stream straightened its course ahead of her, Midnight let herself drift into the center of the channel, relieved for a respite from the turbulent currents. While the slurping sound grew louder, she held her head out of the water and drew ten delicious, uninterrupted breaths. Then, as the water became faster, the fatigued mage pushed her feet downstream and felt herself spiraling downward. She had slipped into the whirlpool without realizing what it was, and now she barely cared. Midnight simply held her breath and relaxed as the water carried her away. Chapter 12 Black Ice 
While Kelimvor and Midnight struggled to keep from drowning, Midnight's misfired magic skipped along the high moor. Wherever the ebony globe touched, the earth turned to black ice. It glanced off a maple tree, and the sap congealed in the trunk. It bounced into a stag and froze the blood in the animal's veins. Nearly an hour later, the black ball tumbled into a creek bed and could not escape. It rolled downhill, dashing from one side of the gully to the other, leaving a ribbon of black ice in its wake. The gully emptied into a small rocky canyon. The globe ricocheted from one wall to another, changing dripping springs into sable icicles. As the ball bounced down the canyon, the underground stream carried Kelimvor farther away from the whirlpool. Finally, the current grew swifter and water filled the cave completely. At first, the fighter was not concerned, for his lungs were full of air and the stream had dragged him through a dozen similar passages. But two minutes passed and the warrior's lungs ached to draw another breath. He swam to the top of the stream, scraping at the ceiling in a vain search for air pockets. His head grew light and, to keep from inhaling, he clamped a hand over his nose and mouth. For a minute or so more, the cavern did not open up and Kelimvor remained submerged. Then, as unconsciousness threatened to take him, the current died away. The warrior floated upward and a dim, greenish radiance lit the water. Kelimvor realized he had escaped the cavern. But his lungs still screamed for air and an unreasoning voice told him to breathe. Kelimvor kept his hand pressed over his face. With what remained of his strength, he swam. Ten seconds later, he broke the surface and gulped down a dozen breaths. He was in a small mountain lake, no more than a large pond, really. There was a small beach a hundred feet ahead. To the fighter's right, a waterfall plunged into the lake from a ninety-foot cliff. The small creek feeding the waterfall ran down the center of a narrow, rocky canyon. Something black and spherical was bouncing down that canyon, rebounding from wall to wall. Though he had not seen the destruction the ball left in its wake, a terrible feeling of apprehension washed over Kelimvor. He began swimming for the shore, fighting his own weariness and the cumbersome weight of his wet clothes. He thought about stopping to shed his pants and boots, but that would have taken too much time. Kelimvor was halfway to shore when the sphere reached the cliff. The waterfall turned into a cascade of black ice. The ball skipped into the air, then fell toward the lake. Seeing what had become of the waterfall, Kelimvor swam harder, kicking and stroking madly despite the agony in his limbs. The ball fell steadily, inexorably, toward the lake. Kelimvor was only twenty-five feet from the shoreline when the globe touched the water. Beneath the sphere, a black circle of ice appeared— the ball skipped away, touching down twice and leaving two more icy patches in its wake. As the globe bounced out of the lake, the black circles began to expand. Kelimvor continued to swim. Ten feet from shore, an icy vise grabbed at his ankle. The warrior kicked free and swam two more strokes, then his hands touched bottom. The water suddenly grew frigid, especially around his legs. He tried to stand, but found his thighs and waist locked in merciless jaws of ice. Trying to break free, he threw himself forward, only to come crashing down in shallow water, his chin barely past the shoreline. The ice continued to form, advancing toward the fighter's shoulders and threatening to trap his arms and chest. Kelimvor could not let that happen. He pushed his torso out of the lake and waited while the water froze beneath him. When the ice reached his hands, he moved them to the shore and continued to hold his body out of the water. The ice stopped forming when it reached his chin. After a moment of silence, the lake began popping and creaking, adjusting itself to the increased volume of frozen water. The ice sheet rose a few inches, then surged three feet forward, leaving Kelimvor and his icy prison well ashore. As the fighter waited for further adjustments, he examined his situation. He was trapped from his waist to his knees in a sheet of black ice. Below his knees he could kick freely, whirling cold water around his calves and feet. Judging by what he could feel, the ice was about six inches thick. 
In front of him, two inches of snow blanketed tufts of beach grass and capped several dozen pieces of driftwood littering the shore. Beyond that, a steep bank of sand rose ten feet. Six inches of soil topped the embankment, providing meager purchase for a few twisted dwarf pines that perfumed the air with a sweet, citrus-like odor. The lake itself was nestled in a hollow at the base of the high moor. To Kellamvor's left, a single brook, now frozen and black, drained the tiny lake. The only visible inlet was the frozen waterfall, though Kellamvor knew that at least one underground stream also fed the lake. After his brief examination of his surroundings yielded no easy method of escape, Kellamvor jerked and tried to pull free of the ice. When that failed, he screamed in rage. His bellow came echoing back to him, as clear and as crisp as when he voiced it. The echo only made the fighter feel more desperate. Kellamvor shrieked again and dug his hands into the sand, then pulled with all his might. A keen ache shot through his shoulders and down his spine. His arms, still fatigued from the long swim, felt as heavy as clubs. Still, he did not stop pulling. Finally, Kellamvor's muscles began to quiver— then he started shivering and realized how cold he was. The air stung his fingers and his face, while his torso prickled with icy needles. Below his waist, the cold gnawed at his bones, burning his buttocks and thighs with frosty agony. He worried most about his feet. Despite his tightly laced leggings and well-oiled boots, his feet were soaked. Kellamvor suspected that the stinging in his toes was the first stage of frostbite, if he did not escape soon, the warrior knew he would lose his toes, perhaps even freeze to death. A crow landed in the low branches of the closest pine, then stared at the trapped fighter with a hungry gleam in its eye. Kellamvor hissed at it. The bird remained perched in the tree, politely waiting for the green-eyed man to die. It could afford to be patient. Judging from its lustrous feathers and plump body, the crow fed itself quite well. Kellamvor did not enjoy being sized up as if he were a leg of mutton. "'Come back tomorrow,' he called, the cold causing him to stutter. "'I'm not going anywhere.' The crow blinked but did not leave. Although it was in no hurry to start its feast, the bird did not intend to let some other scavenger claim its prize. Kellamvor grabbed a piece of driftwood and hurtled it at the black bird. The stick missed and hit the tree next to the crow's. The bird turned its black eyes on the trembling boughs, then looked back at the warrior. "'Just leave me alone,' Kellamvor growled, waving his hand at the bird. "'Let me die with some dignity.' The hopelessness he felt surprised the fighter. Kellamvor had never been one to give up before the battle ended, but he had never felt this frightened before. Kellamvor avoided examining that fear too closely. He had faced death many times before, and had never felt as despondent as now. The fighter was afraid of something more than dying. He told himself that leaving the tablet to the zombies was what had upset him. But he knew that was a lie. Though Kellamvor understood the importance of returning the tablet to Helm, losing it would not produce such anguish. The true reason for his distress was Adon's death and the uncertainty of Midnight's fate— Though he had no way of knowing what had happened to her, the warrior felt certain she could not have avoided the whirlpool. Stop thinking, he told himself. Stop thinking before it's too late. Kellamvor suddenly wanted to go to sleep so he could wake up and discover that the zombies and underground stream had been bad dreams. But the fighter did not dare to close his eyes. Even through his growing disorientation, Kellamvor knew that sleep could be deadly in freezing conditions. The shivering went away and his muscles began to stiffen. Kellamvor knew he was slipping closer to death. He kicked his legs, then beat the black sheet beneath his chest. The ice did not crack, did not pop, did not give at all. He was as good as dead, yet was still alive. That makes me undead, Kellamvor thought like the caravan zombies. He chuckled grimly at this half-formed thought. But undeath was better than what had happened to Adon and Midnight. Forget it, he told himself. Thinking about the past will bring nothing but more sorrow. Survive first, then think. Not thinking was easier said than done. 
if Kelimvor had not insisted upon rescuing the caravan, had not been so stubborn, his friends would be alive. But the fighter had been stubborn, as he always was. He thought that perhaps he deserved to die. Stop it! He spoke the words aloud, hoping to snap himself into a more alert state of mind. The crow squawked once, as if suggesting Kelimvor get on with his death. Fetch a dagger, then, or a sharp rock, Kelimvor muttered to the bird. I can't kill myself with bare hands. The bird cocked its head, then ruffled its feathers and stared at Kelimvor with a disapproving glare. Kelimvor stretched forward and grabbed a thick piece of driftwood. The crow prepared to take flight, but Kelimvor had no interest in attacking the bird again. Hefting the branch like a club, the fighter turned to his right as far as he could, then smashed the branch down on the ice. A loud crack pealed across the lake, echoing off the cliff on the far side. Kelimvor tried to move his leg and found it would not budge. He raised the log and struck again. Another loud crack rolled across the ice-covered lake. The wooden club snapped in two, and one end went skittering across the ice, leaving the fighter holding a two-foot-long wooden stake. The crow squawked several times, then hopped out of the tree. It landed on the shore, just out of Kelimvor's reach, and squawked once more. Kelimvor considered throwing his stick at the bird, then thought better of the idea. The broken branch was not much of a tool, but it was all he had. Instead of attacking the crow, he grasped the stick as he might a dagger, then hit the ice with its sharp end. Something gave, so he struck again and again, his movements growing increasingly jerky and erratic. Finally, Kelimbor stopped to see what he had accomplished. The fighter had smashed the end of the branch into a rounded pulp. His hand throbbed with the force of his blows, but the exertion had warmed his body a little. The black ice showed only the tiniest depression. It was much harder than the driftwood, and the fighter's efforts had done nothing to break it. If he wanted to smash his way free, Kelimvor knew he would have to find something harder than the driftwood, harder than the ice. Kelimvor thought of the flint and steel and the purse he kept around his neck, but quickly discarded the idea. They were just chips he used to start campfires— they might serve well enough as hard points if fastened onto the end of the stick, but he had no way to do that. Besides, they would certainly be lost if they flew off the end of the stick, and that was a risk the fighter could not take. When he freed himself, he would need the flint and steel to start a fire. If it came down to death, he would use the flint to scratch at the ice, but it would be a futile effort and he knew it. Kelimvor turned his attention back to the shoreline, with the dulled stick he still held, the warrior could reach other objects. Unfortunately, the only things on the shore were more sticks and the bird. A wave of despair passed over Kelimvor as he decided that he could do nothing to save himself, for the ice was too thick and too hard. He was going to die, like the others. Don't think about them, he told himself. Thinking about them will demoralize you, make you want to die and Kelimvor wanted to live. It surprised him, somehow, but he definitely wanted to live. The crow hopped within the fighter's reach. The bird pretended to take no notice of Kelimvor, though it was difficult to tell exactly what its black eyes were focused upon. Perhaps the crow was testing the warrior, trying to decide how much longer it would take for him to die. "'I won't hurry on your account,' Kelimvor grumbled. The crow cocked its head, then opened its beak and hissed. Kelimvor thought of the beak pecking at his eyes, of the spiked claws digging at his ears and nose. He winced. Then an idea occurred to him, though it was born not of wisdom, but of the irrationality that comes with freezing to death. He scratched at the ice with his fingernails and noticed that he had scraped away the slightest bit. Of course, even muddled as he was, Kelimvor knew that he would be long dead before working free of the ice with his own nails. But the crow's claws were sharper than fingernails, and the fighter could see many possibilities for the beak. As if sensing his thoughts, the crow watched Kelimvor warily. "'I think I'll go to sleep,' Kelimvor said, concerned by how thick his speech had become. In his confusion, he feared the crow might not understand him if he slurred his words. The bird, of course, showed no sign of understanding him at all. 
Kellimvor laid his head in his arms, keeping one eye open just enough to watch the bird. It felt good to rest his head, and he noticed that he was finally warm. The warrior was extremely drowsy, and thought the effort of his long swim had finally caught up to him. He closed both his eyes. Ten minutes later, the crow decided to investigate the immobile man. Taking to its wings, the bird approached twice and fluttered overhead without landing. Finally, it settled a foot from Kelimvor's head and stared directly into the warrior's face. The man's eyes remained firmly closed, and his breath was so shallow it could not be detected. The crow hopped forward, then pecked at the fighter's nose. When Kelimvor did not stir, the crow pecked again, this time taking a pinch of flesh away in its beak. Kelimvor woke with a start and saw the black form in front of his eyes. Even as addled as he was, the fighter realized the crow was causing his pain. He lunged and his right hand closed on oily feathers. His left hand caught the bird by the leg and the warrior felt a bone snap. The crow squawked and slashed with its free foot. Kelimvor closed his eyes. Sharp claws ripped into his brow. The fighter screamed and the bird pressed harder, trying to rip through the man's eyelids and jerk an eyeball loose. Kelimvor released the bird and covered his face. An instant later, the crow's wings beat the air and the bird was airborne. The fighter wiped the blood from his brow and looked after the bird. The fight had charged Kelimvor's body with adrenaline, and the warrior was thinking clearly enough to wonder why he had ever believed it possible to scratch through six inches of ice with a crow's claw. Filthy squab, Kelimvor called, touching his fingers to the cuts in his forehead. The crow circled several times, then flew away toward the west. With some alarm, the warrior noted that the sun was sinking, and there were only about two hours of daylight remaining. He began to feel lonely and frightened, and wished he had not chased the bird away. Though it had been waiting to pick his bones, at least the crow had been company. Kelimvor noted that his legs had gone numb from the thighs down, and that his hands had taken on a blue tint. He was in danger of becoming a lump of ice. The fighter began waving his hands and trying to kick his feet, hoping to get the blood circulating and warm them. This was only a temporary solution. If he was going to survive, he needed to warm himself. Fortunately, it looked as though the tools to do that were within arm's reach. Hoping that this was not another confused idea brought about by the cold, Kelimvor started gathering materials to start a fire. Stretching as far as he could, the fighter swept the snow off tufts of beech grass and pulled them out by their roots. He stored the grass inside his shirt and did not stop gathering it until his shirt was bulging. The warrior was working more by instinct than by thought, for he had started a thousand fires and trusted his intuition more than his muddled intelligence. Next, he gathered all the driftwood within reach, separating the smaller pieces from the larger. Within minutes, he had three small piles of wood. Finally, he selected his six largest sticks and laid them to his left, side by side so they made a small platform. From experience, he knew that once the fire was burning well, the flames would convert the ice directly to steam, but in the initial stages, the fire had to be kept off the ice. Kelimvor removed a handful of grass and rubbed it vigorously between his hands to dry it. He laid it atop the platform of sticks and repeated the process until he had a small pile of fairly dry tinder. Then he took the flint and steel from his purse and started striking them together. Five anxious and painful minutes later, a spark caught. One blade of grass began to burn, then two, then several. The fighter put on more grass and, after it started burning, held several twigs over the fire to dry. Thirty seconds later, Kelimvor began to shiver and could no longer hold the twigs. He laid them on the fire. The wood began to smoke, then one caught. The fighter blew gently on the flame. The other two twigs began to burn. Kelimvor put his flint and steel away. Minutes later, a small circle of orange flames danced in front of him. The breeze eddied around his body, blowing smoke and ash into his face. His eyes teared and he coughed, but the warrior didn't care. To him, the smoke was perfume and the coughing a small price to pay for heat. Soon, he stopped shivering and his whole torso was warm. Ten minutes later, Kelimvor no longer felt confused. 
He was fatigued and numb below the waist, but he was no longer drowsy. His motor coordination had returned to normal. The fire had made a small bowl in the black ice, and the fighter took comfort in seeing that it melted like normal ice. Now, all he had to do was find a way to break it. Kellimbor considered starting a fire where his hips disappeared into the frozen lake, but rejected the idea. He could not reach enough driftwood to melt away that much ice. What he needed was a way to chip the ice, and that meant he needed something hard. The lake was surrounded by all sorts of cliffs, boulders, and rocks, but there wasn't even a pebble within reach. They were all buried beneath the sandy beach. Had Kellimvor still been half-frozen and muddled, he would have missed the significance of his last thought. However, now that he was warm, his thoughts were focused and he was mentally alert. With renewed determination, he grabbed the strongest piece of driftwood within reach and began digging in the sand in front of him. Not six inches below the surface, he found the first rock. It was a round, hand-sized stone useful for throwing, but not for smashing through ice. He kept digging. The second stone was a little better, being about the same size, but with jagged features more suited to chipping. He set aside this rock, too, and kept digging. A foot beneath the surface, Kellimvor found the ideal stone. It was a dark gray thing, featureless and drab, but to the fighter the stone was more beautiful than any diamond. It was as large as he could handle with a single hand. On one end it had a small, sharp point, and the other end was large and ideal for gripping. Kellimvor took the stone, then smashed it into the ice near his hip. A small spray of black chips shot up. He brought the rock down a dozen more times, trying to create a crack in the ice. The result was simply a dozen more small chips. At the top of the slope, wings fluttered. The crow settled beneath its tree, holding its left claw off the ground. Looking at the injured leg, Kellimvor said, I'm sorry about the foot. The crow tilted its head and, unable to stand for long on one foot, settled on the ground as though sitting in a nest. The fighter smiled and held up the rock. It looks like dinner will be late, Kellimvor added. The crow's head bobbed twice. Had Kellimvor's mind been more addled, he might have interpreted the awkward gesture for agreement, as if the crow were saying, delayed but not cancelled. The fighter decided to ignore the crow and began chipping beneath his chest where the ice was thinner. To his delight, a large, jagged section broke away. Working toward his waist from this break, Kellimvor managed to start a crack that pointed more or less toward his right hip. He worked for twenty minutes, pausing every now and then to throw some more driftwood on the fire. In that time, he managed to extend the crack clear to the middle of his hip. Then, as the sun sank toward the moor hills and the sky turned pink, his fire melted through the ice. It dropped into the water, leaving a sizzling and smoking hole two feet to his left. No! Kellimvor screamed. His only answer was the chill moan of the wind. The fighter began to grow cold immediately. He tried to pull out of the ice, hoping the crack he had opened was enough to free him. His hips did not budge. Kellimvor reached for more grass to start another fire, then found he had already used most of it. Worse, only a few sticks of driftwood remained within reach. Even if he did start a second fire, it would never last through the night. He beat his forehead against the ice and cursed. Already, numbness was creeping back into his hands and fingers, and he knew that there was not much warmth left in his body. At last, Kellimvor allowed himself to think the unthinkable. He had been wrong to insist upon rescuing the caravan. His stubbornness had gotten a dawn, and probably midnight, killed. "'Friends!' he screamed. "'Forgive me! Please, midnight! Oh, midnight!' He screamed her name again and again and again, until he could no longer bear hearing the hills throw the name back at him. When he stopped yelling, the crow flapped down to the shore, taking care to land out of arm's reach. It squawked three times, as if suggesting Kellimvor give up and die. The bird's eagerness enraged the fighter. Not yet, squab, he snarled. He grabbed the first stone he had uncovered, the small round one, and flung it at the crow. 
Though his aim was wide, the crow took the hint and flapped away into twilight. After the bird had gone, Kelimvor picked up his large stone and angrily pounded at the ice on his left. If he was going to die, he was determined to fight until the end. Kelimvor was so angry that he did not notice the tiny fractures his blows were causing. Five minutes later, a long crack opened in the black ice from his shoulders to the hole the fire had caused. It took only ten minutes more to open a seam all the way to his left hip. Then, as the warm hues of dusk gave way to the violet tones of night, the section of ice under Kelimvor's chest broke free. The fighter pulled his body forward, no longer clamped into place by the ice at his hips. Without pausing to celebrate, he hauled himself onto the shore and began gathering grass and wood. After starting his fire, Kelimvor removed his frozen pants and boots to examine his feet and legs. The legs were blotchy and pale, but he thought they would recover given time and warmth. His feet were in worse condition. They were white, numb, and cold to the touch. Kelimvor had served in enough cold-weather campaigns to know severe frostbite when he saw it. Chapter 13 Dark Awakening Midnight woke from a deep slumber, her body sore and stiff. She had been dreaming of a dry bed in a warm inn, so the mage was confused and disoriented when she opened her eyes and found something else. The gloom was so thick she couldn't see her own nose, and she was lying face down on cool sand, half in, half out of lapping water. Behind her, a waterfall pounded the surface of a small pool. The waterfall reminded Midnight of her journey down the subterranean stream and the unpleasant drop through the whirlpool. The magic user had landed in the dark pond behind her. After that, she had floated aimlessly until she'd reached the shore upon which she now lay. Midnight had no way of knowing it, but that had been ten hours ago. Fatigued from the misfired cone of cold and the struggle in the stream, her body had collapsed into a restorative sleep as soon as immediate danger passed. The mage now felt physically and mentally rejuvenated, but was still emotionally exhausted. Adon was dead, and that knowledge blackened the joy and wonder of her own survival. Midnight wanted to blame somebody for Adon's death, and Kelimvor was the easiest one to condemn. If the warrior had not insisted upon aiding the caravan, the zombies would never have trapped the party, and Siric would not have caught them unprepared. But such reasoning was weak, and Midnight knew it. There were too many coincidences and contingencies. That Siric would recover so quickly had been unthinkable, and the magic user still could not imagine how he had— but given the fact that he had, it was inevitable that the thief would catch up and attack. Midnight had been just as blind to that possibility as Kelimvor, and it was not fair to blame the warrior for not foreseeing what she had also failed to predict. If the blame for Adon's death lay with anybody, Midnight thought it lay with her. She should never have let her friends convince her not to kill Siric when she had the chance— the magic user alone had seen how brutal the thief had grown, and she should have known that his willpower and ruthlessness would give him the strength to pursue them. She would not make the same mistake again. There was nothing she could do to bring Adon back, but if she ever escaped from this cavern and saw Siric again, she would avenge the cleric's death. The thought of escaping the cavern turned Midnight's thoughts to Kelimvor, whom she assumed was also in the cave— the warrior had splashed into the stream after her, and that had been the last she'd heard of him. It did not seem unreasonable to assume he had dropped through the whirlpool behind her. He could be sitting thirty feet away, thinking himself alone in the dark. Kelimvor, Midnight called, rising to her feet. Her voice echoed off the cavern's unseen walls, barely audible above the roar of the waterfall. Kelimvor, where are you? Again, the only answer was her echo. A depressing thought occurred to her. She had avoided drowning, but that was no guarantee the fighter had. After all, Kelimvor had been carrying the tablet. It would have been difficult to keep from drowning while holding onto the saddlebags. Kelimvor, she called more desperately. Answer me! He did not answer. 
Picturing Kelimvor's drowned body floating beneath the waterfall, Midnight drew her dagger. She summoned the incantation to create magical light and performed it. The dagger began glowing with a brilliant white light. It suddenly grew extremely hot and she dropped it, her fingers searing with pain. The magic user kneeled and thrust her hand into the pool's cool water, irritated that her magic had misfired. Still, the dagger glowed brightly enough for Midnight to see that she was on the shore of a dark pond. Twenty feet away, the waterfall poured into the cave from a hole in the ceiling, churning the surface of the pond into a dark froth. The ceiling was fifteen feet high and vaulted like the interior of a cathedral. Hundreds of stalactites hung from it, their tips glistening with moisture. Drooping spheres of minerals, with skins as rough and pebbly as dragonhide, sprouted from the walls. In every corner, murky tunnels and alcoves ran back into the depths of the cave. Kel! Midnight called again. Her voice echoed off the walls, then faded into the sound of the waterfall. She was alone, lost underground. Adon was dead, and Kelimvor was gone, maybe dead as well. As if to emphasize the mage's morbid point, her dagger's light suddenly dimmed and changed to a red hue. She looked down and saw that it had become a puddle of molten iron. It was slowly trickling away, taking the last vestiges of light with it and leaving midnight in the dark once more. The magic user considered her situation. First of all, even if it was impossible to find a way out of the cavern on foot, she realized she was not trapped. If the circumstances became desperate, she could try using her art to escape. Considering the unpredictability of magic, doing that would be risky. But if there was no other option, Midnight would not hesitate to trust her luck. Once the mage realized she had a way out of the cave, it became easier to think calmly. The second thing Midnight considered was that she was alone. Adon was certainly dead. If Cyric's arrow had not killed him, the fall or the stream had— but the only proof she had that Kelimvor drowned was her own conjecture, and it was born out of solitude and fear rather than sound thinking. After all, Kelimvor was stronger than Midnight, and she had not died. Even burdened with a tablet, his chances of surviving were much greater than hers. It seemed likely that he had washed out of the water in a different part of the cavern. Finally, Midnight realized that though she did not know where she was, it was somewhere more or less beneath Dragonspear Castle. According to Bahal, the entrance to the Realm of the Dead was also beneath the castle's ruins. Midnight concluded that the smartest thing to do was explore the cavern. With luck, she would find either Kelimvor or the Realm of the Dead. Unfortunately, she would need a light. The magic user thought of using her dagger's molten metal to ignite something as a torch, but did not have anything with her that would burn long enough to do her any good. She had no choice except to try using her magic again. Midnight removed her dagger's sheath from its belt, then summoned the incantation for creating light. This time a bright flash appeared. The unexpected burst of light hurt the mage's eyes, leaving her stunned and dazed with white spots swimming in her vision. A few moments later her sight returned to normal, and the mage saw that she remained in total darkness. Her magic had again failed. Midnight decided to do without light for now, then started walking along the shore of the pond. She moved slowly and carefully, testing her footing with each step and waving her hands in front of her head to locate unseen obstacles. Every few moments she paused to call Kelimvor. Soon, Midnight discovered that the echo of her voice provided hints about the size and shape of the cavern. The longer it took the echo to return to her, the farther away from the cavern wall she was. By turning in a circle and calling Kelimvor's name, she could get an idea of the cavern's shape. Armed with this discovery, she soon circled the pond. It seemed to be about a hundred yards in diameter— though it was difficult to be sure with all of the twists and turns in its shoreline. The only audible inlet was the waterfall, and the only outlet a small brook that trickled out one end. Since she had found no other exits, Midnight slowly walked along the brook's edge. The magic user constantly called Kelimvor's name, always moving in the direction from which it took the echo the longest to return— in the complete darkness, it was difficult to guess time and distance. Still, 
Midnight soon realized the cave was immense. Midnight continued to follow the water along its snaking course for what she guessed to be two hours. Occasionally, the corridor broadened into large rooms. From the echoes, it sounded as though dozens of alcoves and side passages opened off of these rooms. Although the magic user took the time to call down these passages, she was careful not to wander away from the brook. It was the only reliable means of navigation she had. Besides, if Kelimvor had fallen through the whirlpool, she suspected the best chance of finding him lay in following the water. Eventually, the brook entered a large room and formed another pond. Midnight carefully explored the shores of the pond, but could find no outlet. On one end of the pool, there was a gentle gurgling that suggested the water drained out through a submerged passage. The magic user sat down in frustration. For a long time, Midnight tried to puzzle out what might have happened to Kelimvor and what he might be doing as a result. The more she pondered the possibilities, the more it seemed that in the end Kelimvor would go to Waterdeep. Assuming he had survived, which was the only thing the mage allowed herself to believe, the fighter knew two things that she thought would eventually force him to make that choice. First, the tablet had to be delivered to Waterdeep. Second, Midnight's eventual destination was also the City of Splendors, and if they had a chance of meeting again, it would be there. As the magic user contemplated Kelimvor's situation, a white silhouette floated into the cavern from a side passage. It was roughly the shape of a man, but appeared to be made entirely of light. It illuminated everything within twenty feet of it. "'Who are you?' Midnight called, both frightened by the form and curious about it. The figure turned and approached to within ten feet of her, then stopped and looked her over without speaking. It had the features of a robust man, heavy beard, square jaw, and steady eyes, all formed with light. The body, also nothing more than white light, had the musculature of someone well acquainted with hard work, perhaps a blacksmith. After studying her for a moment, the white silhouette turned away without speaking and started toward a corridor opposite the one from which it had entered. Wait, Midnight called, rising. I'm lost. Help me! The white form paid her no more attention. The magic user scrambled after it, struggling to stay within the small circle it illuminated. Within a few steps, the sandy shore gave way to pebbles, then the pebbles gave way to large rocks. Despite the treacherous footing, Midnight scurried along behind the white specter, determined not to lose her light source or the mysterious silhouette. It did not take Midnight long to notice that the apparition seemed to be following a passage running more or less in one direction. Several times, the tunnel opened into large rooms. In such chambers, Midnight feared she would lose the silhouette, for the caverns were littered with jagged boulders, sudden drops, and sloping floors. Once, she nearly stepped into a deep hole, and another time she had to leap across a crevice. Still, Despite having to rush blindly through short expanses of cavern, Midnight managed to stay with the specter. After what must have been five hours of exhausting travel, the silhouette drifted into a vast area of darkness. The ceiling was about fifteen feet high, but Midnight could not see the far side of the chamber. As she scrambled after the specter, the echoes of the rocks she dislodged seemed distant and subdued. The mage called out Kelimvor's name, and the sound of her voice drifted away into darkness, giving her the impression that this chamber was immense. Midnight continued into the room, following the glowing apparition. Five minutes later, they reached a smooth wall of quarried granite. An expert stonemason had fitted the blocks so tightly that Midnight could not have slipped a dagger's blade into the seams. The granite itself had been cut and polished so expertly that even the finest thief would slip trying to gain a handhold on it. The wall ran in both directions as far as the silhouette illuminated and rose fifteen feet to butt against the ceiling. Her pulse quickening with excitement, Midnight followed the specter along the wall, running her hand down the slick cold stones. Finally they intersected a stone-paved street that entered the wall. Unlike the wall itself, 
the road showed signs of its incredible age. Some of its cobblestones had cracked or sunk into the ground, while others had become dislodged and lay scattered about. The street ran beneath the wall in an arched tunnel. A heavy, bronze-plated portcullis sealed each end of the vault. To either side of the main arch there were smaller vaults, just large enough for a man to stand up in. These tunnels were sealed by heavy, bronze-plated doors. The door on the closest tunnel hung cockeyed and open, and the silhouette entered the vault without hesitation. Midnight slipped past the door and followed. Again, the workmanship in the room was flawless. Each stone was squarely cut and set into place without the tiniest gap, and the keystones had not slipped a fraction of an inch in what Midnight assumed must have been thousands of years. At the other end of the tunnel, they reached another partially opened door, again plated in bronze. The specter slipped past it and disappeared. Midnight quickly followed, pushing the door open. Its hinges creaked loudly from a lack of oil. The street continued straight ahead, save that now curbstones and sidewalks lined it. On either side of the road, gray square buildings rose to a height of two stories. Made of quarried stone, the buildings had a simple and clean architectural style. On the first floor, a rectangular door led into each dwelling, and on the second story, one or two square windows overlooked the street. Without exception, they were constructed with the finest workmanship, though Midnight did see a few signs of deterioration, loose stones and gaps in the seams between blocks. But it was not the buildings that caught Midnight's interest. The white specters of a thousand men and women flitted here and there, their glowing forms illuminating the city in pale, twinkling light. The streets buzzed with the eerie cackle of their conversations. Upon seeing so many apparitions in one place, it occurred to Midnight that this was a gathering place for shades like the one she had followed into the city. An instant later, she concluded that the glowing white forms were the souls of the dead. Noting that the soul specters were not paying her any attention, Midnight started down the street. Though frightened, she was determined not to let that fear get in her way. If this city was the realm of the dead, then the other tablet of fate was hidden somewhere nearby. She intended to get it and leave as quickly as possible. Then she would find Kelimvor. Halfway down the first block, a soul specter approached Midnight. He had the form of an elderly man, with wrinkles on his brow and confused, vacant spheres of light where his eyes should have been. Jessica? the man asked, reaching out for Midnight's hand. Is that you? I didn't want to leave until we were together. Midnight recoiled, anxiously avoiding his touch. No, you're looking for somebody else. Are you sure? the specter asked, disappointed. I can't wait much longer. I'm not Jessica, Midnight answered firmly. Then, more gently, she added, Don't worry, I'm sure she'll be along when her time comes. You can wait for her. No, I can't, the specter snapped. I don't have time. You'll see. With that, he turned and drifted away. After the soul specter left, Midnight continued down the street. Several times, shades approached her, demanding to know if she was a loved one or friend, though they seldom seemed as confused as the old man. Midnight was able to excuse herself with nothing more than polite denials, then continue on her way. For the first two blocks, the road was lined with empty shops, often with living quarters located directly overhead. Midnight poked her head into the doors of four of the buildings as she went. Each time, a small party of specters greeted her, twice with polite invitations to join them, once with disinterested rudeness, and once with a rather hostile demand to be left alone. As Midnight progressed farther into the city, she grew increasingly impressed by the thoughtfulness and planning that had gone into building it. The streets all intersected at right angles, and the blocks were more or less uniform in size. But the dwellings themselves were not drab or uninteresting. The buildings had been designed with a stoic artistry. They had clean, square forms and symmetrical plans that lent themselves to function as well as beauty. Exterior walls were adorned with simple etched lines that echoed the rectangular designs of the structures. 
Doors were always placed in the center of the building, with an equal number of windows located in similar positions on either side of them. The simple architecture left midnight with a relaxed, peaceful feeling. The city's third block was entirely taken by a single structure that rose all the way to the cavern's roof. This building lacked both doors and windows, its only opening being a great arch located exactly in the middle of the block. Midnight went to this arch and entered the massive structure. She emerged in a great open courtyard. On three sides it was lined by three-story promenades. Behind the promenades, arched doorways led into spacious rooms. A massive building, supported by white columns of the finest marble, dominated the end of the courtyard to midnight's left. The altar in its entrance suggested it was a temple. At the other end of the courtyard, dozens of specters lounged on the edge of a marble fountain. In the center of the fountain, a magnificent spout of water shot high into the air and turned to mist. A strange harmony, at once unsettling and calming, radiated from the fountain, and Midnight found herself drawn toward its waters. The specters near the font seemed oblivious to her presence, so she approached and peered into the pool. The water was as still as ice and as black as Bahal's heart, but also as clear as glass. The magic user felt as though she were looking into another world, where peace and tranquility reigned supreme. Beneath the water lay a great plain of shimmering light. It sprawled in all directions as far as midnight could see, and she felt as though she could see to the edge of the realms. The plain was entirely featureless, save that millions of tiny figures milled about on it. Gazing at the magnificent plain, a mood of serenity and destiny supplanted the mage's sorrow concerning Adon's loss and her anxiety about Kelimvor's absence. She felt it would not be long before she and her old friends were reunited. Midnight did not know why she felt this way, but suspected it had something to do with the vast plain below. A deep, rough voice interrupted the magic user's reverie. "'I'm sorry to see you here.' Midnight looked up and saw a specter addressing her. The shade was familiar, and she could not help flinching. The voice belonged to Kay Deverell, but to her the form would forever be Bahal's. "'Don't be sorry,' Midnight said. Deverell took a seat on the fountain next to her. "'And your friends? I forgot their names. How do they fare?' "'I don't know about Kelimvor, Midnight replied. "'But Adon's down here somewhere.' "'And the halfling?' Deverell asked. "'What about Sneakabout?' "'He died in Yellow Snake Pass,' Midnight said. "'She did not elaborate. "'The memory of Sirik's treachery pained her too much.' "'Deverell sighed. "'I had hoped to hear better news.' A specter leaped through Deverell and dove into the fountain, then sank toward the plain in long, graceful spirals. The Lord Commander draped a hand into the water and watched the specter descend with a mixture of envy and fear. Oblivion, how it draws us, Deverell mused. He closed his eyes as though he were pulling a long draft from his mug back at Highhorn. Though his hand did not disturb the water's glassy surface, the dark liquid was draining away the pain and anguish that came with being dead. It was also draining away the Cormirian's memories of life. At length he withdrew his hand. The time for him to leap into the pool would come soon enough. As soon as they died, the souls of the dead were drawn by Miracle's magic to one of the thousands of places like this, the Fountain of Nepenthe, a pool or well filled with the black waters of forgetfulness. In normal times, Miracle's attraction was so strong that a soul specter would immediately leap into dark waters, then emerge on the plain on the other side. With Miracle barred from his home, however, his magic had been considerably weakened. Many soul specters were finding the strength to resist his attraction, although only temporarily. All through the realms, soul specters were gathered outside long-forgotten wells and pools and fountains, vainly attempting to resist the final call of death. Deverell tore his thoughts away from the fountain and turned to Midnight. Tell me, who has the tablets now? What will happen to Cormir and the realms? Kelimvor has one of the tablets, Midnight said, 
unaware that she was lying. And the other is here somewhere. Here? Deverell asked, perplexed. What would it be doing here? It's in Bone Castle, Midnight explained. Miracle took it. Then the realms are doomed, Deverell replied flatly. Unless I can get to the castle and recover the tablet, Midnight said, dipping her fingers into the fountain's glistening water. Unlike Deverell, she caused expanding rings of ripples. The water both chilled and comforted her. Stop! Deverell yelled, reaching for her arm. His fingers closed right through her bones, leaving the flesh cold and numb. You're alive! Yes, Midnight said reluctantly, unsure what to make of Deverell's reaction. Pull your hand out of the water! Midnight obeyed, wondering if she had offended the soul specter by touching his fountain. This calmed Deverell. You're alive, and that means there is hope, he said, but not if you let those waters drain your memory. Now, what is this about Bone Castle? That's where the other tablet is, Midnight explained. I've got to get inside and recover it. Can you take me there? Deverell's form grew even whiter, if that was possible. No, he muttered and turned away. I'm not ready for the fountain of Nepenthe, and even if I was, I've never been to the realm of the dead. This isn't it? Midnight demanded. Not by an arrow's long flight, Deverell said, shaking his head. We're in Canaglim, according to the others. Canaglim? Built by the dwarves when the high moor was fertile and warm. Midnight could not imagine a time when the high moor was fertile, much less warm. But there are no dwarves here now, she observed, looking around the fountain. No, Deverell agreed. They never inhabited it, at least not for long. The town well ran dry within a year of Canaglim's completion. The dwarves sank a deeper well on the site of the old one. Eventually, they struck a limitless supply of water, the waters of forgetfulness. Within a month, they realized their mistake and renamed their beautiful well the Fountain of Nepenthe. A month after that, most of them abandoned Canaglim completely. Those who were too stubborn to evacuate simply forgot where they lived and wandered off into the dark. Then this isn't Miracle's realm, Midnight sighed. Bahal said there was an entrance to the realm of the dead below Dragonspear. I thought I had found it. That you have, Deverell responded, nodding toward the fountain. Under the water? Aye. The dwarves dug this well so deep they struck Miracle's domain, Deverell explained. It should be easy to reach, then, Midnight said, peering into the dark pool. A simple water-breathing— No, Deverell interrupted. Not through the water. It drains your emotions and your memories. Midnight was not worried. I have other ways to pass. She was thinking specifically of teleporting, but a better idea presented itself to her. It was something called a world walk, which created an ultra-dimensional connection between planes. Midnight had never heard of that spell before, but she had a good idea why she would be able to use it. Then, without giving the matter any conscious thought, she realized she knew not only how to perform the incantation, but how it was constructed, the theory that made it work, and that Elminster had developed the original spell. The magic user was astonished. There was no reason she should know all that. The information had simply come to her. She decided to see what else she could do. Midnight searched her memory for a complete listing of Elminster's spells. Her mind was immediately flooded with the incantations for, construction of, and theory behind every spell Elminster knew, which seemed an endless list of magic. Reeling from the plethora of information, she turned her thoughts away from the ancient mage's magic. Remembering an interesting spell she had once witnessed, in which a mage interposed a disembodied magical hand between himself and an attacker, Midnight explored her mind for information about that spell. Again, she immediately discovered that she knew everything about it, from how to perform the incantation to the fact that a wizard named Bigby had invented it several centuries ago. Somehow, Midnight realized, she had acquired an encyclopedic knowledge of magic, 
almost as though she had access to a mystical book containing every spell ever invented. There was no doubt that this new ability was related to Mistra's power, but the magic user did not understand why it had come to her at this particular moment. Perhaps it was because she was so close to an exit from the realms, or perhaps it was simply another development in her expanding relationship to the planet's magical weave. Whatever the reason, Midnight could not help but feel encouraged. She would certainly need every advantage available if she was to recover the Tablet of Fate from Bone Castle. Contemplating the task of recovering the tablet brought Midnight's thoughts back to Deverell and his interest in helping her. Turning to the Lord Commander, she asked, "'You're already dead, so what do you care what happens to the realms?' "'A man's honor does not die with his body,' Deverell replied. "'As a harper, I swore to uphold the good and combat evil wherever I found it. That vow will bind me until—' He nodded toward the fountain. "'I hope that's a long time,' Midnight responded. Deverell did not reply for he knew that he didn't have the willpower to resist the fountain much longer. "'You look tired. Perhaps you should rest before you go,' he said. "'I'll watch over you.' "'I think I will,' Midnight replied. She did not know how long it had been since she had slept, but the mage suspected that there would be little opportunity for rest in the realm of the dead. They went to one corner of the courtyard, and Midnight lay down. It took her a long time to fall asleep and then her rest was filled with dreams and bad omens. Still, she slept as long as possible, and when she woke, her body, if not her mind, felt ready to continue her journey. As she stood and stretched, Midnight noticed that a crowd of several thousand soul specters had gathered in the courtyard. "'I'm sorry,' Deverell said. "'When you fell asleep, word of a live woman's presence spread quickly. They've come to look at you, but mean no harm.' Looking at the specters' envious faces, Midnight felt sad for them. "'It's all right,' she said. "'How long did I sleep?' Deverell shrugged. "'I'm sorry, but I no longer have a sense of time.' Midnight started forward. Then a thought occurred to her, and she turned to Deverell. "'If somebody died at Dragonspear Castle, would his soul come to Canaglim?' Deverell nodded. "'Of course.' The Fountain of Nepenthe is the closest access to the realm of the dead from the ruins. Midnight turned and addressed the crowd. Calamvor, are you here? she cried. The crowd of soul specters shifted uneasily and looked from one to another, but nobody came forward. Midnight breathed a sigh of relief. The magic user addressed the crowd again, this time expecting a response. Adon, how about you? Come here so we can talk. Midnight was not sure how she would feel about speaking to a dead friend, but she had to try. Adon, it's midnight! Adon still did not show himself. Five minutes later, Deverell said, Perhaps he is scared, or could not resist the fountain for long. Midnight shook her head. That's not like Adon. He isn't one to give up. Deverell searched the crowd. Well, he's not coming forward. I don't think you'll gain anything by waiting for him. Midnight reluctantly nodded. Perhaps it's for the best. It would only cause us both pain. Then, if you're ready, Deverell said, extending a glowing hand toward the fountain of Nepenthe. Midnight gathered her courage and nodded. As ready as I'll ever be. Deverell led the way through the crowd of soul specters. When he reached the fountain of Nepenthe, he stopped and turned toward Midnight. Until swords part, then. Deverell's farewell heartened Midnight, for she recognized his words as a warrior's sign of respect. May your noble heart save your soul, she replied. The magic user looked back to the throng of soul specters, searching for Adon's face or some sign that he had come to see her off. The crowd remained a swarm of impassive and unfamiliar faces. Midnight turned to the pool, trying to imagine what she would find on the white plain below. Finally, hoping that if her magic was ever going to be reliable, it would be reliable now, she summoned the incantation for Elminster's world walk and performed it. A shimmering disk of force appeared over the fountain. Midnight took a deep breath and stepped inside.
Sirik stood before a small inn, his horse's reins in his hand. The inn was located in the barren prairie between Dragonspear Castle and Daggersford. The tavern and lodge were in a stone building standing in the shade of six maples. The stable sat fifty yards to the west, its corral built over a small stream that provided a constant supply of fresh water. But the stream was now clogged by dead livestock, and the stable had burned to the ground. At the tavern, the sign of the roosting griffin lay on the snow, half-burned and illegible. The shutters were smashed and splintered, and wisps of greasy smoke drifted out the open windows. "'Is there anything for me?' the thief's sword asked, the words forming inside his mind as if they were his own thoughts. "'I doubt it,' Sirik answered, "'but I'll look around.' He and the sword, he thought of it as a she, had fallen into the habit of addressing each other as companions, even friends, if such a thing were possible. Please, anything will do. I'm withering. I'll try, Sirik replied sincerely. I'm hungry, too. Neither of them had eaten since stealing the horse from the six hapless warriors who had rescued Sirik. The thief suspected the sword was in far worse shape than he was. For the first part of their fast, the sword had used its dark powers to keep him from feeling the effects of hunger. After Dragonspear Castle, however, she had grown too weak to continue sustaining the thief. That had been two days ago. Now, Sirik's belly ached with hunger, and he was lightheaded and weak with exhaustion. Both he and the sword needed sustenance. But there had been no chance to feed. After Midnight's attempt to kill him, Sirik had entered the tower, intending to chase Midnight and Kelimvor wherever they went. But as he started down the stairs, the zombies had emerged with the tablet. The thief had assumed that Kelimvor and Midnight had died at the undead creature's rotting hands. He had turned to follow the zombies, determined to steal the tablet from them at the first opportunity. So far, the undead caravan drivers had not given him a chance. They had marched far into the snowy plain west of the road, where they would not be observed by passing caravans. Then they had turned north and started walking at a plodding, relentless pace, and had not stopped since. Finally, because the caravan road ran northwest and the zombies had continued marching straight north, they had intersected the road near the inn. From a hiding place in the snow, Sirik had watched the undead raise the inn before resuming their relentless march. Although the thief was not sure why they had destroyed the tavern, he suspected it had been a mistake. By traveling so far off the road, the zombies were clearly taking pains to avoid detection. They had probably been instructed to kill anyone who saw them. So, when they ran across the inn, they had sacked it. Of course, destroying an establishment on a well-used road would hardly keep their presence secret, but zombies were not smart enough to think of that detail. Anyway, now that the undead had disappeared over the horizon, Sirik thought it was safe to see if they had left anything behind. He tied his horse to a maple tree, then entered the tavern. A dozen bodies littered the floor, scattered between tables and in the corners. It appeared the men had tried to fight the zombies off with fire, for expired torches lay strewn about the dirt floor. In several places the torches had touched something flammable, causing fires that still smoldered here and there. It looked as though the flames had fallen just short of engulfing the inn. "'How do you feel about drinking blood from the dead?' Sirik asked the sword. "'How do you feel about it?' she replied. "'Does anybody look good to you?' "'I'm not that hungry,' Sirik answered, disgusted. "'I am,' the sword said flatly. Sirik unsheathed his sword, then went over to the corpse of a burly woman wearing an apron— in her hand was the handle of a butcher knife, but the blade had been snapped off. Her throat was bruised where a zombie had choked her. Sirik knelt at her side, preparing to slip his sword between the corpse's ribs. "'She's dead,' said a man's strained voice. "'They all are.' Sirik quickly rose and turned around. A balding, portly man stood in the doorway, a loaded crossbow in his hands. "'Don't shoot!' Sirik said, slowly raising his hands. He assumed the man had seen enough to guess that his intentions were not honorable. 
The thief was merely looking for a way to stall until he could turn the advantage his way. This isn't what you think. The portly man frowned. What's wrong with you? Why are you so afraid? The man did not suspect Sirak of anything nefarious. He was in shock and had forgotten the effect that holding a lethal weapon would have on other people. Gathering his wits, Sirak nodded at the crossbow. I thought you might have mistaken me for— For a zombie? The man scoffed, looking at his crossbow and blushing. I'm not that rattled. The fat man stepped behind the bar and laid the weapon down. Will you join me in a draft? Compliments of the house? As you see, I'm out of business. Sirak sheathed his sword and went to the bar. I'd be happy to. The portly man poured Sirak a mug of ale, then set it on the counter and poured himself one. I'm called Farrell, he said, offering his hand. Sirak took the hand. Well met, I'm Sirak, he replied, forcing as much warmth as he could into his voice. How did you survive this? The fat man frowned. Zombie attack, he muttered flatly. I was in the basement when it happened. Just lucky, I guess. The thief narrowed his eyes and stared at the innkeeper for a moment. Yes, he said. I guess you were lucky. Yes, well, here's to luck, Sirik, Farrell called, draining his mug. After watching Farrell empty his mug in a single gulp, Sirik tipped his own. Unfortunately, his empty stomach rebelled at the strong brew and he could not finish it. He sat the mug down and braced himself against the bar. Are you ill? Farrell asked absently. At the moment, he was still too stunned and shocked to feel any real concern for a stranger, but he was too observant a host not to take notice of his guest's condition. Nay, Sirak replied, I haven't eaten in a week. That's too bad, Farrell muttered automatically, pouring himself another mug. He downed it in one long gulp, then belched quietly into his sleeve. Finally, it occurred to the fat man that Sirik might like something to eat. Wait here, the innkeeper said, shaking his head at his negligence. I'll fetch you something from what remains of the kitchen. He poured another ale and left the room. Farrell is a juicy morsel, the sword urged. Aye, he is, but you'll have to wait your turn, Sirik said. I can't wait any longer. I'll decide how long you can wait, the thief snapped. I'm fading. Sirik did not answer. He felt foolish for arguing with a sword. More importantly, he found her demanding tone offensive. But he also knew that the sword was being truthful. The color of her blade had faded to white. Without me, you wouldn't have recovered from Bahal's wounds the sword insisted. Do you want me to starve? I won't let you starve, Sirik said patiently, but I'll decide what I feed you. Farrell came shuffling back to the door, a large tray in his hand. Who are you talking to? he asked. You owe me Farrell, the sword hissed. The words were hot and urgent in Sirik's thoughts. I was talking to myself, the thief said. It's one of the hazards of riding alone. Farrell sat the tray on the counter. He had assembled the best his kitchen had to offer. Roast goose, stewed tomatoes, pickled beets, dried apples. Have a feast, he said. It'll just go to waste if you don't eat it. Then I'll eat until my horse can't carry me, Sirak replied, noting that Farrell had brought all the food he would need for some time to come. Could I have another mug of ale to wash it down? Of course, Farrell muttered, taking the mug and filling it. Have all you like, he smiled weakly. Rest assured, Sirak replied. He accepted the mug with one hand and drew his sword with the other. I will. The thief reached across the food and struck quickly. He plunged the blade into the fat man's chest while the innkeeper's lips were still twisted in a feeble smile. Farrell made one feeble grab for his crossbow. Then, his brow raised in puzzlement, and he collapsed behind the counter. So the blade would stay embedded in the man's breast, Sirik released the sword's hilt. The thief grabbed a piece of goose and took a large bite out of it. 
Then he leaned over the counter and looked at his sword. Speaking around a mouthful of cold meat, he said, Enjoy your meal. Chapter 14 The White Plain As she stepped through the disk, Midnight felt herself disappear from Canaglim, then reappear on the White Plain. Her mind felt as if she had not moved at all, as if it were an anchor and her body had pivoted around it. As soon as Midnight inhaled, caustic vapors burned her throat and nose. When she tried to focus her eyes, she saw nothing but white and might as well have been looking into the sun. The ground quivered beneath her feet like something alive and restless, and a million droning voices set the air buzzing with a murmur that made her skin tingle. Gradually, Midnight's vision returned. The World Walk's shimmering disk hung in the air next to her. It did not seem wise to leave a portal between the planes open, so the mage concentrated on closing it, and the gateway disappeared. A moment later she began to make sense of the weird information her senses were gathering. She stood on an endless, chalky plain in the midst of more people than she could count. Unlike the soul specters of Canaglim, these creatures possessed material, tangible bodies. Had she not known otherwise, the magic user would have thought the people on the plain were alive. To the mage's right was a huge crowd of several thousand. Everyone in the throng faced one direction, their attention fixed on the sky as though watching something midnight could not see. As she studied the mass of spirits, a murmur rose from its far side, racing toward her like a wave on a stormy ocean. Finally, it broke over her with such volume that she grimaced. Tear! the crowd called. Thousands of worshippers had simultaneously called the name of their lord. Midnight could easily imagine the cry crossing the interplanar void and reaching Tear's ears back in the realms. O oh, Tear! God of justice, balancer of the scales, answer this, the call of your faithful, the worshippers cried, their prayer clear and understandable, despite the number of mouths speaking the words. When will you deliver us, we who dedicated our lives to your glory, to spreading truth and justice into every corner of our planet, Toril? Hear the appeal of your worshippers, Tear. Look, here is Mishkal the Mighty, who brought King Lagost to justice, and here is Ornik the Wise, who judged between the cities of Ohan and Tulbeg, and here is Quarat of Prosker, who— The prayer droned on, proclaiming the loyalty of Tyr's worshippers, and listing the accomplishments of each one. Judging from the size of the mob, the litany would continue for days— the mage moved away from the crowd, searching for a hint as to Bone Castle's location. Often, she encountered huddled groups of people ranging from five or six to ten thousand. In one instance, Midnight encountered a dozen women flailing themselves and screaming devotion to Loviatar, Lady of Pain. Another time, she met a thousand worshippers of Ilmater standing shoulder to shoulder in resolute silence. Occasionally, she saw groups singing praises to gods so ancient their names had been forgotten in the realms. Several hours of wandering later, Midnight realized that she would never find her way around the realm of the dead without directions. Stopping a rotund man, she asked, Can you tell me how to find Bone Castle? His eyes opened wide in fear. No, no, I can't, he snapped. Why would I know where it is? And why would you want to? He abruptly turned and fled into the crowd. Midnight stopped three more people and asked them the same question. The reactions of all three were strikingly similar. Each claimed ignorance of the castle's location, and each told her in no uncertain terms that she was a fool for asking. The mage decided to stop inquiring about the castle. For some reason, her question disturbed the dead. To midnight's left, someone screamed in terror. The magic user spun toward the sound. Thirty feet away, a mound of flesh was attacking a woman. The crowd had cleared away from the struggle, so midnight had a clear view of the conflict. The woman appeared to have been about forty years of age, 
with hair as black as midnight's, save that it was streaked with gray. More interesting to the magic user was the woman's pendant, a blue-white star within a circle. Mistra's symbol. The woman's attacker was a hideous thing. Its head resembled that of a man, with a normal nose, mouth, and ears. But it also had dull fangs that drooled yellow bile and eyes that glowed as red as hot embers. The head sat atop a grotesque body thicker around than a hogshead cask, and long, gangling arms hung from its shoulders. Spongy masses of leathery hide bulged where muscles should have been, and old wounds oozed a foul green pus in a dozen places. The creature's legs were so pudgy they barely held its body off the ground. Still, the mound of flesh tottered after the woman with remarkable speed and grace. "'Come here, hag!' it growled. The beast's voice was so low and guttural that Midnight barely understood the words. In one hand the fat blob carried a rusty scimitar, and in the other a pair of manacles that it waved after the woman. Because she knew so little about the realm of the dead, the mage hesitated to involve herself, but that indecision didn't last for long. She could not allow an attack on one of Mistra's followers. "'Leave her alone!' Midnight yelled. Upon hearing the mage's words, the woman fled toward her. The thing stopped in its tracks, then frowned and shook its head as if it were unable to believe what it had heard. Finally it grumbled, "'She belongs to Lord Merkel!' As if the explanation were adequate, the beast ran after the woman and smashed the manacles into her head. Mistra's follower fell in a limp heap. "'Stop!' Midnight ordered, advancing toward the fight. "'Touch her and you die!' The thing paused to stare at the raven-haired woman. Finally it roared, Die? Touch her and I die? It broke into a cackle that sent waves rolling through its fat body. Then it kneeled and placed a shackle on the woman's wrist. A powerful imprisonment incantation appeared in Midnight's mind. The magic user hesitated for an instant, then felt the magical weave around her. It was strong and stable, not wavering and unpredictable as it had been in the realms. Midnight smiled and repeated the spell. The thing placed a shackle on the woman's other wrist. After completing the incantation, Midnight started toward the mound of flesh, saying, I warned you. The woman's attacker looked up and snarled, then stood to meet Midnight. You'll rot in. The magic user reached out to the foul creature and touched it, triggering the imprisonment magic. The mound of flesh stopped speaking in mid-sentence, then froze in place. An instant later, a dark sphere engulfed the fat monstrosity and carried it into the white ground. It would remain there in suspended animation until someone freed it. Midnight started to tremble, then sat down and closed her eyes. While confronting the ugly mound of flesh, the magic user had been angry and determined. Now that the fight was over, however, she felt surprisingly queasy and frightened. Although the magical weave had felt stable when she called upon it, Midnight could not help but shiver at what might have happened had her magic misfired. She tried to put thoughts of failure aside. The incantation had worked flawlessly, and the mage realized that she had no reason to believe that magic was unstable outside the realms. For several moments, Midnight remained sitting with her eyes closed. "'Do I know you?' asked a man's voice. The voice seemed vaguely familiar, though Midnight could not place it. She opened her eyes and, to her surprise, saw a hundred people staring at her, the woman Midnight had saved was nowhere in sight. She had vanished without thanking her savior. The man who had spoken stood directly ahead of Midnight, wearing a scarlet robe trimmed with gold. He was Raymond of Lathander. "'What are you doing here, Raymond?' Midnight asked, standing. The last time she had seen him was at the trial in Shadowdale. He had been very much alive. "'Then I do know you!' Raymond cried, delighted. I was right. However, the cleric didn't answer Midnight's question. In fact, he had died in the forest outside of Shadowdale, when an oak tree's limb became mobile and strangled him. He rarely cared to talk about the experience. 
Yes, you know me, Midnight confirmed. You testified against Adon and me at the trial for Elminster's murder. Raymond frowned. Elminster? But he's not dead, is he? No, Midnight said quickly. The trial was a mistake. Raymond frowned, wishing he could remember more about Midnight's trial, for his memories had begun to slowly slip away since he'd come to the plain in the realm of the dead. But the cleric did remember that Midnight had not been executed. I don't remember much about the trial, he admitted, but you escaped, so, as the faithful of Lathander say, a bright dawn makes the dark night worthwhile. I'm not sure I'd say that, Midnight replied, thinking of the people Sirik had murdered to gain her freedom. Raymond did not take note of Midnight's uneasiness. "'You were brave to rescue that woman,' he said, wagging a finger at her. "'But you were also foolish. You won't save her by stopping just one of them.' "'What was that thing?' Midnight asked, pointing at the spot where she had imprisoned the mobile mound of flesh. "'One of Mirkel's denizens,' Raymond explained. Midnight's heart jumped, and she suddenly felt very vulnerable." She noticed that the spectators were still staring at her. "'I wish they'd stop watching me like that,' Midnight noted uneasily, glaring back at the crowd. Raymond turned and addressed the gapers. "'Go on, there's nothing to see here.' When the crowd continued to stare, Raymond took Midnight by the elbow and guided her away. "'Don't mind them. They're curious about your eyes.' "'My eyes?' Midnight asked. "'Yes.' A moment ago your eyes were closed. The dead don't close their eyes, you know. Raymond stopped and studied Midnight for a moment. I suppose that means you're alive. And what if it does? Midnight asked, looking away and avoiding a direct answer to Raymond's question. Nothing. It's just unusual. The cleric guided her forward again. Most dead don't use magic. Not unless they're liches. By the way, which are you, undead or alive? Midnight sighed. I'm alive, Raymond, and I need your help. What do you want? he asked, leading the way around a group of old ladies, worshippers of Lyra, the goddess of joy, rolling on the ground, laughing. I need to find Bone Castle, Midnight replied. The fate of the whole world depends on my success. She did not say more. Until Raymond agreed to help, it seemed wise to reveal as little as possible. Bone Castle! Raymond exclaimed. That's in Miracle's city. Isn't this Miracle's realm? Midnight asked. Raymond shook his head. Not quite, but you can get there easily enough. Will you help me? What you say must be true, Raymond replied, or you'd never risk the kind of eternal suffering you'll find in Miracle's city. I'm sure that Lord Lathander would want me to do what I can. Thank you, Midnight said. Where do we go? Raymond pointed to his right. West. West? Midnight asked, searching the barren sky for something by which to tell her direction. How do you know that's west? Raymond smiled. I don't. But when you're dead, you acquire a certain sense for this place that I can't explain— You'll just have to trust me on this, and a hundred things like it. Considering the difficulties she had encountered so far, Midnight thought that seemed wise. Raymond led the way through the milling crowd, pausing or turning aside every now and then to make sure they did not cross paths with the denizen. After what must have been hours of walking, Midnight began to stumble. How much farther is it? she asked. A lot farther. Raymond answered, continuing forward steadily. "'We've got to find some way to get there faster,' Midnight gasped between panted breaths. "'I've got to meet Kelimvor in Waterdeep.' "'There is no faster way to travel,' Raymond noted calmly, "'unless you care to attract denizens. But don't worry. Time and distance are different here. Whether it takes you a day or a month to reach Bone Castle,' The time that passes on Toril will be only a fraction of the time that passes here. They continued walking for several more hours. Then the mage could go no farther. She collapsed and slept while Raymond watched over her. After a long time, Midnight woke refreshed and they continued their journey. 
The mage took the opportunity to have Raymond explain what he knew about Mirkel's realm. Adjusting his pace so that Midnight walked at his side, Raymond said, Mirkel has two domains, his city in Hades, which is where you are going, and which he rules absolutely, and the Fugue Plain, which is a demi-plain outside his city that he oversees as part of his duties. When somebody dies in the realms, his spirit is drawn to one of the thousands of gates between the realms and the Lord of the Dead's two domains. The spirits of Mirkel's faithful go directly to his city in Hades. Here Raymond stopped walking and interrupted his lecture. You might actually beat your friend Kelimvor to Waterdeep, you know. How? Midnight asked, also stopping. The idea of using the realm of the dead as a shortcut delighted her. The chances are good that there's a gate between Waterdeep and Mirkel's city, Raymond answered. If you can escape from the city at all, you can return to the realms via the gate to Waterdeep. Thanks for the suggestion, Midnight replied grimly, starting to walk again. Raymond resumed his pace and his lecture. Although Mirkel's faithful go directly to his city, everybody else comes to the Fugue Plain, which is really a waiting area for the spirits of the dead. Here, Mirkel's denizens, who were once his worshippers, I suppose, harvest the spirits of the faithless and the false. The faithless and the false? Midnight interrupted. The false are those who betray their gods, Raymond explained. The faithless don't worship any gods. What do the denizens do with the spirits? Midnight asked, thinking of Adon and his break with Sunni. Take them to Mirkel's city for an eternity of suffering, I'd imagine, Raymond noted calmly. I don't know, but I'm sure you'll find out soon enough. No doubt, Midnight replied darkly. After the denizens call out the spirits of the faithless and the false, the faithful wait here for their gods to take them to a final resting place in the plains. Then why is the fugue plain so crowded? Midnight asked, eyeing the milling masses. Raymond frowned. Because this is our final test, he said. With only one or two exceptions, the gods have chosen to leave us here to prove our worthiness. It seems callous to abandon loyal worshippers like that, Midnight observed. They haven't abandoned us, Raymond answered quickly. They'll come for us some day. Midnight accepted this answer, though it was obvious that Raymond's statement was founded on hope, not knowledge. For if the gods were concerned about their worshippers, the fugue plain would have been far less crowded. They continued their conversations and their trek for another two days— the mage learned little more of significant interest. Eventually, the crowds began to thin, and a dark line appeared on the horizon. Midnight had no doubt that they were getting close to Mirkel's city. Finally, the dead cleric and the mage reached a point beyond which there were no more milling souls. The dark line on the horizon had changed to a dark ribbon stretching from one side of the endless plain to another. Raymond stopped walking. I've brought you as far as I can, he said. Beyond here, I'm no use to you. Midnight sighed and tried to smile, though she felt lonely and abandoned. You've done more than enough already, she replied softly. Raymond pointed toward the left end of the ribbon. I understand the entrance to the city is down there, he said. I brought you here so you could approach the wall without meeting the denizens as they go to and from the gate. Midnight took Raymond's hand. Words cannot express my gratitude, she said. I'll miss your company. And I'll miss yours, he replied. After a small pause, he added some last-minute advice. Midnight, this is not the world of the living. What seems cruel and evil to you is the normal course here. No matter what you find in Miracle City, remember where you are. If you interfere with the denizens— You'll never leave. I'll remember your advice, she said. I promise. Good. May the gods favor your path, Raymond said. And may you keep your faith, Midnight responded. I will, he answered. I promise. With that, he turned and walked back toward the souls upon the fugue plain. Midnight turned toward Mirkel's city and started walking. 
Two hours later, an eerie moan reached her ears and musty whiffs of rot plagued her nose. The magic user continued at her best pace. The moan gradually became a suppressed wail, and the stench of decay grew stronger and hung more steadily in the air. The wall constantly grew higher and larger, and as midnight got close to it, she saw that its surface swayed and writhed, as if it were alive. The mage wondered if the wall was made of serpents. That would explain the absence of sentries. If the wall itself was menacing enough, Miracle would not need guards. Midnight continued forward, approaching within fifty feet of the wall. The suppressed wail changed into a cacophony of muffled sobs, the foul smell of decay grew so strong it nauseated her, and the magic user saw that she had been mistaken about the writhing forms in the wall. What she had taken to be serpents were thousands of squirming legs. The wall was constructed entirely of human bodies. Men and women were stacked fifty feet high, their bodies turned inward to face the interior of the city. The largest people gave the wall bulk and height, while the smaller ones chinked gaps and filled holes. They had all been sealed into place with a greenish mortar that reminded Midnight of solidified mold. The hideous barrier was nearly enough to end Midnight's journey. For a long time she could only stand and stare in sickened shock. The magic user had intended to climb over the wall, but could not bring herself to grapple the legs. Instead, deciding to make use of her magic, she summoned and performed the incantation for levitation. Immediately her feet left the ground and she rose into the air. Every now and then Midnight grasped a squirming leg and used it as a guide. A moment later she pulled herself into a prone position just inches over the top of the wall, hoping to look like just one more body. A squall of howls and screeches greeted her. The magic user recoiled and covered her ears. On the other side of the wall, the cries of the dead had been muffled by the space between the Fugue Plain and Miracle's city, but when Midnight had pulled herself onto the wall, she had crossed from the Demiplain into Hades. The air inside the wall smelled rank and profane, with a caustic bite that scorched her nose and throat when she breathed. The dark gray sky cast only a dim light over the city. Here and there, pinholes of illumination penetrated the murky heavens. From what Raymond had told her, Midnight suspected that the tiny lights were gateways between Miracle's domain and various spots in the realms. The city itself sat in a great bowl that sloped down from the wall toward the opposite horizon. The metropolis was so immense that, even from atop the wall, Midnight could only see that the far side disappeared into a haze of indistinguishable detail. Closer to midnight, a broad avenue circled inside the wall's perimeter. Twenty feet down the road, thirty whip-carrying denizens were driving several hundred slaves in midnight's direction. As the group passed beneath her, the magic user saw that the slaves had remarkably similar drab features, gray hair, yellow-gray skin, and expressionless gray eyes. But the people they carried had distinctive features. Here was a woman with buck teeth, there was a man with a large nose, and behind him was an obese woman with a triple chin. Although the mage wanted nothing more than to free the slaves, Raymond's warning against interfering with the denizens remained fresh in her mind. Midnight simply turned her head away. After the slave train passed, she turned to watch the city again. Inside the Perimeter Avenue stood a countless number of ten-story brownstone structures— these buildings had once been identical, but ages of decay and corrosion had twisted them into a plethora of different shapes. While some remained in pristine condition, many had deteriorated so badly they were little more than stacks of rocks that might collapse at any moment. Others had sprouted twisted minarets and crooked towers, and were now warped into shapes only vaguely reminiscent of their original form. As Midnight studied the buildings, she observed that structures of similar condition were grouped together. Then she noticed the city was divided into boroughs of more or less equivalent size. The areas with pristine buildings were divided into orderly blocks with straight, clean streets. Where the buildings were crumbling, the streets were so clogged with rubble that it appeared impossible to traverse them. 
In areas with twisted and grotesque buildings, the streets were crooked and narrow, curling and winding back on themselves with maze-like confusion. There was no sign of anything that might be Bone Castle, and Midnight did not know where to begin her search. But she knew she had to get off this wall. After waiting for another caravan of slaves to pass, Midnight pushed herself over the city and floated down to the road that ran along the wall. She paused a moment to reconnoiter the area. One group of three denizens was tottering down the avenue after her, and two more were approaching from the burrow directly ahead. Fortunately, both groups were over five hundred feet away, so she sprinted down the avenue away from them. After ten seconds of running, she ducked into a burrow of deteriorated buildings that had looked abandoned from the wall. The thoroughfares were cluttered with rubble and deserted. From the building's window sills, sputtering yellow lamps cast putrid circles of light into the street. As midnight passed one of the lamps, she inhaled a breath of the sulfurous vapor. She briefly choked, and her skin stung where a wisp of black smoke had touched it. The magic user ducked down an alley and clawed over a pile of rubble half as high as one of the buildings. Then she tumbled down the other side and ran into the alley that connected with another street. She turned left and ran halfway down it. Finally, confident the denizens would never find her, Midnight climbed over another pile of rubble and stopped in a blind cul-de-sac. She needed a guide. In a city of this size, it would be impossible to find Bone Castle without help. Even had she known the castle's location, the city was so alien it would be a simple matter to make a mistake and get killed. Midnight realized she would have to summon help. Immediately, the incantation for summoning monsters came to mind, along with all of the extraneous information about its creator and the theory behind its construction. It was not a monster she wanted, but after contemplating the original spell for a moment— Midnight saw how she could modify the incantation to suit her needs. The spell was designed to call an unspecified monster to aid the caster. Instead of a monster, however, Midnight needed to call a person, but had no idea who. By adjusting a few finger manipulations and altering the intonation of the spell's verbal components, the mage thought that she could call someone who both knew his way around Miracle City and would be willing to aid her. Midnight was a little frightened by what she was about to try. Normally, only the most advanced mages altered or created spells. But, considering the knowledge available to her and the stability of the magical weave in the plane, Midnight was confident of success. After reviewing her adjustments, the magic user performed the incantation. A moment later, someone began climbing over the rubble in the entrance to her cul-de-sac. Midnight waited anxiously, prepared to dash into a building if the visitor was not what she expected. A halfling climbed into view atop the rubble, then stopped and frowned at her. He had the same drab features, gray hair, yellow-gray skin, and expressionless gray eyes as the slaves Midnight had seen from atop the wall. In fact, the halfling was distinguishable from those slaves only in size. Atherton Cooper had no idea how he had come to be in this alley. Just a moment ago, he had been laboring to mortar a struggling woman into the wall. "'Sneak about?' Midnight asked, peering uncertainly at the short figure. The halfling's frown deepened. He recognized something in the woman's voice and in the name she had called him. Then he remembered. Sneak about was his name. "'Yes. That's right.' he observed. Who are— The answer came to him before he finished asking it. He had once been friends with the woman who now stood before him. Midnight! he exclaimed, sliding down the rubble. What are you doing here? The mage held her arms out to the halfling. Not what you think, she replied. I'm alive. Midnight's comment about being alive kindled a painful realization for Sneak About, and he stopped short of her arms. "'I'm dead,' he said, unpleasant memories flooding his mind. "'Why did you let Sirik kill me?' he demanded. Midnight didn't know what to say. She had not expected to meet Sneak About, and was not prepared to justify saving Sirik to someone the thief had murdered. 
I wouldn't make the same decision again, she said, dropping her arms. That's little consolation, Sneakabout hissed. Look at what you've done to me. He ran his hand down his body. I didn't let Sirik kill you, Midnight snapped. You threw yourself at his mercy. I had to, Sneakabout said, more memories washing over him. He looked away from Midnight's eyes. He had my sword. I had to get it back or go insane. Why? Midnight asked. So she would be at the halfling's eye level, she sat down. It's an evil, cursed thing, he explained, still not looking at the mage. If you lose it, you must recover it. The man I stole it from died trying to steal it from me, just like I died trying to take it from Sirik. Midnight suddenly understood why Sneakabout was in the City of the Dead. By pursuing the sword, by living only for it, he had betrayed his god. So you're one of the false, she gasped. Sneakabout finally turned to look her in the eye. Yes, I suppose I am. What does that mean? Midnight asked. What is your fate? The halfling shrugged, then casually looked away as if his fate was of little concern. I'm one of Miracle's slaves. I'll spend eternity mortaring the faithless into the wall. Midnight drew a sharp breath. What are you worried about? Sneakabout asked. He turned back with an irritated frown on his face. I thought you worshipped Mistra. Not that being faithful is much better than being faithless when you're down here. The fugue plane is overflowing with the abandoned souls of most of the gods faithful. I'm not worried about myself, the mage said. A few weeks after he killed you, Sirik killed Adon, and Adon died with no faith in the gods. Then it's the wall for him, Sneakabout said, shaking his head glumly. I'll probably be the one that mortars him in. Is there anything that you can— No, the halfling snapped, waving his hand to cut off Midnight's plea. He chose his fate when he was alive. It can't be changed now. If that's why you summoned me— It's not, Midnight said sadly, upset by the halfling's curt response. She wondered if he would be as unwilling to help her recover the tablet as he was to help Adon. Hoping to look more commanding, she stood. You must take me to Bone Castle. Sneakabout's eyes widened. You don't know what you're asking. When they catch us, they'll— He paused and considered his situation. The denizens could do nothing that was worse than what they were doing to him now. If you don't help me, Midnight said, taking the halfling by both shoulders, the realms will perish. What's that to me? Sneakabout replied, backing away. With luck, so will Miracle's city. Help me get the Tablet of Fate and return it to Waterdeep, Midnight said, following Sneakabout. I'll end your misery. He stopped backing away. How? I don't know yet, but I'll find a way. The halfling raised a skeptical eyebrow. Trust me, Midnight pleaded. What do you have to lose? Of course, Sneakabout had nothing to lose. If the denizens caught him helping Midnight, they would torture him for eternity. But they were already doing that. All right, I'll help, the halfling said. But realize that you've made a very important promise. If you don't keep it, you might be considered one of the false when you return. I know that, Midnight said. Let's go. Sneakabout turned and started over the rubble at the end of the cul-de-sac. For several hours, he led Midnight through a maze of twisting alleys and cluttered streets. Occasionally, they entered a region of straight, clean avenues. The halfling always crossed these places quickly, then led them back into a deteriorating or twisted burrow. Midnight was glad to have Sneakabout as a guide, Although vaguely aware that they were walking toward the low end of the city, she was completely lost. Even the halfling stopped now and then to ask directions of one of the false. He always confirmed his directions with two or three others. The false, he explained, are not to be trusted. They'll send you straight into a pack of denizens just out of habit. Finally, noticing that Midnight was stumbling with weariness, Sneakabout led her onto the roof of a decaying building. You need to rest, he said. We'll be safe up here. Thanks, Midnight replied, 
resting her head on her arms. As she looked up at the sky, the mage noticed pinholes of light that resembled stars. Noticing where Midnight was looking, Sneakabout said, Those are the gates to the realms. Are you sure? the raven-haired mage asked. From what Raymond had told her, she had concluded the same thing. But, since one of the dots would be her escape route, she saw no harm in being certain. What else would they be? the halfling asked. There are no stars in Miracle's city. If that's an exit, Midnight queried, rolling onto her side, what keeps the dead and the denizens from using it? Sneakabout shrugged. What prevents men from going to the real stars? They're too far, I suppose, and there are certain barriers. You'd better rest, and eat something if you have it. I'll rest, Midnight replied, realizing she hadn't eaten in what must be days. It did not matter. Even if she had possessed food, she could not have kept it down. The smell and the cries of the damned were simply too unsettling. A few hours later, she and the halfling resumed their march toward the low side of the city. Sneakabout led the way through mile after mile of cluttered avenues and twisting alleys. Finally, he stopped on a lopsided bridge spanning a river of black ooze. "'We're almost there,' he said. "'Are you ready?' Yes, Midnight replied. Despite her anxiety, she was telling the truth. Thanks to Sneakabout, she felt as fresh as could be expected after wandering Miracle's realm for the equivalent of almost a week. The pair continued down the street, then turned into an alley that snaked through one of the chaotic burrows. A few minutes later, an eerie moan began to drift up the narrow lanes. Sneakabout slowed his pace and moved cautiously forward. Midnight followed half a step behind. The alley turned sharply to the left. The stench of rot and decay grew so strong Midnight began gagging. She tapped Sneakabout's arm and they stopped so she could get used to the odor. Several minutes later they moved forward again. The alley joined a broad boulevard, and on the other side of the boulevard was another wall built from human bodies. Having seen one of the hideous barriers did not minimize the effect of this one. It still turned Midnight's stomach. Now it also enraged and depressed her because a dawn would share the fate of its hapless building blocks. This is Bone Castle, Sneakabout said. He pointed to a tall ivory-colored spire that poked its crown above the barricade. And that's the Keep Tower. Midnight could not believe what she saw. Behind the wall, just a hundred feet away, rose a spiraling tower built from human bones. The tower ended in a steeple. Atop the steeple, lit by six magical torches and in plain view of anybody who could see Bone Castle, was a stone tablet. The mage immediately recognized it as the twin to the one she had left with Kelimvor. Like a hunter displaying a prized trophy, Miracle had put his tablet where all his subjects could admire it. There it is, Midnight whispered. Sneakabout sighed. So I see. How are you going to get it? I'm not sure yet, the mage replied, studying the situation. This is too easy. It doesn't make sense to leave the tablet unguarded. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's not guarded, Sneakabout said. There are thousands of guards. How so? Midnight asked. If we can see the tablet, so can all the denizens, and dukes and princes within sight of Bone Castle. Dukes and princes? Midnight asked. Who do you think commands the denizens? Sneakabout replied. The dukes rule the burrows, the princes rule the dukes. Each is more vicious than its vassals. Midnight nodded. If Miracle's court was like most others, there would be no shortage of dukes and princes near Bone Castle. What else? The best way to guard a treasure is to lull the thief into thinking it's unguarded, then trap him when he tries to steal it. I'd expect a magical ward or two near the tablet. Midnight did not bother asking Sneakabout how he knew so much about theft. Though he had claimed to be a scout, and had proven that he was when he was alive, it was no secret that many halflings learned the basics of thievery to survive. Right now, Midnight was grateful that he had. She would never have been foolish enough to go after the tablet without looking for possible defenses, but it was good to have the halfling confirm her suspicions. Anything else? 
That's enough, Sneakabout said. A thousand guards and a trap or two will safeguard almost anything, unless you happen to have pretty potent magic at your disposal. Though she knew the halfling had added this last comment to bolster her confidence, Midnight was hardly encouraged. Let's hope it will be enough. She studied the tower for a moment, considering her plan of attack. We'll turn invisible. No good, Sneakabout interrupted. The denizens, especially the dukes, will see through that without a second glance. Midnight frowned, then thought of another plan. All right, then. We'll fly up there. I'll dispel the magical wards, then we'll take the tablet and be gone. Sneakabout considered this plan for a moment. How long will that take you? His use of the second person was deliberate. He knew he could not go with Midnight. Not long, Midnight said confidently. Probably too long, Sneakabout answered. They'll be after you in the time it takes you to fly up there, maybe less. Then what can I do? Midnight gasped. You'd better think of another plan, the halfling said. You can't keep your promise if they capture you. Midnight fell into a long silence and tried to think of another approach. Finally, she said, This will work. I'll prepare our escape route before touching the tablet. Then, instead of going to the tablet, I'll bring it to us. We'll be gone in an instant. That should work, Sneakabout replied. But I'll take my leave before you try it. Leave? Midnight asked. You aren't coming with me? Sneakabout shook his head. No. I'm dead. In the realms, I'd be undead and more miserable than I am here. Midnight took the halfling's hand. You'll never know what your help has meant to— And I don't care, Sneakabout interrupted tersely. He could not help resenting the fact that Midnight would be leaving and he would not. Just remember your promise. He pulled his hand away and walked up the alley. Midnight watched him go, confused and hurt by his sudden coldness. I'll remember, she said. Sneakabout turned a corner and was gone. Midnight looked after him for a moment, once again lonely and more than a little afraid. The mage silently vowed that, after returning the tablets of fate to Helm, she would find a way to help Sneakabout, and not only because of her promise. But the first thing she had to do was recover the tablet and get out of Miracle's city before she was killed. The magic user summoned Elminster's world walk to mind. Then, remembering what Raymond had said about finding her way back to Waterdeep, she began to pick the spell apart, to look at how Elminster had put it together. It required fifteen minutes of hard concentration for midnight to understand the intricacies of Elminster's construction. It took another fifteen minutes to alter the incantation so the other end of the portal would seek out the access well to Waterdeep. After finally finishing, Midnight was still unsure she would emerge near the City of Splendors. If she had known which one of the pinholes of light was the gate to Waterdeep, the alteration would have been much simpler. As it was, she would have to trust her fate to the fact that she had done her best. Satisfied with her preparations, Midnight performed the World Walk incantation. A tremendous surge of magical energy rushed through her body, tiring her. Still, it was nothing alarming, or even surprising, considering the power of the magic she was summoning. A shimmering disk of force appeared. Midnight found herself wishing that she could see what lay on the other side, but there was no time for idle contemplation. Next, she summoned the incantation for telekinesis, then performed it with the tablet as the target. An instant later, in response to her probe, the tablet slipped out of its supports and rose an inch into the air. Without wasting any more time, Midnight willed the tablet to come to her. It moved slowly at first, then began picking up speed, and was soon streaking in her direction. Though the mage could hear nothing above the cries of the faithless in the wall, Midnight imagined a wild chorus of surprised yells and outraged bellows spreading through the burrows around the castle. If anybody was looking toward the tablet, they could not fail to notice that Mirkel's trophy was being stolen. As if to confirm Midnight's suspicions, something rose into view from the other side of the wall. 
Huge, bat-like wings sprouted from its fat-feathered body. With its multifaceted eyes and protruding fangs, the creature's head looked like a cross between a vampire's and a fly's. The tablet arrived and Midnight caught it. Immediately, she felt magic so powerful she could detect it without a spell. Something was wrong, for the other tablet had no magical aura at all. The magic user suspected Mirkel had placed a ward or sigil directly on the artifact. But it hardly mattered at the moment. A dozen more denizens had risen behind the first, and a hundred more forms were approaching from the other side of the keep's bone-white tower. Midnight did not have time to pause for a close examination of the Tablet of Fate. She stepped into the disk and found herself running up a short corridor of light. The last time she had cast the World Walk spell, the mage had simply stepped through the disk and appeared on the fugue plane. There had been no tunnel. The mage began to fear she had spoiled Elminster's spell by tinkering with it. Then, thirty feet ahead, Midnight saw a wall of water covering the end of the corridor, as though she was running up the inside of a well. Remembering how she had altered the incantation so the portal would seek the access well to Waterdeep, the mage realized the world walk had worked exactly as specified. On the other side of the water lay Toril. Midnight ran the rest of the way up the tunnel and stopped next to the wall of water. She turned around and tried to close the portal. The shimmering disk remained in place, and the bat-winged denizen from Bone Castle entered the other end of the corridor. Midnight tried again to close the portal, and again she failed. The creature smiled, baring its wicked fans. It won't work, the creature hissed, its voice like the sound of metal scraping stone. Wherever the tablet goes, we go. Two more of the monster's fellows flew into the portal. How? Midnight gasped. It doesn't matter, the bat-winged creature said. Give the tablet back. Then Midnight understood. The magic she detected on the tablet was one of Mirkel's fiendish traps. He had made it impossible for anyone stealing it to escape his guards. The Lord of the Dead could have used variations on Hold Portal, Dispel Magic, Gate, Passwall, and a number of other spells to make the tablet a homing beacon for his minions. Exactly how he had done it was unimportant, though. What did matter was that when Midnight took the tablet to Waterdeep, she would unleash Mirkel's hordes. The tablet would hold the gate open for the denizens and draw them through. She couldn't let that happen any more than she could return the tablet to the Lord of the Dead's vassals. Midnight realized she had to block the corridor, and the perfect incantation for doing so came to her. It was a prismatic sphere, a globe of scintillating colors that the denizens would never penetrate. While they clawed and scratched at its exterior, she would be tucked safely inside. Last chance, woman, the bat-winged denizen said, starting up the corridor. There's no escape. That's what you think, Midnight replied. She performed the incantation. An instant later, a shimmering sphere encased her, at the same time blocking access to Waterdeep. Midnight's body felt like it was on fire, and her head hurt so badly she could barely think. Within the space of a few minutes, the mage had cast two of the most powerful spells known to mages anywhere. The effort had taken its toll on her body. It didn't really matter, however. The mage was safe as long as the prismatic sphere held out. And in Midnight's case, that could be a long time. Chapter 15 City of Splendors After breaking free of the ice and spending a long night next to a small fire, Kelimvor had left the high moor and walked to the caravan road on his frozen feet. At the roadside, he had stopped and built a roaring fire, then sat down to wait for the blaze to attract help. While his feet thawed, Kelimvor had puzzled over what to do. Midnight had fallen into the underground stream, and he had no idea what had become of her after that. But it had seemed that the mage's chances of survival were as great as his own, especially if she had called on her magic. Therefore, the fighter had decided to assume she was alive. Still, Kelimvor had had no idea what Midnight might do. 
she might have tried to recover the tablet from the zombies if she even knew that it had been lost. If not, the mage would have tried to go to the realm of the dead to recover the other tablet. There had also been the possibility that Midnight thought he was dead, in which case Kelimvor had not the faintest idea what she would do. The warrior had quickly realized he could not predict Midnight's actions. The only thing he knew for sure was that she would eventually go to Waterdeep. After reaching that conclusion, the fighter had considered trying to recover the tablet from the zombies. But alone, without a weapon and disabled by frostbite, there would have been no chance of success. Besides, given the way the undead had pursued the tablet, Kelimvor had suspected the zombies were no longer at Dragonspear Castle. They had probably already fled toward their master, and the warrior had not had the vaguest idea where he might be hiding. In the end, he had decided to go to Waterdeep. There, he would wait for midnight. If she did not show up, he would recruit help and start out in search of the tablet and his lover. Fortunately, the fighter had finished his plans before his feet thawed. When sensation had returned, it had been impossible for the fighter to think of anything but pain. He had felt as though he'd stepped into a vat of boiling water, and the torment had continued unabated for twenty-four hours. A company of ten fast-moving riders had come by in the middle of the warrior's agony. They had loaned Kelimvor a spare horse and invited him to accompany them to Waterdeep. A day and a half later, they had come across the remains of the Roosting Griffin Inn. For no apparent reason, the inhabitants had been slaughtered. The company had puzzled over this until a rider found the proprietor's bloodless body. Immediately, the merchants had attributed the carnage to a vampire. But Kelimvor had voiced a suspicion that the attackers were the same zombies that had fallen upon his company at Dragonspear Castle. Seven days later, camped half a mile off the road, the merchants had discovered the fighter was correct. In the middle of the night, a dozen zombies had wandered into camp, slaying the sentry and half the company before they realized what was happening. Kelimvor, recognizing the zombies' striped robes, had grabbed a sword and tried to organize a defense. But the merchants had panicked, and those who did not perish had fled into the night. The warrior, still limping from frostbite, had made his way to a horse and escaped. That had been three days ago. Since then, he had been playing an exhausting game of cat and mouse with the zombies. The undead were traveling toward Waterdeep, but were avoiding the road in a clumsy attempt at secrecy. Every now and then, Kelimvor rode close to them to make sure they were still moving to the northwest. The zombies kept tabs on him with scouts, and had tried to ambush him several times. The extent of their success was that the fighter had not slept since the attack on the merchants. Kelimvor's lack of sleep had taken its toll. As his horse cantered along the road, he had to concentrate on the countryside to stay awake. To the right, a vast, snow-covered plain extended as far as the eye could see. Somewhere out there, Kelimvor knew, were the zombies. To his left lay a brown ribbon of sand that could only be the Sword Coast. Beyond the coast, a glistening, azure plain of water stretched to the far horizon, the Sea of Swords. The road topped a small hill, and the horse stopped of its own accord, then snorted and stomped its foreleg. Kelimvor leaned down to pat its neck, then noticed his mount had smashed some scaled thing. The fighter's first thought was that the scales belonged to a snake, but then he saw fins and gills. It was a fish. Kelimvor looked down the road. On the other side of the hill, thousands of wriggling, flopping forms, all crawling inland, covered the plain. It was as if the sea had suddenly become undesirable and the fish were moving inland in pursuit of better water. Though he found the sight disconcerting, the warrior was not frightened. Like almost everyone in the realms, Kelimvor had become accustomed to such strange sights. Besides, from the top of the hill he could see water deep. The road ran for only one more mile, ending at a fortified gate that sat, almost, on the beach of the Sword Coast. To the gates south lay the Sea of Swords, dotted here and there with the sails of great cargo ships. To the north a small escarpment, no more than a few feet high, rose from the white prairie. 
As the slope continued east, it grew both steeper and higher until it could properly be considered a cliff over much of its length. Atop this cliff ran a high city wall, dotted at regular intervals by sturdy towers. It was broken only in the center of the escarpment, where the cliff was so tall and steep that no man could possibly scale it. Behind the wall, a hundred stalwart towers proudly held their turrets just high enough to be visible from outside the city. The fighter had no doubt that, at long last, he was looking upon the city of splendors. Beyond Waterdeep, a small mountain lifted its crown seven hundred feet above the plains, watching over the city bearing its name. At the top of Mount Waterdeep stood a lone tower, around which flocked birds of enormous size. Even from this distance, Kelimvor could see their bodies and the shape of their wings. The fighter urged his horse forward. It moved reluctantly, picking its way through the fish migration as though walking down a muddy street and not wanting to soil its hooves. As he neared the gate, Kelimvor saw that the huge birds over Waterdeep were not birds at all. While they had the wings and heads of great eagles, their bodies and feet were those of lions. They were griffins, and upon their backs they carried men. The fighter could not help but imagine how much easier his journey would have been if his company had possessed such mounts. In his weariness, Kelimvor was so absorbed by the griffins that, when his horse suddenly stopped, he almost did not realize he had reached the gate. Two men-at-arms stood in front of him, both wearing black scale mail embossed with an upturned gold crescent moon surrounded by nine silver stars. Behind them stood another man, this one wearing a mixture of green leather and black chain mail, with only the gold crescent moon for a device. Over a dozen similarly dressed men stood in the gate, attending to other travelers. "'Halt and state your name and your business,' said the first guard. He avoided stepping too close to the grimy warrior. Though accustomed to unbathed travelers, this one appeared more sullied than normal. Kelimvor Lionsbane, the fighter sighed. He knew he smelled bad. Being cold, hungry, dirty, and exhausted, he suspected he looked even worse. And what's your business? Kelimvor began to chuckle. The only response that came to mind was that he had come to save the world. He wondered if the guards would believe him. The other guard stepped forward, irritated by what he perceived as disrespect. What's so funny? Kelimvor bit his lip, trying not to laugh. The euphoria of exhaustion had settled over him, and he found it difficult to control his mirth. Nothing. I'm sorry. There are these zombies that I was following. The two guards snickered, but the man wearing green armor stepped forward. Zombies? he asked. His employer had told him there might be trouble with zombies in the weeks to come. They attacked us and killed one of my friends, Kelimvor responded. Your name again? the guard asked. Kelimvor Lionsbane. The fighter realized he sounded incoherent, if not completely insane. The guard's eyes widened. This was one of the people for whom he was waiting. Where are the other two, Midnight and Adon of Sunni? I told you, Kelimvor yelled, suddenly angry at having to repeat himself. Though he knew his moods were a result of his fatigue, he could not control them. Zombies attacked us. Adon's dead and Midnight's gone. She'll be here somewhere. I've got to find her. Relax. You're safe now, the guard said, realizing his employer would be more adept at handling the traveler's incoherence. I'm Ilorl. We've been expecting you. You have? Kelimvor asked. His mind abruptly shifted gears. There are zombies out there. You've got to find them. We will, Ilorl murmured. The zombies won't hurt you in here. Now come with me. There's somebody who wants to see you. The guard took the reins to Kelimvor's horse and led the way through the gate. After passing through a vacant plaza of snow-covered grass, Ilarl led the fighter to another wall. He said a few words to the guards here, and then took Kelimvor into the city proper. Though the warrior had seen many cities in his time, Waterdeep's size and magnificence stunned him. The streets bustled with carts and pedestrians, all intent on some task that must have seemed important to them. The briny odor of the harbor drifted over the rooftops on the left, 
where sturdy warehouses were interspersed with shabby tenements. To the right, a thicket of inns and stables stood shoulder to shoulder, packed so close Kellumvor did not see how caravans reached the ones deeper in the ward. As they passed farther into the city, merchant shops and fine inns lined the streets. Then they entered a residential neighborhood, where grand houses and even a villa or two stood along winding avenues. Finally, Ilarl stopped before a large tower. "'Whom may I say is calling?' The voice came from the base of the tower, though Kelimvor saw no window or door there. "'Ilarl of the Watch, with Kelimvor Lionsbane!' A door suddenly appeared where none had been before, and a tall, black-haired man stepped out of the tower. "'Well met, Kelimvor. I am Blackstaff Aronson, friend and ally of Elminster.' Where are your companions? Ilarl interceded on Kelimvor's behalf. He's in bad shape, my lord. Blackstaff nodded in understanding and retreated into the tower. Bring him in. Ilarl helped Kelimvor dismount and took him into a small sitting room. A moment later, Blackstaff led another man into the room. Though ancient, the second man looked every bit as robust as Blackstaff. A full head of hair and a beard as heavy as a lion's mane framed his sharp-featured face. Elminster, Kelimvor growled. In his exhausted state, the fighter had no trouble blaming the ancient sage for the hardships he and his friends had endured. It was apparent to the warrior that Elminster had reached Waterdeep well ahead of him and with a lot less trouble. I ought to slit you gizzard to gullet, Kelimvor snarled. I lack the gizzard, Elminster replied, not intimidated. Now tell me what has become of thy friends. Kelimvor related the events that had occurred at Dragonspear Castle, making the necessary digressions to explain about Bahal and Siric. When he finished, both Blackstaff and Elminster sat in dumbfounded silence, pondering the effect of the fighter's report upon their plans. Finally, Elminster groaned in frustration. He had not counted on midnight finding her own entrance into Miracle's realm. If she went after the second tablet alone, the realms may be in serious trouble. Kelminster was heartened by Elminster's unspoken assumption that midnight had survived the underground stream. But he was far from encouraged by the sage's concern about midnight going after the second tablet alone. Blackstaff stood, already formulating a plan to control the damage. Ilarl, fetch Gower and meet us at the Yawning Portal Inn. Then gather a patrol to look for the zombies who attacked Kelimvor. We'll need to recover that tablet right away. Elminster also stood. The pool of loss, my friend? Blackstaff nodded. Gower will show us the way. The two mages did not say any more. They both knew what had to be done. Located deep under Mount Waterdeep, the Pool of Loss was the closest access well to Miracle's realm. They were going into Hades to retrieve Midnight and the Tablet, if that were still possible. Elminster and Blackstaff quickly turned to leave without any further explanation. Kelimvor wondered if they had forgotten he was in the room. "'Wait for me!' he demanded. Blackstaff regarded the fighter with equal parts of aggravation and forbearance. This is beyond you, friend. You've done well to get this far. I'm coming, Kelimvor replied, irritated at being patronized. You're barely coherent, Blackstaff objected. I'll follow you anyway, the warrior threatened. Blackstaff looked to Elminster, who studied Kelimvor with cool scrutiny. He might prove useful, the stage said at last. Give him a restorative. Blackstaff lifted his hand, and a vial of murky green fluid appeared. He gave the potion to Kelimvor, then noted, This will numb your fatigue. For a while. Though curious about the vial's contents, Kelimvor did not ask. The wizards were obviously not in a cooperative mood, and he thought it wiser to save his questions for more important things. The fighter drank the potion down. As Blackstaff had promised, he immediately felt refreshed. Without paying Kelimvor any more attention, the two mages walked south through a maze of twisting alleys and streets, stopping only when they reached a sizable inn. The sign over the door read, The Yawning Portal. 
Blackstaff and Elminster entered and, oblivious to the attention of the patrons, went directly into the office. Kellamvor followed, taking a seat at the office's single table. Without being asked, a serving wench brought them each a mug of ale, then left and closed the door. The owner of the yawning portal was a retired, prudent warrior named Durnan the Wanderer. Unknown to his patrons, Kellamvor, and anybody in the room except Blackstaff and Elminster, Durnan was one of the mysterious Lords of Waterdeep, the secret democratic council that governed the city. As with Durnan himself, there was more to the name of his inn than met the eye. Yawning Portal was a tongue-in-cheek reference to the tendency of those who indulged in the tavern's fare to tell tall tales, but the name also referred to a deep shaft resembling an indoor well which led into the caverns beneath Mount Waterdeep. That shaft was why Blackstaff had brought his guests here, despite Kellamvor's assumption that this was just where they would meet Gower, whoever Gower was. Blackstaff and Elminster sat without speaking, so Kellamvor did not break their silence. Their bearing awed him, but he also thought they were being impolite to a man who had crossed the realms at their behest. It did not matter, though. They represented his only chance of rejoining Midnight, and he would gladly endure their rudeness to see her again. Ten minutes later, a stocky, broad-shouldered man entered the office. Ilarl and a ruby-nosed dwarf followed him. Not bothering with introductions, Blackstaff addressed the dwarf. Gower, you're going to guide us to the pool of loss. The dwarf sighed. It'll cost you. Thy price? inquired Elminster suspiciously, well accustomed to the dwarven tendency to overvalue service. Fifteen, no, make it twenty mugs of ale, Gower responded, deciding he might as well try for a large fee. Done. Blackstaff answered, knowing Durnan would cover the fee without mention of repayment. But only after we return. We need you sober. Seven now. One before we leave, and that's final, Blackstaff grumbled. He turned to the broad-shouldered man. Durnan, may we use your well? Durnan nodded. Would you like some company into the pool? Elminster, who knew of Durnan's prowess, turned to Blackstaff. If he's as good with the sword as he claims. Durnan snorted at Elminster's coyness. I'll fetch my blade and Gower's mug. Blackstaff led the way into the next room, which contained an indoor well. Durnan met them there with Gower's ale, a glittering sword, a coil of rope, and a half dozen torches. After giving torches to everyone and lighting his own from the lamp on the wall, Durnan stuck a foot into the well's bucket. Let me down slowly, Ilarl. I haven't been in here for some time. Ilarl lowered Durnan into the well. Blackstaff followed, then Elminster and Gower. Finally, Kellamvor put a foot into the bucket and grabbed the rope. Lower away, the fighter said. Ilarl began cranking, and Kellamvor descended into the dark shaft for several minutes. Ten feet above the bottom of the well, Blackstaff reached out of a side tunnel and pulled the fighter toward him. Kellamvor stepped out, then Blackstaff turned to the dwarf and said, Lead on, Gower. Not even bothering with a torch, Gower started down the tunnel. Durnan followed next, then the two mages, and Kellamvor brought up the rear. They descended into a labyrinth of half-collapsed dwarven tunnels and natural passages. On occasion, the company was forced to wade through steaming water, sometimes so deep Durnan had to carry Gower to keep the dwarf's head dry. Finally, they reached a slick passage that dropped into the darkness at an uncomfortable angle. Kellamvor was sure that if someone fell onto it, he would slide all the way to the bottom. Thinking the same thing, Durnan said, I'll tie off the rope and we can use it to descend. Nonsense, Gower said, sitting down at the edge of the steep passage. We don't need a rope for this. With that, he pushed himself forward and slid into the darkness. Durnan, Elminster, and Blackstaff gave each other challenging glances, but hesitated to follow. Finally, Elminster put his hand on a boulder and said, Ye could secure the rope to this. Durnan tied the rope off, then the company followed Gower into the steep passage. The dwarf waited at the bottom, a condescending smirk on his face. 
The corridor had emerged in a cathedral-like room so large the torches did not light the ceiling or the far side. The glowing white specters of hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people, were drifting aimlessly about the cavern. The pool of loss is over there, Gower said, pointing toward the middle of the room. But there's something strange going on. What are those? Kellamvor asked, nodding at the strange silhouettes. Elminster did not bother to answer. His attention was fixed on the shimmering dome of scintillating lights that Gower had pointed to. Blackstaff looked at Elminster. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yes, Elminster said, returning Blackstaff's gaze. They both looked back to the dome. What? What are you thinking? Kellamvor demanded, poking his head between the two wizards. As usual, the mages did not answer but they both suspected that the shimmering globe was a prismatic sphere, one of the most powerful defensive spells a magic user could cast. They were trying to figure out what it was doing down here. An instant later, again without saying anything, they started toward the dome. Durnan, Gower, and Kelimvor followed, though Durnan and Gower were much less apprehensive than Kelimvor. They had worked with Blackstaff before, and were confident that if it was important for them to know something— he would tell them. When the company reached the dome, they saw that it sat within a small stone-walled pool. It appeared to be a sphere with the bottom half hidden from view. The fit was so precise that there was not the slightest gap between the stone wall and the shimmering globe. The sphere continually flashed in a pattern of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, as though it were a striped ball spinning on its axis. The mages circled the well for several more minutes, inspecting the dome first closely, then from farther away. Finally, Blackstaff asked, What do you make of it? Elminster frowned and turned to Kelimvor. Could this be midnight's work? The fighter shrugged. He had no idea what the globe was, or whether midnight could have created it or not. All I can tell you is that she was growing more powerful all the time. She once— he searched for the word the mage had used to describe plucking them from one place and depositing them in another. She once teleported four of us halfway from Boriskir Bridge to Dragonspear Castle. Elminster's eyes widened. She did. Then she could have cast this, Blackstaff concluded. Inside the sphere, Midnight had been resting for hours. The magic user was recovering from performing the world walk and prismatic sphere incantations in quick succession. She was completely unaware that help had arrived. The deafening screams and howls of a thousand enraged denizens were drowning out the voices of Elminster and company. Fortunately, noise was the only thing that had entered the globe. Several denizens had flung themselves against the sphere or tried to assail it with spells. Each time, Midnight had heard a cry of pain or anger as the sphere directed an attack back at its originator. As long as the sphere remained up, both Midnight and the realms were safe from the denizens, but the spell would expire soon, and the mage feared it would take most of the strength she had recovered to recast it. While this would keep her safe and the denizens out of the realms for a little while longer, it was only a short-term solution. And Midnight did not dare leave the sphere until she countered Miracle's trap. Until then, the tablet had to stay inside the sphere. Otherwise, she could be creating a passageway for the denizens between Miracle's realm and wherever she went. Then, with a start, the mage realized she could use a permanency incantation to indefinitely prolong the prismatic sphere. The gestures and words came to mind easily. It would be as wearing as renewing the sphere, but at least it only had to be done once. With a sigh, Midnight performed the incantation. The effort drained her, but not completely. Within eight hours or so, she would have the strength to overcome the magic Miracle had placed on the tablet. Back outside the sphere, Kelimvor and the other four rescuers were still puzzled. These things don't last forever, Blackstaff was saying. And if Midnight cast it, she's probably around here somewhere. Yes, undoubtedly inside, Elminster said. That's what prismatic spheres are designed for. She's inside that thing? Kelimvor exclaimed. He started toward it, but Durnan quickly restrained him. 
No, my friend, Dernan said. If you touch it, you won't be fit to feed to the dogs. Then how do we get her out? Kellamvor cried. Perhaps we don't want to, Elminster sighed, running a hand through his beard. The mage who casts a prismatic sphere can enter or leave at will. If midnight is inside, there's a reason. Then what do we do? Kellamvor demanded. We let her know we're here, Blackstaff said. When I count to three, let's all shout her name. Their shout might have worked, if not for the cacophony of Denizen's screams on the side of the sphere facing Miracle's city. As it was, however, their voices were lost in the maelstrom of noise, and Midnight never knew her name had been called. Next, the company tried throwing things into the sphere, bits of clothes, stones, rings. Nothing got through. More often than not, the sphere hurled the items back at whoever had thrown them. Blackstaff even tried to penetrate the globe with a telepathy spell, but it either misfired or the sphere repelled it. The bearded mage was stunned into dumbfounded shock for twenty minutes. Kellamvor found Blackstaff's silence a welcome respite from the wizard's condescending manner. "'Well, Elminster, what do we do now?' Kellamvor asked, crossing his arms over his chest. "'We wait,' Elminster replied. "'The thing will fall after an hour or two. So they sat down to wait. Eventually, a few soul specters drifted over and idly gossiped with Elminster and Blackstaff, but Kellamvor, Dernan, and Gower superstitiously avoided speaking with the dead. Several times, one of the silhouettes found itself unable to resist the call of the pool and tried to enter, despite the sphere. In each instance, it was repelled or disappeared in a white flash. Four hours later, Blackstaff stood. This is ridiculous. Nobody can keep a prismatic sphere up this long. Apparently midnight can, Elminster observed. I'm going to dismantle it, Blackstaff declared. That might not be wise, the elder mage replied. Even if ye cast all the spells without a misfire, we dare not risk eliminating the sphere without knowledge of why she cast it. You can dismantle the sphere? Kellamvor asked. He stood and rushed to Blackstaff's side. Yes, Elminster explained. It's a most complicated and tedious procedure. Tell me about it, Kellamvor demanded. Like Blackstaff, he was tired of waiting. Very well, Elminster sighed. It appears we have nothing better to do at the moment. A prismatic sphere is in reality seven magical spheres, each providing a defense against different attacks. To dismantle one, Blackstaff interrupted, you must cast a cone of cold to destroy the red sphere, which defends against mundane missiles like arrows, spears, and rocks with messages on them, Kellamvor finished. Precisely, Blackstaff said. Next, you must use a gust of wind to— We don't need to dismantle the whole sphere, Kellamvor exclaimed. Blackstaff frowned, irritated by the interruption. Kellamvor ignored the mage, then continued, All you have to do is negate the first sphere. Then we can throw something inside to get Midnight's attention. Elminster looked doubtful. I don't like— What other choice do we have? Dernan said, expressing an opinion for the first time. We can't stay down here forever. I have a business to run. Very well, Elminster sighed, reaching into his robe and pulling out one of his distinctive Meerschaum pipes. He gave it to Kellamvor. She should recognize this. Try not to break it. If ye will do the honors, Blackstaff? With pleasure, the mage replied. Inside the sphere, Midnight had just identified the nature of Miracle's trap. He had combined powerful variations of locate object and hold portal spells to ensure that his denizens could always follow wherever the tablet was taken. In effect, the locate object spell served as a beacon marking the tablet's location, and the hold portal spell prevented the thief from closing his escape route. Fortunately, Midnight's prismatic sphere had not closed her escape route, it had merely blocked it. She could leave and the denizens could not follow. Because she had used an incantation to make the sphere permanent, it would never fall. 
In effect, the door between Miracle's city and the realms remained permanently open, but the hallway had been filled with an impassable obstruction. As Midnight contemplated her discovery, something flew into the globe and landed in her lap. She jumped to her feet and nearly stepped out into the waiting hands of Miracle's denizens. Then the raven-haired mage picked up the object and discovered that it was a clay pipe, a distinctive, familiar clay pipe. Outside the sphere, everyone was breathing a little easier because Blackstaff's spell had not misfired. Also, Kelimvor had tossed Elminster's pipe into the sphere without it rebounding. "'What if she doesn't recognize your pipe?' Kelimvor asked. At that moment, Midnight stepped out of the sphere, the tablet in one hand and Elminster's pipe in the other. "'Does this belong to one of you?' she asked. "'Midnight!' Kelimvor whooped. They rushed into each other's arms and embraced, but not before Elminster snatched his pipe back. For a long, uncomfortable minute, Blackstaff, Elminster, Dernan, and Gower waited while the reunited lovers kissed and hugged each other. Finally, when it became apparent the pair was oblivious to the presence of others, Elminster cleared his throat. "'Perhaps we should attend to the business at hand,' he suggested. Midnight and Kelimvor reluctantly separated. Addressing Midnight and pointing at the sphere, Elminster said, "'Perhaps ye would care to explain why ye've been hiding inside that thing for the better part of a day?' "'Not here,' Gower insisted. "'I'm thirsty, and you owe me nineteen mugs of ale.' "'One moment, Gower,' Blackstaff said impatiently. "'Is it safe to leave?' Midnight nodded. "'Oh, yes,' she replied. We can leave now. The sphere is permanent. Both Elminster and Blackstaff raised an eyebrow. There, you see? the dwarf said. Let's go. With that, Gower started toward the exit. Realizing they could not find their own way back to Dernan's tavern, the others reluctantly followed, barraging midnight with questions as they walked. Chapter 16 Miracle no, Kelimvor hissed. He took the tablet off the floor and put it on the table. Here's your tablet. Take it and get the other one yourself. This discussion does not concern you, Kelimvor, Blackstaff retorted. He was not accustomed to being addressed so sharply, especially by mercenary warriors. That's right, not any more, and it doesn't concern Midnight either. Blackstaff scowled and started to suggest Kelimvor was a coward, but Elminster stepped between the two men. Frowning at Blackstaff, the sage said, Calm down. We can discuss this like gentlemen, can we not? Blackstaff's scowl changed to an embarrassed grimace. Elminster's comment was directed primarily at him, and he knew his friend was right. The young wizard should have enough self-control so that a stubborn warrior did not irritate him. Forgive me, he muttered. The stress is telling, I'm afraid. Kelimvor also relaxed, but did not apologize. They were in Dernan's office in the yawning portal. Midnight lay on the couch where she had collapsed into a deep sleep. Her black hair was as coarse and as stiff as a horse's tail. Her complexion had faded to the color of ash, and her red-rimmed eyes were sunk deep into their sockets. The realm of the dead had taken its toll on her. Kelimvor could not bear to see her join another battle, which was what Elminster and Blackstaff proposed. She braved Miracle's city, the fighter said. Hasn't she done her part? Others have also sacrificed, Blackstaff retorted. Ilarl was a fine man. Kelimvor did not know how to respond. When he and his five companions had returned to Dernan's tavern, a member of the city watch had been waiting with bad news. After lowering Midnight's rescue party into the well, Ilarl had taken a group of men to find the undead Kelimvor had described. The patrol had tracked the walking corpses into the foul-smelling tunnels that carried away Waterdeep's offal and refuse. The undead had ambushed the patrol two hours later. Ilarl and his company had been winning the battle until an evil-looking human appeared and used magical poison to aid the zombies. Only one guard had survived, and only because he had remained unobserved. 
The watch commander knew of Blackstaff's interest in the zombies and had elected to send no more men into the tunnels until he spoke with the wizard. Connecting what Midnight had learned from Bahal with some of his own research, Elminster had suggested that the man who had aided the zombies was Mirkel. Now, the ancient sage and Blackstaff wanted to use Midnight and the tablet to bait a trap for the Lord of the Dead. Kelimvor thought his lover had done enough. More importantly, he doubted she had the strength to face Mirkel. She's too weak, he said, kneeling at her side. Weak as she is, Elminster replied patiently, pointing a gnarled finger at the female mage. She wields more power than Blackstaff and I together. No, Kelimvor said, standing. The decision is hers, Durnan said. He sat slumped in a chair behind his desk, a mug of ale in his hand. In Waterdeep, no man speaks for a woman unless she asks him to. You'll take her over my dead body. Kelimvor snapped, putting himself between Midnight and the others, or not at all. Midnight opened her eyes and reached for the fighter's hand. Kel, they're right. I must go on. But look at you, the warrior protested, kneeling at her side. You're exhausted. I'll be fine after I rest. You can hardly stand, Kelimvor said, running his hand over her dry hair. How can you fight Miracle? Elminster laid a wrinkled hand on Kelimvor's shoulder. Because she must, or the whole world might perish. Kelimvor dropped his head and stared at the floor. Finally he looked at Elminster and said, Can you explain this to me? Why must Midnight draw Miracle out? Why do we need the other tablet? Blackstaff snapped, Elminster doesn't need to explain himself to the likes of— the ancient sage raised a hand to silence the bearded wizard. He has a right to know, Elminster said. While ye and thy friends have labored to retrieve the tablets, this is what I have learned. The sage motioned at the air above the table. Out of the mists at the beginning of time there came a will who called itself Ao. Ao wished to create an order. Elminster flicked his fingers and a golden scale hung in the air. He balanced the forces of chaos and order, spending the first eons of his life cataloging and setting them into opposition. Dozens of lumps of coal appeared and settled onto the scale's dishes. By the time he completed his task, the universe had grown too vast and intricate for even Ao to watch over. The scale wobbled and spilled the coal. So Ao created the gods. The chunks of coal compressed into glittering diamonds, each with the symbol of a god etched upon it. To preserve the order, he assigned each god certain duties and powers. The diamonds returned to the dishes, and the scales again hung balanced. Unfortunately, so he would not need to watch over them constantly, Ao created the gods with free wills. But with free will came ambition and greed, and the gods were soon struggling to increase their power at each other's expense. The diamonds started moving from one dish to another, again unbalancing the scales. Ao could not stop the struggle without eliminating the gods' free will, so he began to oversee the transfer of powers and duties. In an even stream, the diamonds began moving from one dish to another the scales steadied, and he created the tablets of fate to reflect the powers and duties of each god. Now the gods could exercise their ambition, yet the tablets would allow Ao to be sure the balance was always maintained. But Mirkel and Bane were more concerned with their own aspirations than the balance. Two dark-colored diamonds left the dishes and circled the scales in crazy, erratic patterns. So they took the tablets and hid them away, intending to steal as much power as possible during the confusion that followed. All the diamonds bounced out of the dishes and whirled about the room. The scales spun and jerked wildly, until at last they overturned and crashed to the table. In anger, Ao cast all the gods from the plains, sparing only Helm. To the god of guardians, Ao assigned the task of keeping the other gods out of the plains. 
Without the gods to exercise their powers and perform their duties, the realms began slipping into chaos. The diamonds rained down on the table. Unless we recover the tablets and return them, Elminster concluded, the realms will perish. A bright flash filled the room, then the scales and the diamonds disappeared in wisps of smoke. Kelimvor could not argue with Elminster's conclusion. Somebody had to return the tablets, but he still did not see why it had to be midnight. Before the fighter could voice his thoughts, though, Durnan set his mug aside and spoke. It seems everybody, gods and mortals alike, should want the same thing, to return the tablets to Eo. I shudder to say this, and I only bring it up to be sure you've considered the possibility, but would it matter if Miracle returned the tablets? Very much, Midnight snapped, rising to her feet. Durnan's suggestion appalled her. She had not endured Bahal's touch, watched Adon die, and braved the realm of the dead in order to let the Lord of Decay prevail. Eo will look favorably upon whoever returns the tablets. Allowing Mirkel that privilege would be worse for the realms than not returning the tablets at all. Can you imagine a world where the Lord of Decay is favored? Besides, Kelimvor added, if Mirkel stole the tablets in the first place, I doubt he would return them now. True, Blackstaff concurred, surprised to find himself in agreement with the warrior. He'd be afraid Eo would punish him for his theft. We have no choice, Elminster said, laying both hands on the tablet. We must recover the other tablet from Mirkel. But why does Midnight have to do it? Kelimvor asked. He looked from Elminster to Blackstaff. Why can't you two do it? After all, you're supposed to be great mages. We are, Blackstaff said defensively, but not great enough to kill Mirkel. Kill Mirkel? You're mad, Kelimvor yelled. No, Blackstaff replied, meeting the warrior's heated gaze with a calm demeanor. Midnight can do it. Shortly before the arrival, I lost much of my control over magic, as did all mages. But, unlike clerics, our powers did not fade at the moment of the fall or perish entirely. We could see no reason for this. So, while Elminster was investigating what had happened to the gods, I was trying to find out what had happened to magic. What did you find out? Durnan asked, for the first time sitting up straight. He discovered that I was in contact with Mistra just before Eo banished the gods, Midnight said. She gave part of her power to me. Correct, Blackstaff replied. Somehow, Mistra learned of Eo's anger before he exiled the gods. Perhaps Helm warned her, for it's rumored that they were lovers. Be that as it may, Mistra entrusted part of her powers to Midnight, intending to recover that part when she entered our world. Midnight sighed. Unfortunately, Bane captured the Lady of Mysteries when she arrived. Kelimvor, Adon, and I had to rescue her. Midnight left out Sirik's name, for she did not care to remember she had called the thief a friend. While captive, Mistra learned that Bane and Mirkel had stolen the tablets. She tried to return to the plains to tell Eo, but Helm destroyed her when she tried to fight past him. Her last act was to invest her powers in me so that I could recover the tablets. And that's why Midnight must be the one who confronts Mirkel, Blackstaff said, laying a hand on the warrior's shoulder. She's the only one who can defeat him. Kelimvor did not bother to object. No matter how much he wanted to deny it, the warrior saw that Midnight was the one who had to confront the Lord of the Dead. But he still disliked the idea of using her as bait. She would have a better chance of surviving if they attacked Miracle, instead of allowing the Lord of the Dead to surprise them. If we must fight old Lord Skull, he said, then let us do it on our terms, not his. Maybe we can catch him unprepared. Carry the battle to his ground, Blackstaff asked. Kelimvor nodded. I approve, Elminster said, smiling. Miracle will not expect it. The survivor from Ilaral's patrol shall lead us to his lair. If that's what Kelimvor thinks is wise, then that's what I'll do, Midnight told them, smiling at the warrior. But first I must rest. Then I suggest we go to my tower and see if we can't dispel the magic on this. 
Blackstaff said, picking up the tablet. If we intend to surprise Miracle, we can't have his wards detailing our moves for him. He led the way out of the yawning portal. As they stepped into the street, Midnight paused to look at the sky. It was a sickly green instead of blue, and the sun was purple instead of yellow, but she did not care. After enduring the white sky of the Fugue Plain and the drab gray of Miracle's city, she was just glad to have a sun and sky over her head. Then she noticed a ribbon of scintillating colors descending from the heavens to the summit of Mount Waterdeep. It was too distant for her to see details, but she suspected it was a celestial stairway. "'Don't stare,' Elminster whispered. "'Most people cannot see it. They will think ye've gone daft.' "'I don't care,' Midnight said. Still, she tore her gaze from the stairway and followed him down the street. They had not taken more than a dozen steps before flapping wings startled Kelimvor. The fighter spun around and came nose to beak with a crow on Blackstaff's shoulder. The bird's left leg had been neatly splinted. The crow screeched in alarm and pecked at Kelimvor, who barely managed to raise an arm and save his eye. "'Leave me alone, dung-eater!' Kelimvor flailed and came away with a handful of feathers. The crow squawked, then fluttered to Blackstaff's other shoulder. Peering nervously around the wizard's head, the crow croaked what sounded like a sentence. "'Do you know this avian messenger?' Blackstaff asked Kelimvor. "'As well as any man can know the worm that would eat his corpse,' Kelimvor responded, glaring at the bird. "'Crow apologizes,' Blackstaff said. When Kelimvor made no move to accept the apology, the bird squawked twice more. He says you'd have done the same thing if you were hungry. I don't eat crows, Kelimvor replied, and I don't talk to them either. He turned away and started for Blackstaff's tower. Fifteen feet below Kelimvor, in the dark sewer under Rain Run Street, Miracle suddenly stopped moving. Behind him, twelve zombies also halted, though fetid water continued to slosh around their legs. "'The tablet's in the street, my friends,' the Lord of the Dead whispered, as if the zombies actually cared what he was saying. None of his worshippers were with him. Over the past few weeks, the Lord of the Dead had sacrificed his entire Waterdeep sect to provide energy for his magic. Miracle stared at the ceiling of the dark passage, and absent-mindedly touched the saddlebags slung over his shoulder. The saddlebags contained one of the tablets of fate— the one his zombies had stolen at Dragonspear Castle. An hour and a half ago, via the locate object spell he had placed on it, Mirkel had sensed that Midnight had brought the other one to Waterdeep. Immediately he had set out after the mage, intending to recover the tablet before assuming leadership of the host of denizens he expected to besiege the city at any moment. But things had not proceeded according to plan— it had taken him far longer than expected to lead his zombies through the labyrinth of Waterdeep's sewers. Now that he had finally arrived, the tablet was being moved. His original intention had been to attack while the tablet was inside a building, where the battle would not be observed by the city watch. He did not think it would be wise to alter his plan and attack in the streets. Already he had destroyed one patrol— and the watch commanders would soon grow curious about what had happened to it. Tangling with another did not seem smart, at least not until his denizens gave the commanders something else to worry about. Unfortunately, something was wrong. The denizens should have arrived right on the heels of the woman, but it was evident that she had spoiled his plan and prevented his subjects, and all the spirits of the dead, from following her to Waterdeep. Just then, Miracle sensed that the tablet was moving again. "'Let's see where they are taking this tablet,' he said to nobody in particular. "'Then we will decide what to do.' The Lord of the Dead turned and started sloshing back the way he had come. A hundred feet down the tunnel, Sirik heard the zombies reverse direction and cursed under his breath. He had been in the absolute darkness and stinking water of the tunnels for half a day, following the zombies and their master. His nerves were beginning to feel the effect of close call after close call. Once, right after he'd entered the sewers, he had come close to stealing the tablet. The zombies had attacked watch patrol. 
By the light of the patrol's torches, the thief had seen the tablet slip into the rank water when a watchman had hacked an arm off the zombie carrying the saddlebags. Sirik had ducked beneath the surface and swam through a jungle of legs after it. Two hands had snatched the saddlebags away just as he reached it. The thief had drawn his sword and surfaced with the idea of attacking whoever had the tablet, but had seen Miracle casting a spell, then smelled a caustic odor. He had ducked back beneath the water and swam away, while a cloud of poison killed the patrol. Since then, Sirik had been following the Lord of the Dead through the sewers, waiting for another opportunity to take the tablet. As he heard the zombies come closer, Sirik moved up the tunnel ahead of them until his hand touched one of the intermittent ladders that led up to an access hole. The thief climbed up the ladder and remained perfectly motionless as the zombies passed beneath him. He did not come down until the sound of sloshing was a hundred feet away. Unaware that he was being followed, Merkel concentrated solely on maintaining contact with the tablet. He followed it through a twisting maze of sewer tunnels. Sometimes he had to pause while Midnight and her company passed through a tangle of streets and followed no direction in particular. Sometimes he had to backtrack when the tunnels took an unexpected turn. Eventually, however, the tablet stopped moving, and Miracle was satisfied it had reached its destination. He went down the tunnel to an access ladder, then climbed up and raised the iron cover just enough to see the building into which his enemies had gone. It was a large tower with no windows or doors, one that had come to his attention in the past. The tower belonged to Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson, one of Waterdeep's most powerful mages. Mirkel descended back into the cloaca. We will leave the tablet with Blackstaff for now he said to his uncaring zombies. Recovering it would draw attention to us, wouldn't it? He paused and smiled a rictus grin. We'll go to the Pool of Loss now and see what is keeping my denizens. Then, perhaps, we'll worry about the other tablet. The Lord of the Dead turned and led his zombies into the darkness. A few moments later, when he was confident Mirkel would not see him, Sirik climbed the ladder and looked at Blackstaff's tower. At least one being in the tunnel had been paying attention to Miracle's words. The thunder of five hundred hobnailed boots on cobblestone ended a slumber as deep and as restful as any midnight could recall. She rolled over and buried her face in the feather bed, cursing the city for its noise. An officer barked an order, and the soldiers rumbled to a stop outside her window. Her dim room suddenly seemed as quiet as a graveyard. The silence woke her more fully and quickly than any clamor. At once, both curious and frightened, Midnight leaped from her bed and threw her cloak over her shoulders. At the base of Blackstaff's tower, a voice asked, "'Whom may I say is calling?' "'Mordok Torsily, captain of the Company of the White Wyvern of the City Guard of Waterdeep for Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson, and be quick about it.' Midnight threw open her window shutter, which was magically hidden to people on the street. In the courtyard below, over two hundred troops stood at strict attention. Their commander was facing the blank wall at the base of Blackstaff's tower. Each man wore black-scale mail embossed with an upturned crescent moon of gold encircled in nine silver stars. The entire company was fully armed, with halberds in hand and daggers and bastard swords on their belts. Though all of them kept their attention fixed directly ahead, their faces were far from expressionless. The older men had the grim look of veterans returning to battle, while the younger men could barely keep themselves from trembling. Midnight's door opened and Kelimvor rushed into the room. "'What's happening?' the raven-haired mage asked. "'I don't know,' Kelimvor replied, leaning out her window to study the troops." Though he was no longer a soldier and had no desire to become one again, his heart stirred at the spectacle of a company fully dressed and ready for battle. "'How long have I been asleep?' she asked, hoping the answer would give her some clue as to the excitement's cause. Six hours,' Kelimvor said, without turning away from the troops. He had seen the look in their eyes many times before, and he knew what it meant. "'They're off to battle,' the fighter noted and they don't think they're coming back. He turned and limped toward the stairs. 
Blackstaff's restorative had worn off, and the warrior's feet still suffered the effects of having been frostbitten. We'd better see what's happening. Midnight followed him down three flights of stairs to the anteroom on the ground floor. Blackstaff and Elminster were already there, Elminster holding the tablet beneath his arm. Both men looked as though they had not rested in more than a day. While Midnight had slept, the two wizards had been laboring to remove Miracle's magic from the tablet. She wondered if they had succeeded. Mordock Torsily, commander of the White Wyvern, was just unrolling a long scroll. He addressed Blackstaff. "'Are you Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson?' he asked. "'You know who I am,' Blackstaff answered. "'We've met many times.' Mordock looked up from the scroll apologetically. "'This is official business, your splendidness.' He began to read from the scroll. "'For the good of all citizens of Waterdeep, and in order to defend the city from its enemies, Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson is hereby commanded—' "'Commanded?' Blackstaff snorted, insulted that anyone would dare use such a term to him. He ripped the scroll out of Mordock's hands and read the rest silently. Finally, he asked, I am to take command of the Wyvern Company? Aye, that would be the long and short of it, Mordock replied, hastily adding, Sir. Incredible, Blackstaff muttered. I'm no general. And our enemy is no army, Mordock replied. What is it, then? Elminster said, irritated at the intrusion. And be quick about it. We have important business to attend to. As near as we can tell, sir, they— Who? Blackstaff demanded. What is it you want? Fiends, sir, hundreds of them, and their number is increasing all the time. They came from the caverns beneath Mount Waterdeep, then started pillaging the city. They've got everything from Harbor Watch Tower to Snail Street— that's most of the dock ward. We've slowed them down, but that's about all. And the griffins are taking a beating from the ones that can fly. Before long, they'll have all of Waterdeep, unless you can stop them. The denizens, Midnight gasped. They escaped the pool of loss. So it would appear, Elminster replied, scratching his beard. He immediately realized that Mirkel was the only one who could have countered Midnight's spell but he did not understand why the Lord of the Dead would have bothered. Even for the God of Decay, destroying Midnight's sphere would have been far from easy. Elminster did not see why Mirkel would waste the energy, when he undoubtedly knew what he wanted was in Blackstaff's tower. The old sage and Blackstaff had been unable to dispel the magic the Lord of the Dead had placed on the artifact. "'We'd better act quickly,' Blackstaff said to Elminster, at the same time, he thrust the scroll back at the captain. "'The men are outside, sir,' Mordock said, assuming the black-bearded wizard had been talking to him. "'Men,' Blackstaff retorted. "'Take them and be gone. I have important matters to attend to.' Mordock frowned and reached into his cloak. He looked as though he were a dog that had just been kicked, and with good reason— it was not safe to be the one who told Blackstaff Aronson he had to do something against his will. Mordock withdrew a ring, then handed it to Blackstaff. Sir, the warden of the guard ordered me to give you this. Blackstaff reluctantly accepted the ring. It belonged to Pyrgirin the Paladinson, the only acknowledged Lord of Waterdeep, warden of the guard, commander of the watch, overmaster of the guilds, and a dozen other titles. Blackstaff sighed and slipped the ring onto his finger. He had been summoned to serve his city. If he did not answer Pyrgirin's call, he would lose his citizenship. Turning to Elminster, he said, I have no choice. Elminster nodded. Go. It will be better if somebody keeps the denizens at bay. Undoubtedly, they're coming for the tablet. You know where to hide it? Blackstaff asked. Elminster nodded. Aye, the vault. Now go. Before leaving, the dark-haired mage turned to Midnight and Kelimvor. If you need anything— A dagger, Midnight requested immediately, recalling that hers had melted in the caverns below Dragonspear Castle. Blackstaff nodded. Elminster can get it for you. He turned and walked through the wall, saying, Perhaps this will take only a little while. Perhaps, Elminster repeated absently. 
After Blackstaff left, he remained silent for a long time, puzzling over why Miracle had released the denizens. Finally, Midnight ventured to ask, What now? Her question snapped Elminster out of his musings. Yes, what now? We hide the tablet, I suppose. Why? Kellenvor exclaimed. I thought we were going to attack Miracle. The situation has changed, the old sage said. It appears he is coming to us. Which is why we should attack, the fighter maintained. It's the last thing he'll expect. True, Elminster noted thoughtfully. He liked Kellenvor's aggressive strategy, but suspected the warrior had not thought through the details of his plan. How are we going to sneak up on our enemy when he can track us by our tablet? Kellenvor remained confident. We leave it here, so he thinks we're still in the tower. Leave the tablet unguarded? Elminster objected. Why not? Kellenvor said. If we defeat Miracle, we'll be the only ones who know where it is. If Miracle kills us, at least he'll have to steal it from Blackstaff's tower. And how are we going to find Miracle? Elminster asked, drumming his bony fingers on a tabletop. The same way he's finding us, Midnight replied. I can locate his tablet as easily as he can locate ours. Elminster shook his head doubtfully. Ye know how unpredictable magic. We're fighting for the fate of the realms, the warrior said forcefully. We'll have to run a few risks. I think we should carry the fight to Miracle too, Midnight said. I, for one, am tired of running. Will you come with us or not, Elminster? Elminster raised his eyebrows at Midnight's gentle rebuff. She had just taken leadership of this small company, but that was to be expected. Of course I'll come, the sage replied. Ye are going to need all the help ye can get. Elminster went to the library and took the tablet into Blackstaff's subdimensional vault, where he also retrieved a dagger for Midnight. To the sage's consternation, he could not seal the room when he left. After a couple of quick experiments, the ancient wizard determined the door simply could not be closed while the tablet was inside. Miracle's magic kept it open, in effect raising the subdimensional vault back into the normal dimension. The only thing guarding the tablet would be an illusion of a wall. Still, as nervous as that made Elminster, he realized Kellumvor was right about one thing— if they stopped Miracle, the tablet would be safe anywhere inside Blackstaff's tower. On the other hand, if Miracle killed them, it would be better if the tablet was not along. The wizard pushed a bookshelf in front of the vault, then went back downstairs. While Elminster hid the tablet, Midnight performed her locate object incantation. She nearly went mad as it misfired, flooding her mind with the present location of every item she had ever owned. However, after collapsing in a confused heap for a few minutes, the mage sorted through the jumble of contradictory directions and focused on Miracle's tablet. By the time Elminster returned, she and Kellumvor were ready to go. After accepting Blackstaff's dagger from the sage, Midnight led the way into the courtyard, a queasy feeling of dread settling in her stomach. Her magic was pulling her south and a little east, the same way a lodestone pulled toward north. She started down Swords Street, brushing past hundreds of people rushing in the opposite direction. We're going toward the battle, Kellumvor observed, elbowing a path through the mass of refugees. In the distance, columns of smoke rose over the city. They had not walked more than two hundred feet before midnight sensed the tablet was now more to the east than the south. She turned onto Keltarn Street and walked down a short block to where it joined the Street of Silks. That's strange, she said, pausing at the intersection. It's to our north now. The mage led her friends up the street of silks into another throng of refugees. She feared her magic had become unreliable. Still, the sensation of being pulled toward the tablet was clear and strong, so she continued forward. Two hundred feet later, midnight turned west. The tablet's over there. She pointed across a solid block of buildings. This way, then. Kellumvor said, running up the street of silks to where Tharlian Street joined it. He turned west down the narrow alley, then waited for Midnight and Elminster to catch up. It's straight ahead, Midnight said. They walked down the street until it reached Swords Street again. 
Blackstaff's tower stood across the avenue and to the right. We've made a circle, Kellenvor observed. Perhaps I located the wrong tablet, Midnight said meekly, trying to sort through the confusion in her mind. I don't think so, Elminster grumbled. He pointed across the road into the north, at a figure in a black robe. The man carried saddlebags over his shoulder. He was walking straight toward Blackstaff's tower, violently pushing aside anyone unfortunate enough to get in his way. Miracle! Midnight cried. Yes, Elminster replied. He's come for the other tablet. Kellimvor drew his sword. And he doesn't know we're behind him. The warrior started across the road. So she could summon another incantation if needed, Midnight stopped concentrating on the tablet. The three allies crossed the street and moved up behind Miracle, finally getting a clear shot at his back just as he reached the tower. Midnight summoned a lightning bolt. Cover your eyes, she warned. The instant Kellimvor and Elminster obeyed, the mage pointed at Miracle's back and uttered the words to the incantation. A loud crackle filled the air. A dozen blue streaks leaped off Midnight's finger and shot into Sword Street, striking buildings and people. Tiny blasts flared wherever the bolts touched, gouging small craters in walls and burning fist-sized holes into bodies. Miracle stopped at the tower's entrance and turned around. He saw Midnight, flanked by Elminster and Kellimvor, staring in horror at the results of her botched incantation. The Lord of the Dead had not expected to find the trio outside the tower, but it did not concern him. He had ways of occupying them while he retrieved the tablet. Miracle gestured at the sewer entrance behind Midnight, then entered the tower. A cry of alarm spread up the street. Kellimvor turned in time to see several soggy corpses climb out of the sewer. They wore the same striped robes of the undead that had stolen the tablet at Dragonspear Castle. The skin on their faces was wrinkled and decaying, and their expressions were dull and lethargic. Zombies, the warrior gasped. Ignore them, the ancient wizard yelled. Into the tower. Kellimvor and Elminster ran for the tower. Behind them they dragged Midnight, who was still dazed and anguished by the destruction her spell had caused. When they reached the tower, Miracle was nowhere in sight, though the rank odor of sewage still hung in the air. Upstairs, Elminster said, in the library. Kellimvor led the way up the spiraling staircase, advancing slowly and cautiously. Midnight followed, while Elminster came last. The first zombie entered the tower just as the ancient sage stepped onto the stairs. On the second floor, Elminster told the mage and the warrior to stop outside a closed door. The tablet's in there, which means miracle is too, he explained. We can't use magic, Midnight whispered. I've already hurt too many people. Nonsense, Elminster growled. If we don't stop Miracle, the citizens of Waterdeep will be dead anyway. Elminster's right. Waterdeep's a battlefield now, Kellimvor said. Innocent people are going to die no matter what. The only thing we can do, must do, is win the battle. The first zombie appeared around the bend in the staircase. Elminster calmly turned and touched one of the stone stairs, then whispered a complicated chant. Kellimvor moved to meet the advancing zombie, but a stone wall sprang up where the sage had touched the stairs. It worked, Elminster sighed. He turned toward the door. Be ye ready, Midnight. She nodded, but did not speak. Elminster looked at Kellimvor, and the warrior kicked the door open. Midnight stepped into the room, searching for the dark-robed figure they had seen in the streets. There's nobody in here, she reported. Kellimvor and Elminster peered over her shoulder. The library was, indeed, deserted. One bookshelf had been tipped over, revealing a section of blank stone wall. Elminster cursed, then said, He's already got our tablet. There's only one place he could have gone, Kellimvor yelled. Up, Elminster confirmed. Quickly, before he escapes. They started up the stairs, pausing to look into the rooms on each floor. Meanwhile, Miracle slipped the second tablet into the other side of the saddlebags. Then he slung the bags over his shoulder and stepped out of Blackstaff's vault into the library. Remarkable, he said, walking over to the stairway and examining Elminster's wall. 
They are hunting me. He thought for a moment, then added, We can't have mortals trying to destroy me, can we? Miracle cast a passwall spell at the stone barrier blocking the stairway. A rectangular section of stone separated itself and began hopping down the stairs as though it were alive. Miracle watched the stone crush one of his zombies, then disappear around the bend in the staircase. His spell's misfire did not concern the Lord of the Dead. He would soon have plenty of undead to call in Waterdeep. Up the stairs, Miracle said. Kill the woman and her friends. They've caused me too much trouble already. As the zombies shuffled past, Miracle contemplated his next move. He would return to the Pool of Loss to call the spirits of the dead. After harvesting the energy of their souls, he would go to the celestial stairway. With luck, Helm would let him pass, for he now possessed both tablets. Then the Lord of the Dead would destroy Ao. Everything was again proceeding according to plan. On the flat roof atop Blackstaff's tower, Kelimvor could not believe Miracle had escaped so easily. Where is he? he roared. Elminster turned to Midnight. You can't trace the tablet any more. Midnight tried to reactivate her locate object magic, but it was gone. I can redo the incantation, but it'll take a minute, she replied. We don't have time. Let's go, Kelimvor said, rushing back down the stairs. Midnight and Elminster followed. Ten steps later, the warrior came face to face with Miracle's undead. The lead zombie opened a long gash in the warrior's shoulder. Kelimvor reacted instantly, backing away and countering with a backhanded slash that removed the corpse's arm. In the same breath, the fighter kicked the thing, knocking it down the stairs and into the zombie behind it. Both corpses fell. Run! Kelimvor screamed. Elminster took Midnight's arm and fled back up the stairs. As they retreated, a third zombie climbed over the pile in the stairway. Kelimvor waited for it, then hacked at its neck with two savage slashes. The thing's head came free with a pop, then dropped to the stairs and rolled away. The body remained standing, flailing its arms. The two zombies Kelimvor had knocked over regained their feet and pushed past their headless comrade, intent on tearing the warrior to pieces. He backed up the stairs slowly, slashing periodically to stall his attackers. Outside the trapdoor leading into the stairwell, Midnight turned to Elminster. We've got to help him, she cried. Kelimvor can take care of himself, Elminster said. Let's use the time he's buying us. How can we retrieve the tablets? Midnight tried to summon some magic that would help, but all she could think of was her lover. Occasionally the clang of steel on stone or a loud grunt rolled out of the stairway to announce that he still lived. Each time the sound grew closer, so Midnight knew the sage was right. Kelimvor was buying time and not simply throwing his life away. Still, she could think of nothing but helping him. Midnight returned to the stairwell. "'Where are you going?' Elminster demanded. "'The tablets! Think of the realms! In a minute!' Midnight retorted. She found Kelimvor staggering up the stairs, covered from head to foot with scratches and small wounds, scarcely beyond the reach of two pursuing zombies. Midnight paused, trying to think of something to halt the corpses. Kelimvor slipped on a small stone and nearly fell. The rock bounced toward the zombies, and then an incantation came to Midnight— she performed it as quickly as she thought of it, and the stone instantly became a boulder. It smashed into the first zombie, crushing him. Then it slowed its descent and bounced into the second corpse, knocking it off its feet. The boulder tottered on a stair for a moment, then reversed direction and sluggishly started rolling uphill. It gained momentum steadily, and a moment later the rock was bouncing up the stairs as rapidly as it had started down them. Midnight pointed at the boulder and screamed, Look out! Kelimvor took two steps, glanced over his shoulder, and saw the boulder. He dropped to his belly, and it bounced over him. Midnight barely jumped out of the way as the huge rock shot out of the stairwell and arced away into Waterdeep. The warrior scrambled out of the stairs behind it. He slammed the trapdoor shut, then hopped on top to prevent the zombies from opening it. Perhaps now we can attend to the tablets? Elminster suggested, tapping his foot impatiently. 
Midnight glanced at the stairwell. Kellimvor looked secure enough for the moment. I have something in mind, she said, but I don't know how much good it will do. I can only grab one of the tablets with the spell, and it won't stop Mirkel from coming after us. We'll handle Mirkel when he gets here, Elminster said. Right now, our only concern is getting the tablets back. Midnight nodded, then closed her eyes, envisioned a tablet, and performed an instant summons incantation. At the bottom of the tower, Mirkel was about to step into the courtyard when the saddlebags suddenly became unbalanced and slid off his shoulder. He picked them up and looked into the side that had grown lighter. It was empty. He cursed an oath so profane that even one of his clerics would have winced, then turned and ran back up the stairs. On top of the tower, Midnight stood staring at the tablet in her hands. Until now, her magic had not fatigued her, but the instant summons was complicated and demanding, and she felt slightly weakened. Marvelous, Elminster said. Call the other one and we'll be on our way. How are we going to get off the roof? Kellimvor demanded, still standing on the door. The zombies were pressing on the other side, but did not have the leverage to push the fighter off. We'll think of something, Helminster replied. Midnight shook her head. I'm tiring. Even if the incantation doesn't misfire, I won't have anything left to fight Mirkel. She did not doubt the Lord of the Dead was coming at this very moment. You summon the other tablet of fate, Elminster. I can't the sage replied. I haven't studied that spell in years, but I can get us off this roof if you get the other tablet. The comment reminded Midnight that, as powerful as he was, Elminster still had to study his spells and impress their runes on his mind. I'll try, Midnight sighed, setting the first tablet down. She called the instant summons incantation to mind again, then pictured the other tablet and performed it, an instant later, a storm of fist-sized rocks appeared over the tower and pelted the trio mercilessly. It failed, Midnight said, feeling a little dizzy. Her body ached where a dozen stones had hit her, and her muscles burned with fatigue. The trapdoor bucked beneath Kelimvor, then it flew open, launching him into the air. He landed six feet away and rolled to his feet, still holding his sword. A zombie climbed out of the stairwell. Kelimvor charged, cleaving the corpse in two with a slash so vicious he nearly threw himself off his feet. Miracle! he screamed, staring at a dark-robed man behind his zombies. Kelimvor's sword suddenly changed into a huge snake and slithered around his body. The serpent's scales were covered with a filthy green ooze, and a forked black tongue flickered from its mouth. Miracle shrugged. He had intended to heat the sword and burn the warrior's hands, but he would be just as happy if a snake strangled the man to death. The serpent wrestled Kelimvor to the floor, then Mirkel sent his remaining zombies out onto the roof. Midnight grabbed her tablet and backed away. Elminster, however, calmly waited for Mirkel's corpses to leave the stairway. Then he cast a spell he hoped would take them by surprise. To the sage's immense relief, a swarm of fiery globes leaped from his hand, each one striking a corpse in the chest. Most of the spheres carried the zombies off the lower roof. Some exploded into miniature fireballs that reduced the corpses to piles of ash and charred bone. In an instant, the meteor swarm had destroyed Mirkel's protectors. After hearing Elminster's voice and seeing the fiery trails streak over the stairwell, Miracle knew he would have to confront the woman and her friends alone. They had dared to hunt him, and when that failed, they had stolen a tablet off his person. The trio would continue to harass him until he destroyed them. Sighing in exasperation, the Lord of the Dead prepared a defensive spell and climbed out of the stairwell. Elminster was the first to see Miracle step onto the roof. Kelimvor was being strangled by the snake, and Midnight, tablet beneath her arm, was rushing to her lover's aid. The Lord of the Dead wore a black hood pulled over his head. Beneath the hood, he had scaly, wrinkled skin covered with knobby lesions, black, cracked lips, and eyes so sunken that his face looked like a skull. Fiery blue embers burned where his pupils should have been. The saddlebags containing the other tablet were slung over his shoulder. 
Elminster began to throw an ice storm at the Avatar, but Miracle lifted a hand and cast the silence spell he had prepared. Everything within five feet of the ancient sage suddenly fell quiet, as did the mage himself. Without the ability to speak aloud, Elminster could not complete the verbal component of his spell, and it did not go off. Noticing what had happened to Elminster, Midnight shifted her attention from Kelimvor to Mirkel. "'Come, my dear,' the Lord of the Dead said, his voice guttural and rasping. "'Give me the tablet. I will spare your friends.' Midnight had no time to bandy promises with the god. She called a simple magic missile to mind, dropped the tablet, and performed the incantation. A dozen golden bolts leaped from her fingers and struck Mirkel, then dissipated harmlessly, leaving a golden aura clinging to the Lord of the Dead's putrid form. Mirkel lifted a hand and examined his new radiance, then laughed at her botched spell. How you taunt me, mortal! Midnight found herself trembling and feverish. Although the incantation was normally a rudimentary one, its potency had increased with her power. It had taken more out of her than she'd expected. Miracle held out his hand. Once more, give me the tablet. He turned toward Kelimvor and gestured at the snake. The serpent drew tighter around the warrior's throat, and his face immediately turned purple. You have only a little time before your friend dies. Even for an instant, the mage did not believe Mirkel would keep his word and spare her lover. She had no intention of doing as asked, but neither could she bear watching Kelimvor die. Hoping the appearance of indecision would buy her time to think, Midnight tore her gaze away from Mirkel and looked out over the city. To the south, great pillars of black smoke rose from the city's north ward. Midnight could even hear distant screams and faint clashes of steel. Dozens of griffin riders were battling tiny forms in the air. A few griffins rode over other quarters of the city, acting as messengers or scouts trailing enemy groups that had broken through the line. One griffin, carrying two riders, was flying toward Blackstaff's tower. The riders were too distant for Midnight to identify, and she had no idea why they were coming toward the tower— Whatever their reason, she did not think they would arrive in time to save her and her friends, or to prevent Mirkel from getting both the Tablets of Fate. "'What is your decision?' Mirkel demanded. "'You win,' Midnight said, kneeling to retrieve the Tablet at her feet. At the same time, she summoned the most powerful spell that came to mind, Temporal Stasis. The incantation was so difficult it would probably drain her, perhaps even burn her up completely but she had no choice. If it worked, Mirkel would be trapped in suspended animation. Then she and her friends could deal with him at leisure. If it did not work, Mirkel would win. Midnight cleared her mind, then performed the incantation. A wave of fire rushed through her body and she collapsed to the roof. Her muscles ached and her nerves tingled as though she had fallen onto a bed of needles. The mage tried to breathe, but lacked the strength to open her mouth. A curtain of darkness descended over her eyes. Midnight forced herself to stay alert, the curtain to draw back, and her lungs to expand. Gradually her vision returned, and, weak as she was, the mage could see again. Mirkel stood motionless, the saddlebags containing the other tablets still slung over his shoulder. Without its creator's will to guide it, the snake wrapped around Kelimvor seemed confused and uncertain— it was squeezing less fiercely now, its attention turned toward the Lord of the Dead's motionless form. The warrior also seemed dazed, but managed to slip an arm inside the coil squeezing his throat, preventing the serpent from choking him. Midnight stood and, carrying her own tablet, stepped toward the motionless god. The embers that served as Mirkel's eyes flared. I, I'm not finished quite yet, the Lord of the Dead croaked through quivering lips. The Avatar's whole frame was shaking. He was breaking free of the spell. As she looked into the Lord of the Dead's eyes, Midnight's heart sank. It seemed nothing could stop him. Then the mage noticed a gray streak plummeting out of the sky. The griffin she had noticed earlier was diving to attack Mirkel's back. Midnight dropped her eyes to the roof, not wanting to alert the evil god to the bravery of the griffin riders. 
Although the attack would stun Miracle, it would not kill him. The magic user knew she had to find a way to take advantage of the surprise. While Midnight and Elminster, who was still under the influence of the silent spell, prepared to take advantage of the griffin attack, Kelimvor took several deep breaths and recovered some of his strength. He thrust his other arm through the coil around his neck, then grabbed the snake's head. Locking one hand onto the upper jaw and the other onto the lower, he pulled in opposite directions with all his might. An instant later, bone popped and the warrior ripped the jaws apart. The serpent's body slackened and it began writhing in pain. Kelimvor slipped out of its grasp. He pitched the slimy, squirming thing over the side of Blackstaff's tower, then turned toward Mirkel. Mirkel saw Elminster coming toward him and turned stiffly to meet the attack. But the old sage stopped five feet away, confusing the Lord of the Dead. Then Mirkel realized he could no longer hear. Midnight, still trembling from the effort of the temporal stasis spell, summoned the incantation for disintegration and another for a dimensional door. If she could destroy the Avatar's body, the god's essence would disperse. Then, through the dimensional door, the mage could shift the explosion high over the Sea of Swords, where it would do far less harm. An instant later, the griffin struck. Because of the silence surrounding Elminster, Mirkel did not hear the whisper of its wings and was taken by surprise. The god fell onto his left side, and the saddlebags with the tablet slipped off his shoulder. The beast followed the god to the roof and sank all four claws into the avatar's body. One of the griffin riders jumped off the creature's back. Even as the man's feet touched the roof, the great beast flapped its wings to rise again. Mirkel squirmed and grabbed at the saddlebags, barely clutching them into his grasp. Seeing what was happening, Kelimvor charged across the roof. As the griffin lifted the god into the air, the warrior threw himself after the tablet. His hands clutched the bottom of the saddlebags, then Kelimvor pulled the tablet from Mirkel's grasp. He landed on the roof and rolled away. Pain shooting through his avatar's body, Mirkel felt himself being lifted off the roof. He made one last grab for the saddlebags as Kelimvor rolled away, but the griffin had already carried him too far into the air. Mirkel twisted around so he could look up toward the rider. You will all pay for this, he cried, shaking his bony fist. As she watched the griffin carry Mirkel into the air, Midnight prepared her incantations, but stopped short of performing them. If she destroyed the Avatar, the rider was certain to die in the mayhem that followed. The magic user went to the edge of the tower and watched the griffin fly over Blackstaff's courtyard, Mirkel still struggling in its claws. The great beast continued flapping, all but ignoring the writhing body in its grip. Then the Lord of the Dead stopped struggling and pointed at the griffin rider. An instant later, the soldier slumped over. He slipped out of the saddle and plunged toward the cobblestoned street below. Midnight performed the disintegration incantation. A green ray shot from her hand and touched Miracle. The Avatar's body gleamed briefly, then a brilliant golden flare erupted over the city. Midnight quickly cast the spell for a long-range dimension door and transferred the dying Avatar to a spot high over the Sea of Swords, far from Waterdeep. There was a loud crack as the Avatar fell into the door, and another burst of light washed over the city from the west. The explosion caused by Mirkel's death was like a second sun rising over the sea west of Waterdeep. When it died away, there was no sign of the griffin, its rider, or Mirkel. A brown murk hung in the air east of the tower, where the Avatar had been seconds earlier. The murk settled over a two-block area. Wherever it touched, plants withered and people fell to the ground choking. Whether they were built of stone or wood, the buildings turned to dust and collapsed, and even the streets themselves crumbled. Within moments, two square blocks of water deep had been turned into a desolate brown waste. Midnight sank to her knees, shivering with exhaustion and remorse. Hundreds of people had died when Mirkel's essence settled on them. She could not help feeling responsible for their deaths. Somebody walked up behind her. I had to destroy Mirkel, she whispered, still staring at the poisoned area. What else could I have done? Nothing else, 
answered a familiar voice. You cannot be blamed for saving the realms. Midnight stood and, ignoring the wave of dizziness that rushed over her, turned around. Adon! she cried. Chapter 17 Siric Siric stopped just inside the stairwell and concealed himself in the shadows. The overhead trapdoor opened onto a circular roof where several people were talking. Though the voices were muffled, he suspected that two of them belonged to Kelimvor and Midnight. The thief had watched them follow Mirkel into the tower. Cautiously, Siric went up the stairs and looked out onto the roof. Elminster was picking up one of the Tablets of Fate and putting it into the saddlebags Kelimvor and company had been using as a carrying case since Tantris. The thief could not believe who was standing next to midnight. Adon, he hissed, his voice barely audible. I thought you killed him, his sword said, the words forming within his mind. So did I, Sirak whispered. The thief frowned and shook his head. He had seen the arrow sink into Adon's ribs with his own eyes, then watched the cleric tumble into a dark cavern. It hardly seemed possible that the scarred cleric was alive. Your old friends have an uncanny knack for survival, the red-hued sword observed. I know, Sirak replied. It's beginning to irritate me. Midnight was more surprised than Sirik to see Adon. You're alive! she exclaimed, throwing her arms around the cleric. The magic user was still too fatigued to be standing on her own, however, and her knees buckled. Adon dropped his mace, caught the mage, and gently lowered her to a seated position. Are you well? Midnight nodded wearily. Yes, just fatigued. Kelimvor joined them and cradled Midnight's head in his lap. This business has taken its toll on her, he said. I'll be fine, Midnight replied. I need rest, that's all. Now what happened to you, Adon? I don't really know. After Sirik's arrow hit me, I fell into an underground stream and was carried away. The next thing I remember is waking up in the care of a gnome named Shalto Hazlitt. He claimed I'd been clogging up his well. How did you get to Waterdeep? Kelimvor asked, remembering his own harrowing journey. You couldn't have healed quickly enough to walk. Shalto had a crow carry a message to Waterdeep. Then somebody named Blackstaff sent a griffin for me. Blackstaff? Kelimvor and Midnight said simultaneously. I wonder how long Elminster has known you're alive, Midnight asked, glancing toward the ancient sage. And why didn't he tell us? Kelimvor added. Adon shrugged. You'll have to ask him. All I know is that I'm glad I arrived when I did. Elminster approached, the saddlebags in his hands. Both Midnight and Kelimvor turned to the wizard and angrily began asking their questions, but no words came out of their mouths. Mirkel's silence spell still clung to the sage, deadening the sound of the pair's voices. But from their irritated expressions and the gestures directed at Adon, Elminster could guess what they wanted to know. He and Blackstaff had decided not to tell Kelimvor and Midnight of their companion's survival for good reason. The wizards had not wanted to distract the pair from the task at hand. Shalto's message had only said that Adon was alive and needed transport to Waterdeep. Without knowing what condition the cleric was in, the wizards had not wanted to raise Midnight's and Kelimvor's hopes. Elminster tried to explain these things via gestures, but only succeeded in confusing and angering the fighter and the mage further. Finally, he simply shrugged his shoulders and looked away. To his alarm, he saw that his work was not yet over. Mirkel's denizens did not seem to have noticed the destruction of their lord and were still savaging the troops in the dock ward. Elminster gave the saddlebags to Adon, then turned to Midnight and went through the somatic motions for a dispel magic spell. Midnight quickly understood what Elminster wanted, but, despite wanting to hear why he had not told them about Adon's survival, she was hesitant to call on her powers again. 
the fatigued mage was loath to risk the danger of another misfired spell. Besides, she was still weak and feared that casting the incantation would drain what little remained of her strength. Midnight shook her head. Elminster urgently pointed toward the south. Midnight and the others turned. The battle had drawn closer. The city was burning as far north as Pyrgirin's palace. Between Blackstaff's tower and the palace, a hundred separate battles raged in the sky. The combats were graceful, looping things that seemed to move in slow motion. The dark specks circled each other, trying to climb higher than their opponents one moment, then swooped down to attack in the next. Midnight could tell Waterdeep's guardsmen from Mirkel's denizens only by the size of the griffins. Every now and then a speck plummeted out of the sky and disappeared into the maelstrom in the streets below. On the ground, the battle had progressed much farther north. Midnight could clearly see companies of black-armored guardsmen and green-armored watchmen lined up to make a stand along Seldith Street, which ran east and west. In front of their lines, approaching along the north-south running avenues, were thousands of the grotesque denizens common to the Fugue Plain in Hades. As the denizen horde moved northward, it drove before it the battered and bloodied remnants of dozens of guard companies that had already thrown themselves against the swarm. Every now and then some mage within the defending ranks would loose a fireball or hailstorm at the advancing denizens. As often as not, the spell misfired, coating the streets with snow or showering the magic user's own ranks with sparks and flame. Even when a spell did work, it seldom affected the denizens. Magic missiles bounced off their chests harmlessly, and lightning bolts simply dissipated into the advancing throng with no effect. Realizing Waterdeep had little hope of repelling the denizens unless something changed, Midnight motioned for Elminster to stand away so she could speak. Then she performed the incantation to dispel the magic on the old sage. Immediately a wave of fatigue shot through her body and her vision darkened. Midnight collapsed, trembling into Kelimvor's arms, then slipped into unconsciousness. Kelimvor clutched her close to his body. Wake up, he whispered. Please, wake up. Adon knelt and touched his fingers to Midnight's throat. Her heartbeat is still strong, he noted softly. Kelimvor slipped Midnight into Adon's arms, then stood and went over to Elminster. "'What did you make her do?' he demanded. "'Calm thyself,' Elminster said, relieved to see that Mirkel's spell no longer plagued him. "'Midnight will recover. She did nothing more than exhaust herself.' The wizard went to the edge of the tower and looked down at the battle— the denizens had driven the remnants of twenty shattered companies into the line along Seldith Street. Waterdeep's defenders had opened holes in their ranks to allow the routed troops to pass. And she did so in a good cause, Elminster said, pointing at the denizens. They're coming for the tablets. Why? Kelimvor asked. Mirkel's gone. Apparently they don't know that, Elminster replied. Or they don't care. In either case, I must stop them. How can one man stop a host of those things? Kelimvor demanded. Ye were a soldier. What's the best way to demoralize an army? Kelimvor shrugged. Starve it or cut it off from its home. But who— Precisely, Elminster said. Cut it off from home. He addressed both Kelimvor and Adon. When Miracle's horde begins to retreat, take the tablets to the celestial stairway. But don't move before that, or the denizens will come after ye. Do ye understand? Adon nodded. But where is the celestial stairway? Elminster frowned, as though the answer were obvious. Up there, he said, pointing toward the summit of Mount Waterdeep. Two more questions before you go, Kelimvor said. All right, but be quick about it. First, what are you going to do? I'm not sure, Elminster replied. Go to the Pool of Loss and close it off, I suppose. Since the denizens aren't from our plane of existence, that should draw their attention away from the battle. But you'll need hours to get there, Kelimvor objected. 
even if you can make it back to the yawning portal through the battle. A condescending smile creased Elminster's lips. My boy, have ye forgotten who I am? What's thy second question? Kellamvor frowned, not entirely satisfied with Elminster's first answer. Still, he knew the sage wouldn't explain himself further. The fighter asked his second question. Why didn't you tell us Adon was alive? Elminster actually looked embarrassed. Yes, well, Blackstaff and I discussed that matter. There's no time to explain at the moment. Perhaps when I return. With that, the sage went to the stairwell, already plotting his strategy. First, he would cross into another plane, where there would be no need to worry about the unpredictability of magic. Then Elminster intended to travel to the other side of the Pool of Loss and reseal it from there. It might be tiring, but the ancient wizard did not think it would be beyond him. As the sage stepped into the stairwell, Sirik slipped into a room on the tower's top floor. The thief had been watching and listening to everything that occurred on the roof. "'It's good you didn't steal the tablets immediately,' his sword commented. "'Even I could not have defended you from an army of denizens.' Sirik did not reply. Instead, he waited for Elminster's steps to descend well past his door. Then the thief returned to his position at the top of the stairwell, waiting for an opportunity to attack. A few minutes after the wizard left, Midnight regained consciousness. She immediately noticed Elminster's absence, and feared she had dispelled the sage with Mirkel's spell. "'Elminster,' she asked weakly, "'where is he?' The pool of loss, Kellamvor replied. He went to seal it. As soon as the denizens start retreating, we're to take the tablets to the top of Mount Waterdeep, Adon said. Kellamvor turned to the cleric. What makes you think the denizens will retreat? The fighter asked doubtfully. Elminster is one man against an army. We'll have to wait and see, Midnight replied. I need to rest anyway. They turned to watch the battle. In the air, the superior number of griffin riders appeared to be holding their own against the flying denizens. The battling specks had moved no closer. On the ground, the story was different. The denizens had just reached the line at Seldeth Street and were ripping through it with the force of a tidal wave. Waterdeep's second rank of defenders charged Mirkel's denizens while the foul creatures were busy destroying the first rank. Each soldier stayed long enough to slash two or three times, then quickly retreated to form a new line. At the same time, a third rank of pikesmen formed behind the second, prepared to utilize the same hit-and-run tactics. The strategy took its toll on the Denizen army, leaving two hundred of their bloated, leathery bodies in the street. But it took a heavier toll on Waterdeep's defenders, who lost two men for every Denizen— Still, it was the only strategy that worked, so the defenders repeated it over and over, retreating farther north and closer to Blackstaff's tower. Finally, the battle reached Keltarn Street, which ran west from the Street of Silver. It crossed the Street of Silks and ended, scarcely five hundred feet from Blackstaff's tower, at Swords Street. The denizens were advancing up all three north-running avenues, the Street of Silver, the Street of Silks, and Swords Street. In accordance with the normal strategy, the company of the Manticore fell back along the Street of Silver, leaving the denizens a clear path down Keltern Street. To the Manticore commander's surprise, the denizens turned down Keltern Street and fell on the flank of Third Watch Regiment, who were defending the Street of Silks. Within seconds, the Third Watch Regiment perished. The denizens from both the streets of Silver and Silks started down Keltarn Street toward the company of the Chimera, the last group of defenders on Sword Street. That's it, Kellamvor said. We'd better run before they break through. But Elminster, Adon objected, waving his mace like an accusing finger. Did not succeed, Midnight interrupted, and I doubt I've the strength for even one more spell. Kellamvor reached down to help the raven-haired mage stand, and Adon cast a last glance over the battle. "'Wait! They just might hold,' he said. All three companions turned just as the denizens reached Sword Street. 
The company of the Manticore was charging down Keltarn Street behind the denizens. At the same time, the 5th Watch Regiment, which had been held in reserve, was rushing to reinforce Sword Street. Kellimbor did not think even these developments would stop the denizens. We can't take that chance, he said. Sirik decided to make his move while the three companions were still trapped on Blackstaff's tower. He drew his short sword and slipped onto the roof as quietly as he could, moving toward Kellimbor's back. Midnight saw Sirik first. Kel! she screamed. What? the warrior asked, bewildered. Sirik rushed forward, taking advantage of the fighter's confusion. He wanted to finish the warrior quickly. The others he would take his time with, but as long as Kellimbor remained alive, he was dangerous. It's Sirik! Midnight yelled. Kellimbor spun to face his attacker. Sirik's blade flashed past the warrior's chest, missing its target by a hair's breadth. The fighter yelled in astonishment. Realizing he still had the advantage, the thief stepped forward and slipped an ankle behind the stocky warrior's knee. Kellimbor tried to retreat, and Sirik tripped him. As the warrior fell, Adon slipped to Sirik's right, the saddlebags over his shoulder and the mace in his hand. Midnight stepped to Sirik's left. The thief raised his sword to finish Kelimvor. Stop! Adon screamed, stepping within striking range of Sirik's head. To the thief's right, Midnight also stepped forward. She did not feel very threatening. Her arms quivered with fear for her lover's life, and the mage was so exhausted it might prove impossible to lift her hands for an incantation. Don't be foolish, Sirik snarled. Drop your weapons or I'll slit Kel's throat. You'll do it anyway, Adon replied. At least you'll die, too. The cleric raised the mace over his head, but Midnight shook her head. What do you want? she demanded. The same thing I've always wanted, Sirik replied. The tablets of fate. So you can become a god, Midnight mocked. Eo will never make a god of a thief and a murderer. Sirik burst out laughing. Why not? he asked. This is the same overlord who created Bahal, Bane, and Mirkle. Midnight frowned. It had never occurred to her that Eo might be an evil god, or one who did not care about good or evil. However, that didn't matter at the moment. She stepped back, summoning a magic missile incantation. He dies, Sirik screamed, recognizing the look of concentration in Midnight's eyes. The tablets, now! Midnight looked at Adon. Let him have them, she said, dropping her hands to her sides. No, Kellimbor exclaimed. He'll kill me anyway. The fighter started to rise, and Midnight knew Sirik would strike. Midnight's only hope of saving her lover lay with her magic. She quickly performed an incantation, pointing her fingers at the thief. Twenty golden bolts flashed from her fingers, then missed their target and arced away into Waterdeep. An instant later, the ground rumbled. Twenty different buildings shot into the heavens, leaving long plumes of golden flame in their wakes. Midnight's knees buckled and her head began to swim. She stumbled backward two steps, but did not allow herself to fall. Her magic had failed her. The misfired incantation astonished the men, but only for an instant. Bad luck, Sirik sneered. He turned his attention back to Kelimvor, who was rising to his knees. Adon stepped forward, swinging his mace. Sirik's anger changed to fear. Kelimvor had forced him into a mistake. The thief swung his right leg up and thrust his heel into Adon's ribs, using the blood-stained hole in the cleric's shirt as a target, his foot connected with a satisfying thump. The cleric bellowed in agony and dropped his mace and the tablets, then doubled over and collapsed. His lungs burned with each breath, and he felt as though another arrow had pierced his ribs. Kelimvor lunged, hoping to topple Sirik before the thief regained his balance from kicking Adon. But Sirik anticipated the attack and sidestepped the lunge easily. As the fighter flew past, the thief stepped around behind him. Sirik could not help smiling. From his position, and with both Adon and Midnight all but helpless, he could easily wound the warrior, yet spare his life. 
Instead, the thief thrust his sword into Kelimbor's back, putting all his weight behind it, burying the blade as deep as possible. Asiric plunged his weapon into the fighter's back, Midnight saw that the wound did not bleed, and that the sword was drinking her lover's blood. A sick, guilty anger came over her. Screaming in rage and anguish, the mage pulled her dagger and found the strength to charge. The fighter felt his life draining away. Ariel, he whispered through the pain. As his vision blurred, Kelimvor Lionsbane wondered if, perhaps, He'd done enough good in the short time he was without his curse to be remembered as a hero. Then he died. At the same time, Adon tried to stand. However, his body wouldn't do what he wanted it to. When he pressed against the roof, his arms simply quivered and jets of agony shot through his torso. Siric calmly pulled his sword out of Kelimvor's back and turned to meet Midnight's attack. He blocked the magic user's wild stab, knocking the dagger from her hand and sending it off the tower. Turning his parry into an attack, the thief dropped his blade beneath the mage's arm and lunged. But Midnight was quicker than Siric expected. She sidestepped his attack, then raked her fingernails across his face. The mage had forgotten about the denizens, the tablets, and even her own life. At the moment, all she wanted was to make Siric pay for killing Kalimvor. The hawk-nosed man screamed, then knocked Midnight down with a powerful kick. She landed flat on her back six feet away. The thief's face stung, and he could feel blood dripping down his cheek. "'You hurt me!' he snarled, more astonished than angry. "'I'll kill you,' she said, standing up. Her words were calm and even." I don't think so. Moving so quickly and so smoothly that Midnight did not see the blow coming, the thief rushed forward and drove his sword into her abdomen. Midnight felt a sharp pain, as if Siric had kicked her again, and her breath left her lungs. She looked down and saw the sword hilt protruding from a gash in her robe, the thief's hand still wrapped around it. Her intestines began to burn, then the sword began sucking her life away. Too shocked to resist, the magic user clutched at the hilt and tried to pull it out. Siric pushed, keeping the blade embedded in the wound. Just a few seconds longer, he said, and you'll be with Kelimvor. Midnight began to feel detached from her body, as though she and it were separated by miles. I won't die, she hissed. Won't you? Siric asked, twisting the blade. No! Midnight cried. She released the sword, then straightened three fingers and jammed them into the thief's throat as hard as she could. The strike nearly smashed his larynx. Choking and gasping, he stumbled away, pulling the sword out of the mage's body. Midnight collapsed into a sitting position. She held her hands over her wound, which had begun to bleed. Siric swallowed and cleared his throat several times, attempting to restore the normal passage of air. Finally, he lifted his sword and started toward midnight again. For that, you die in pain, he gasped. Barely capable of focusing on the thief, midnight raised a hand and pointed it at him. She tried to summon an incantation that would kill him, but the pain in her stomach clouded her head and she could not think clearly. Her mind simply filled with a jumble of nonsensical words and meaningless gestures. Just then, a fierce round of battle cries came up from Swords Street. Watching midnight over his shoulder, Siric went to the edge of the tower to see what had happened. Just a hundred yards from the base of Blackstaff's home, the company of the Manticore and the Fifth Watch Regiment were engaged in a confused, whirling melee with Mirkel's horde. Human and denizen bodies alike lay stacked two and three deep, and blood ran down the gutters in streams. The buildings lining the street were scorched and half-destroyed from the desperate magic that wizards had flung into battle without regard to misfires or precision. As Siric watched, a group of denizens broke through the line. Five mages directed spells at them, resulting in a spray of colors, an unexpected rain shower, and two miniature tornadoes. But one of the spells went off correctly, and a fireball engulfed Miracle's warriors. 
To Sirik's surprise, the magic reduced the denizens to charred lumps. A dozen of Waterdeep's soldiers gave a rousing cheer, then rushed over to seal the gap the attackers had been trying to exploit. And from what Sirik could see from the tower, the battle was going badly for the denizens all across the city. The battle was turning, though Sirik could not see the reason. In fact, Elminster had finally reached the other side of the pool of loss and closed the portal. The loss of contact with Hades was demoralizing the denizens. It was also weakening much of their invulnerability to spells, fire, and weapons, which was due to magic emanating from Miracle's realm. Sirik decided that it was time to take the tablets and find the celestial stairway. He turned back to the middle of the roof, where Midnight barely sat upright. The mage continued to point her hand in his general direction. Her face was too masked in pain for the thief to tell whether or not she was concentrating on magic. Sirik considered stabbing Midnight again, but then he looked at her wound and the pool of blood in which she sat. Recalling some of the incredible things he had seen her magic do, the thief decided it would be wiser to let her bleed to death on her own. Besides, with the tide of battle turning, he did not think there was much time to waste. The thief went over to Adon and pulled the saddlebags out of the cleric's grasp. Adon feebly tried to rise and stop him, making it as far as his knees. Thanks, Sirik said cheerfully. Taking aim at the bloody spot on the cleric's shirt, the thief kicked him as hard as he could. Twice. I'd kill you, but I don't have any more time to waste. Then Sirik threw the saddlebags containing the Tablets of Fate over his shoulder and left the tower. Chapter 18 Eo Speaks After Sirik left Blackstaff's tower, Midnight collapsed and fell unconscious. Adon dragged himself to her side. He tore a ragged piece of cloth off the mage's sleeve and used it to staunch the bleeding from her wound. The bandage did not work completely, but at least the flow slowed to a trickle. As they lay on the roof, Adon watched Waterdeep's soldiers defend the city. At first, the guard companies and watch regiments simply kept the denizens from breaking through their lines again. Then, as the attacker's charge lost momentum, the defenders started beating the horde back. Within minutes, Waterdeep's troops were advancing, and a short time later they were pursuing the denizens back toward the dock ward. But the defeat of Miracle's host did little to encourage Adon. Each time he took a breath, his lungs filled with fire, and each time he exhaled, bolts of pain shot through his torso. Periodically, he fell into fits of uncontrollable coughing and wheezing. Sirik's contemptuous kicks had broken two ribs, in addition to mangling Adon's already injured lungs. Several times, the cleric tried to find the strength to stand and go after Sirik in the tablets. A wave of unbearable agony always forced him back to his knees. Forty minutes later, a griffin carrying two riders approached Blackstaff's tower and landed. A tall, black-haired man leaped off the beast, examined Kalimvor's bloodless body, then inspected the rest of the scene. Finally, he walked over to where Adon and Midnight lay. "'What happened?' Blackstaff demanded, not bothering with introductions. The wizard had never met Adon, but he had no doubt about the cleric's identity. "'Sirik took the—' Adon fell into a violent attack of coughing and could not finish the sentence. After waiting a few moments for the fit to pass, Blackstaff said, "'Wait right here.' I'll get something to help. He disappeared into his tower, then returned an instant later with two vials of murky green fluid. This is a restorative. It will ease your pain. He gave one to Adon, then kneeled and poured the other into Midnight's mouth. Adon accepted the vial and drank it down. Although he had never met Blackstaff Aronson, the black-bearded man's bearing left little doubt of his identity. As the mage had promised, the potion dulled the cleric's pain and put an end to his coughing. Though Adon felt far from hardy, he found the strength to stand. Sirik has the tablets of fate, Adon said. You've got to— Midnight opened her eyes. Kelbin, she said. Do you have the tablets? She still felt dizzy and weak, but her strength, 
like the clerics, was slowly returning. Instead of answering Midnight's question, the bearded man began asking his own. What happened to Kellumvor? Where's Elminster? Midnight and Adon each tried to answer a different question simultaneously. The result was a garbled mumble. Blackstaff held up his hand. Let's start from the beginning. Midnight? Midnight told Blackstaff about tracking Miracle back to the wizard's tower. She quickly explained how the Lord of the Dead had stolen the tablet from the vault, then described how they had lured the god back to the roof and destroyed him. By the time we recovered both tablets, his denizens were closing in on your tower, she finished. Elminster went to the Pool of Loss to cut them off from Miracle's city. Then Sirik attacked, Adon said. He briefly recounted how Sirik had injured him again, killed Kelimvor, stabbed Midnight, and finally taken the tablets and left. When the cleric was softly relating the specifics of the green-eyed fighter's death, Midnight turned away and tried in vain to hold back her tears. Blackstaff considered the story for a minute, then said, I'll go and retrieve Elminster from the pool of loss. What about Sirik and the tablets? Adon interrupted. You've got to catch him before he reaches the celestial stairway. Patience, Adon, Blackstaff said calmly. Unless he knows where the stairway is, Sirik will not find it easily. Only people of extraordinary power can see it. We have plenty of time to locate him and recover the tablets. The wizard had no way of knowing that Sirik was at that moment hiking up the side of Mount Waterdeep that faced the sea. On top of the mountain he saw a wide, ever-changing ribbon of colors he did not doubt was his destination. Perhaps it was the fact that he possessed both of the Tablets of Fate. Perhaps, in recovering the Tablets, he had established that he was as extraordinary as Blackstaff and Midnight. But whatever the reason, the Celestial Stairway had appeared to Sirik the instant he set foot on the mountain. Back on Blackstaff's tower, however, the bearded mage remained oblivious to Sirik's progress. When Elminster and I get back, we'll recover the Tablets and return them to Helm. Although he did not say it, the wizard was concerned for his old friend's safety. If Elminster was as tired as Blackstaff, the ancient sage could be in trouble. For now, I'll send someone to look after you two. You can go get Elminster, Midnight said, but I'm going after Sirik now. You don't know that murderer like I do. She looked toward the celestial stairway, fearing in her heart that the thief was already standing at its base. I'm going too, Adon added. But you're wounded, Blackstaff objected. He pointed at the bloodstains on their clothes. Both of you. I feel well enough to fight, Adon said. With his broken ribs, the cleric knew he would be risking further injury to his lungs. But at the moment, his own safety did not matter as much as preventing Sirik from returning the tablets. The potion only numbs your pain, Blackstaff cautioned. It does not heal your injuries. You'll collapse the instant you exert yourselves. I'll take that chance, Midnight growled, in no mood to wait for Elminster, or anybody else, to avenge Kelimvor's death. She was aware of her wound, but it caused her only a little discomfort. Blackstaff's potion was an effective one. Do you have another dagger I can borrow? she asked. And where's my mace? Adon muttered, struggling to keep the weakness out of his voice. Though his pain had subsided, he still felt far from strong, but he was not going to let Midnight go after Sirik alone. Blackstaff shook his head, frustrated by their insistence. He said, As you wish, but allow me to persuade a pair of griffin riders to lend you their wings. The wizard went to his rider and held a brief conversation. The griffin took to its wings and flew toward the south, then Blackstaff disappeared into his tower. A minute later he returned with the weapon the mage had requested. Soon two griffins landed atop his tower. "'The griffin riders will take you wherever you wish to go,' he said flatly. "'But I've instructed them to bring you back the instant you show signs of pain. Elminster and I will return within the hour. Will you at least be here to meet us?' Midnight glanced at the corpse on the roof, then said, "'Assuming we haven't found Sirik, yes.' She had no intention of returning if they found the thief, for all that would matter then was revenge. 
Looking back at Blackstaff, she added, Thanks for your help. Blackstaff smiled weakly. No, thank you. What you've done has benefited us all. Good hunting. The wizard turned back to his tower. Midnight and Adon went to the Griffins. The riders, eyeing the pair's wounds doubtfully, helped them into the passenger saddles. Where to? asked Adon. Midnight looked at the ribbon of scintillating colors rising off Mount Waterdeep. Whether Sirik knows it or not, he must go to the top of the mountain. It's wisest to look up there first. That's easy enough, said one of the riders. We keep our griffins there. Five minutes later, the griffins landed just north of the mountain's summit. A stone tower stood atop the peak, and a covered stable sat fifty feet to the east. Inside the stable were over two dozen griffins, all of which had suffered serious injury. Torn wings, gashed heads, broken legs. An even greater number of men tended the beast's injuries. The griffins were not the only ones who had suffered. Human groans rolled out of the tower's door as well. Midnight and Adon dismounted, then looked around the peak-top Erie. Directly ahead, the northern ridge of Mount Waterdeep descended at a gentle grade, gradually disappearing into the magnificent temple complexes and grand villas of the city's wealthy sea ward. To the east, the mountain dropped away steeply, ending in the sheer cliff that marked the western boundaries of the castle ward. The eight spires of Pigirin's palace poked over the head of the cliff. Beyond the spires, the city of Waterdeep stretched across the benchland like a magnificent diorama, complete with smoking chimneys and fluttering flags. Behind midnight and a dawn, to the south, a series of wooden piers and granite battlements girded the murky waters of the harbor. To the west, the peak fell away in a hundred-foot cliff. The terrain then sloped down five hundred feet to a defensive wall guarding the base of the mountain. Below the wall, a precipice plunged into the azure waters of the Sea of Swords. But it was not what lay below the mountain that caught Midnight's interest. A shimmering path of amber and pearl rose off the top of the peak and disappeared into the heavens. The translucent path simultaneously looked solid and immaterial. As Midnight watched, the stairway changed from amber and pearl into a set of white steps. A moment later, it shifted again— this time becoming a ramp of pure silver. The stairway continued changing forms every few seconds. "'What are you looking at?' asked Adon. The only thing he saw to the west of the peak was a cliff. Midnight pointed at the air above the cliff. "'The celestial stairway,' she said. Adon peered at the sky. He still saw nothing. "'I'll have to take your word for it.' The griffin riders showed the pair through the tower and stable— but there was no sign of Sirik. As she left the tower, Midnight concluded, Sirik's not here. The mage noticed that all the walking and climbing stairs had caused her wound to bleed more heavily, and she felt a little dizzy. Then it will be difficult to find him, Adon said, sitting down on the steps to the tower. Unlike Midnight, his injuries were causing him a great deal of distress. Though Blackstaff's potion had taken the edge off the cleric's pain, he was having trouble breathing and he felt extremely weak. "'We'll find him,' Midnight growled. "'When we do, I'll kill him.' The mage's stomach stirred uneasily. She had never plotted in advance to use her magic to kill someone. To her, magic had always been a defensive shield, a means of earning respect and power, a joyful art— never a weapon to be used in anger or for vengeance. "'I won't make the mistake of stopping you again,' Adon said, remembering bitterly that he had talked his friends into sparing Sirik's life. He could not help being angry with himself. If he had kept quiet, Kelimvor would be alive right now. But I'll kill him first if I can.' The Griffin riders frowned and exchanged uneasy glances. They were accustomed to death and combat— but their charges sounded as though they were contemplating murder. Blackstaff had said nothing about the strangers being exempt from the normal laws of the city. "'I'm not sure you should be talking like that,' one of the riders said. Blackstaff said, "'Quiet!' Midnight hissed, looking toward the south. "'Into the building, quickly!' Sirik was standing on the south side of the summit, studying the backside of the Griffin Erie. 
The saddlebags containing the tablets were slung over his left shoulder, and he held his sword in his right hand. In order to make it more difficult to see him from the streets of Waterdeep, the thief had hiked up the back side of the mountain. Then he had circled around the far side of the cliff before climbing to the summit, though he did not expect anyone to prevent him from taking the tablets to the celestial stairway, it always paid to be cautious. Sirik was glad he had been careful. From Waterdeep he had seen that there was a tower and stable on the summit of the mountain, but he had not expected the tower to be close to the celestial stairway, or to find so many guardsmen milling about. After studying the area for a few more minutes, the thief continued toward the staircase. There really was no reason for the Griffin riders to stop him. Besides, even if they tried, he suspected he could rush the last hundred feet to the stairway before they could detain him. From the tower's door, Midnight watched Sirik advance toward the celestial stairway. Finally, when he was fifty feet from both the staircase and the tower, when Midnight believed Sirik could not escape, she prepared to attack. Now! the mage cried, stepping out of the tower. Adon rushed out behind her, followed by the two griffin riders. As they charged, Midnight tried to summon a death incantation, but found she was too weak. The gestures and words necessary for the spell were only blurs in her consciousness. When Sirik heard Midnight's cry, he did not waste time wondering why she was not dead. The thief immediately understood that despite her wound, the magic user had found the strength to beat him to the mountaintop and set up an ambush. Reacting instantly, he sprinted toward the celestial stairway. As Sirik ran, a deep voice boomed from the stairway. No! Stop! The words were so loud they echoed over Waterdeep like thunder. A figure in glistening armor appeared and started down the stairs. The armored man stood nearly ten feet tall, and his body seemed stocky and powerful. His eyes were sad and compassionate, though they had a cold edge that hinted at his merciless devotion to duty. The unsleeping Eye of Helm adorned the god's shield. The two guardsmen immediately stopped and kneeled. The entire complement of soldiers atop the peak came out of the tower and stable. Upon seeing Helm's magnificent figure, they also fell on their knees and did not move. Several frightened griffins took flight. The battle between the soldiers of Waterdeep and Mirkel's denizens raged on, but the sight of Lord Helm further undermined the creature's lines. On the other hand, the brave guardsmen and watchmen were heartened by the god's appearance over the city. Many prayed for divine intervention as they hacked their way through the routed denizen horde. Down in Waterdeep, tens of thousands of refugees from the battle stopped what they were doing and looked toward the mountaintop. Several thousand correctly guessed that only a god could have spoken so loudly. They began drifting toward the slopes of Mount Waterdeep in the vague hope of glimpsing the speaker. Helm's voice frightened many others, and they began seeking shelter in basements and cellars. Most citizens simply stood dumbfounded and stared at the mountaintop in fear and awe. Unlike the citizens of Waterdeep, the booming voice did not stun Sirik. He continued running toward the celestial stairway. The thief did not think Helm's command was directed at him. Even if it had been, he was not about to stop until he had delivered the tablets. The god's command caused Adon to hesitate, but Midnight did not even pause. Sirik had killed Kelimvor and Sneakabout, had tried to kill her and Adon, and had betrayed them all. The mage did not care who commanded her to spare his life. She continued after the thief, her dagger in hand. Helm met Sirik at the bottom of the stairway, then stepped in front of him protectively. This life is not yours to take, the god of guardians said, glaring at Midnight. You have no right to command me, Midnight screamed. She slowed her pace to a walk, but continued toward Sirik. He must pay for his crimes, Adon gasped, coming up behind Midnight. It is not my duty to judge him, Helm said flatly. Watching Midnight carefully, Sirik stepped to Helm's side and gave him the saddlebags. I have recovered the tablets of fate, the thief said. Helm accepted the artifacts. I know who recovered them, he replied, coldly staring into Sirik's eyes, as does Lord Ao. 
Adon, who could not see the reproach in Helm's gaze, cried, He's lying! Sirix stole these from us, and he killed a good man to do it! Helm turned his craggy, emotionless face toward the cleric. As I said, I know who recovered the tablets. Midnight continued toward the stairway. Her legs felt weak and unsteady. If you are aware of Sirik's evil, why do you accept the tablets from him? she demanded. Because it is not his duty to pass judgment, said another voice. It was hearty and resonant, without hint of anger or compassion. Nor is it his prerogative. A figure two feet taller than Helm stood fifty yards up the staircase. Though his face showed no particular age, he could have been twenty or he could have been a hundred and twenty, his hair and beard were as white as alabaster. The being's face, neither handsome nor ugly, had even symmetrical features that would not draw notice on any street in the realms. However, he wore a remarkable robe that would have distinguished him in the most elaborate court in Faerun. It fell as any cloth might, with wrinkles here and pleats there. When she looked at it, though, Midnight felt she was staring into the heavens. The robe was as black as oblivion, dotted by millions of stars and thousands of moons, all arranged in a pattern that was not quite perceivable, but which gave the whole robe a beautiful, harmonious feel. In some places, bright swirls of light lit small areas. The swirls were balanced in other areas by regions of inky darkness. "'Lord Ao,' Helm acknowledged, bowing his head in supplication. "'Bring me the tablets of fate,' Ao commanded. Helm opened the saddlebags and removed the tablets. In the god's mighty hands, the two stones looked small, almost insignificant." Helm took the tablets to Ao, then kneeled on the stairway to await further commands. Ao studied the tablets for several minutes. In a hundred places throughout the realms, the avatars of the surviving gods fell into a deep trance as Ao summoned their attention. On these artifacts, the overlord said, sending his voice and image to all of his gods, I have recorded the forces that balance law and chaos. And I have returned them to you, Sirik said, daring to meet Ao's gaze. Ao looked at the thief without approval or disapproval. Yes, he said, stacking the tablets together. And here is what it amounts to. The overlord of the gods crushed both tablets in his hands and ground them into dust. Midnight cringed, expecting the heavens to come crashing down. Adon cried out in grief and astonishment. Sirik watched the dust fall from between Ao's fingers, an angry frown creeping down his face. Helm jumped to his feet. Master, what have you done? the god asked, his voice betraying his fear. The tablets mean nothing, Ao said, addressing all of his gods, no matter where they were. I kept them to remind you that I created gods to serve the balance, not to twist it to your own ends. But this point was lost on you. You saw the tablets as a set of rules by which to play juvenile games of prestige and pomp. Then, when the rules became inconvenient, you stole them. But that was, Helm began, I know who took the tablets of fate. Ao replied, silencing Helm with a curt wave of his hand. Bane and Miracle have paid for their offenses with their lives. But all of you were guilty, causing worshippers to build wasteful temples, to devote themselves so slavishly to your name they could not feed their children, even to spill their own blood upon your corrupt altars— all so you could impress each other with your hold over these so-called inferior creatures. Your behavior is enough to make me wish I had never created you. Ao paused and let his listeners consider his words. Finally, he resumed speaking. But I did create you, and not without purpose. Now I am going to demand that you fulfill that purpose— from this day forward, your true power will depend upon the number and devotion of your followers. 
From one end of the realms to another, the gods gasped in astonishment. In far off to Serlagel, Talos the Raging One growled, Depend on mortals? The one good eye of his youthful, broad-shouldered avatar was opened wide in outrage and shock. Depend on them and more, Eo returned. Without worshippers you will wither, even perish entirely. And after what has passed in the realms, it will not be easy to win the faith of mortals. You will have to earn it by serving them. In sunny Tessir, a beautiful woman with silky scarlet hair and fiery red-brown eyes looked as though she were going to retch. Serve them, Suni asked. I have spoken, Eo replied. No, Sirik yelled. After all I went through. Quiet, Eo thundered, pointing a finger at the thief. I do not care to be challenged. It makes me fear I have made a poor choice for my new god. Sirik's eyes went blank, and he stared at Eo in shock. It is the reward you sought, is it not? Eo asked, not taking his eyes off the thief. Sirik stumbled up the stairway. It is indeed, he exclaimed. I will serve you well, I swear it. You have my gratitude. A deep, cruel chuckle rolled out of Eo's throat. Do not thank me, evil Siric. Being god of strife, hatred, and death is no gift. It isn't? Siric asked, furrowing his brow in puzzlement. You desired godhood, control over your destiny, and great power, Eo said. You will have only two of these— Godhood and power, to exercise as you will in the realm of the dead. And all of the suffering in Toril will be yours as well, to cause and inflict as you wish. But you will never know contentment or happiness again. Eo paused then and looked at midnight. But the thing you have desired most, Lord Sirik, will never come to pass. I am your master now. You serve me and your worshippers. I believe you will find that you now have less freedom than you had as a child in the alleys of Zentil Keep. Wait, the new god of strife cried. I don't— Enough, Eo boomed, turning his palm toward Sirik. I know you will perform your duties well, for they are the only thing you are suited to. Midnight's heart sank. With Sirik ruling the realm of the dead, she could never keep her promise to rescue Sneak about. Forgive me, the mage whispered, turning away from the stairway. Some promises cannot be kept. She feared Sirik had been right about the nature of life. It was a cruel, brutal experience that ended only in torment and anguish. Midnight, Eo called, turning his attention to the magic user. At the sound of her name, Midnight slowly turned to face the master of the gods. "'What is it?' she demanded defiantly. "'I'm injured and fatigued. I have lost the one man I loved. What more do you want from me?' "'You have something that has no place in the realms,' Eo said, pointing a long finger at her. She immediately knew he meant Mistress Power. "'Take it. I have no further use for it.' Perhaps you do, Eo responded. I am too weary for riddles, she snapped. I have lost many gods during this crisis, Eo said. As punishment for their theft, I will leave Bane and Mirkel dispersed. But Mistra, Lady of Mysteries and Grantor of Magic, is also gone. Even I cannot restore her. Will you take her place? Midnight looked at Sirik and shook her head. No, that was not the reason I recovered the tablets. I have no interest in corrupting myself as Sirik did. What a pity you view my offer that way, Eo replied, gesturing at Sirik. I have taken one mortal for his malevolence and cruelty. I had hoped to take another for her wisdom and true heart. Sirik snickered. Waste no more breath on her, 
she lacks the courage to meet her destiny. Accept, urged Adon. You must not let Sirik win. It is your responsibility to oppose him. The cleric stopped, realizing that Midnight had more than fulfilled any responsibilities she had. Forgive me, he said. You are as brave and as true a woman as I have ever known, and I believe you would be a worthy goddess. But I have no right to tell you what your obligations are. At the mention of obligations, Midnight thought of her promise to sneak about, then of the faithful souls waiting for deliverance in the fugue plain. Finally, she imagined her lover's spirit wandering the vast white waste with millions of other dead souls. Eo's offer might give her the means to spare Kelimbor that eternal misery, to rescue the faithful from their undeserved torture, even to keep her promise to sneak about. If so, Midnight knew Adon was correct. She did have a duty to answer the overlord's call. No, you're right, the mage said, turning to Adon. I must go. If I don't, the deaths of Sneakabout and Kelimvor will have meant nothing. She took the cleric's hands and smiled. Thank you for reminding me of that. Adon smiled in return. Without you, the future of the realms would be very dark. Ao interrupted their conversation. What is your decision, Midnight? The mage quickly kissed Adon on the cheek. Goodbye, she said. I'll miss you, the cleric replied. No, you won't, Midnight said, a smile crossing her lips. I'll be with you always. She quickly turned and stepped onto the stairway, which had become a path of diamonds, and went to stand opposite Sirik. Addressing Ao, she said, I accept. Then she turned to Sirik and added, And I'm going to make you regret your betrayals for the rest of eternity. For an instant, Sirik was afraid of Midnight's threat. Then, the thief remembered that he knew the mage's true name, Ariel Manx. He smiled weakly and wondered if that would have any power over Midnight now that she was a goddess. Ao lifted his hands. The celestial stairway and everything on it disappeared in a column of light. The brilliant pillar blinded Adon and the thousands of citizens who had been looking at the top of Mount Waterdeep in that instant. In sunny Tessir, to Serlagol, Arabel, and in a hundred other cities where the gods had taken shelter, similar pillars of light flared and rose into the heavens. Finally, in Tantras, where the god of duty had fallen against Bane, the scattered shards of Torm's lion-headed avatar rose off the ground and drifted back together. A golden pillar of light shot out over the sea, then rose into the heavens, and Torm also returned home. Epilogue So this is where you've been hiding. Blackstaff's voice brought an abrupt end to Adon's uneasy slumber. Though still unable to see, the cleric knew he was lying in the Eries' mess hall, alongside a dozen more suffering men. Shortly after Ao's ascension, Blackstaff's restorative potion had worn off and Adon had collapsed. Some of the riders had brought him into the tower and laid him out with their wounded. "'We've been looking for you for—well, for a few minutes, anyway,' Blackstaff said sheepishly. It had been over six hours since he had parted company with the dawn and midnight. At the Pool of Loss, the young wizard had found Elminster inside a prismatic sphere, besieged by denizens on both sides of the gate to the realm of the dead. Since Blackstaff had exhausted himself fighting in the streets, it had taken a while to free his friend. We might have known a malapert lad like ye wouldn't wait for us before returning the tablets— Elminster added, feigning irritation. Blackstaff laid a hand on Adon's shoulder. Well done, Adon, he said. Come, let's go to my tower, where I'll see that you're cared for properly. Blackstaff and Elminster transferred Adon to a litter, then started across the mess hall. Make way, Blackstaff boomed. Eventually, the cleric's bearers reached the other side of the crowded room and stepped into a brisk night wind, 
it carried the promise of snow, as it should at that time of year. Blackstaff started to turn to the right, but a dawn stopped him. I'd like to pause in the fresh air before we go back to the city. Although he was happy the realms had been saved, Adon's heart was heavy with Kelimvor's death and Midnight's absence. The cleric wanted to take a peaceful minute to pay tribute to his friends. Adon lifted his head toward the heavens, and a tear rolled down his scarred cheek. The night wind stole the drop from his face and blew it toward the sea, where it would join a million other tears and be forgotten. Perhaps that was for the best, Adon thought. It was time to forget the pain of the past, to forgive the neglect of the old gods. Now was the time to look to tomorrow, to forge stronger unions with the gods and shape the realms in a better, more noble image. As Adon contemplated the future, a circle of eight points of light appeared before his eyes. At first he thought the lights were a blind man's fancy and tried to make them go away. But they didn't fade. In fact, they grew stronger and brighter, until at last he recognized them as stars. In the center of the ring, a stream of red mist continually bled toward the bottom of the circle. Midnight, Adon said, realizing that he was seeing the new goddess's symbol. A wave of tranquility rolled through his body, filling his heart with a deep sense of harmony. A moment later, he felt strong enough to sit up in his litter. What's wrong? Blackstaff asked, turning to Adon. The cleric could see Blackstaff's tall form clearly. Behind the mage, one drunken griffin rider was leading another from the stable toward the tower. Nothing's wrong, Adon said. I can see again. Ye also seem much stronger, Elminster commented. Yes, Adon sighed, pointing at the circle of stars overhead. Midnight cured me. Blackstaff looked at the stars. That's one of the new constellations, he said. It appeared this very evening. Do you know what it means? It's Midnight's symbol, Adon replied, and I swear by its light and the name of Lady Midnight that I'll gather a host of worshippers to honor it. Blackstaff studied the stars. Then let me be your first. One of the drunken riders stumbled into the wizard, nearly causing him to drop Adon's litter. Blackstaff whirled on them. Watch where you're going, dolt. Can't you see we have an injured man here? Sorry, sir, said the first rider. He's blind. Bring him closer, Adon murmured, motioning at the blind man. He laid a hand on the man's eyes. The cleric silently called upon midnight to restore the soldier's vision. The blind rider shook his head several times, then blinked his eyes twice. Finally, he looked at Dawn over from head to foot, as if he could not believe what he saw. "'You cured me!' he cried, falling to his knees beside Adon's litter. Elminster frowned at the rider. "'We'll have none of that now,' the sage said. "'Adon's just doing what he does best.' Blackstaff smiled. It appears life is returning to normal. The dark-haired sage was correct. With the gods back in the plains to resume their duties, life was returning to normal all over the realms. On the river Ashaba, which had been running with a current so swift no man would brave it, a fisherman pushed his boat out onto the gentle, slow currents he remembered. With luck, he would return at dawn with enough trout to feed his family for a week. In Cormir, an army of sycamore trees that had been besieging the capital city suddenly retreated. They marched back into the forest from which they had come, each tree searching for the particular hole from which it had ripped its roots. But not everything in the realms went back to the way it was before the night of arrival. North of Arabel, where Mistra had fallen against Helm, great craters of boiling tar dotted the countryside, making travel through that region a twisting, worrisome experience. Where midnight had rung the bell of Aelin Atricus and Torm had destroyed Bane, the northern quarter of Tantris and all the fields around it remained inert to magic, much to the delight of those who had offended vengeful mages. Below Boriskir Bridge, where Bahal's avatar had fallen to Sirik's blade, 
the winding water ran black and foul. No living thing could drink from the river's polluted waters between the ruined bridge and Trollclaw Ford, over a hundred miles to the south. These scars and a dozen others would remain for generations, grim reminders of when the gods walked the world. But Toril was not the only place to change as a result of Eo's wrath. In the Fugue Plain, god after god appeared in the air, ready to search out and call home the spirits of the faithful. First came Sunni Firehair in a blazing chariot of glory. The goddess of beauty had a rosy complexion and scarlet eyes, with long crimson hair that waved in the breeze like a banner. She wore a short emerald green frock that complemented her generous figure and provided a colorful contrast to her ruby visage. Sunni's chariot swooped low over the endless plain, dragging great tails of flame behind her. As she passed, her faithful grabbed a hold of the flaming tails and were carried along with the goddess, basking in the fiery radiance of her beauty. Then Torm arrived, garbed head to foot in gleaming plate armor, his visor raised to reveal his sturdy countenance and steady gaze. The god of duty charged across the plain on a magnificent red stallion, calling for his faithful followers to fall in behind him. Soon he was riding at the head of an army greater and truer than any that ever walked the realms. Next came snowy-haired Loviatar, dressed in a gown of white silk, with a pinched mouth and cruel fiendish eyes. Her chariot was drawn by nine bloody horses, which she drove with a barbed whip of nine strands. Beguiling Oral, goddess of cold, followed in a coach of ice, irresistibly alluring despite her blue skin and aloof bearing. Then, with her green seaweed hair and the face of a manatee, came Umberly, followed by all of the other gods who had abandoned their duty for so long. As the deities collected their faithful from the fugue plain, a small, matronly halfling walked through the confusion toward the city where the faithless and false languished. She had gray hair, sprightly eyes, and moved with a determined gait. The woman was Yondala, provider and protector of all halflings. At the request of a fellow god, she was going to the City of Suffering to investigate the case of a halfling named Atherton Cooper who had lost his way and been trapped there. Finally, after all the other gods had collected their faithful, came the wounded lady, the new goddess of magic. Although her long sable hair and the sublime features of her face remained unchanged, midnight seemed even more alluring and enchanting than she had been as a mortal. Her dark eyes were more secretive and enigmatic, flashing now and then with hints of both great sorrow and implacable determination. The wounded lady rode upon an alabaster unicorn that left a translucent, glittering trail in his wake. When Mistress Faithful stepped onto the sparkling path, they were whisked along behind the goddess of magic. At last, when all the faithful had been gathered from the fugue plain, the gods returned to their homes with their charges. Midnight and her mount went to the plain of Nirvana, that place of ultimate law and regimented order, where there were always equal parts of light and dark, heat and cold, fire and water, and air and earth. As they approached Nirvana, Midnight's faithful saw an infinite space filled with circular subplanes hanging in the air. The subplanes were arranged in every direction, locked to each other at the edges like the gears of a clock. Each planar level rotated slowly, and its revolution was transferred to adjacent levels through its gears, so that the entire plane spun in unison. Midnight's mount turned in the direction of the largest subplane, carrying his mistress and her faithful toward their new home, a perfectly symmetrical castle of tangible magic. In another castle— very different from Midnight's new home in Nirvana, Lord Siric sat in silence, brooding. His defeated denizen army swarmed about him, and the cries of the damned in the wall around his city drifted to his ears. The new god of strife and death liked his new home, though he found his master, Lord Eo, troublesome. Perhaps given time, Siric mused, I will find a way to revolt against the overlord of the gods. As Eo watched Midnight and the other gods return home with their faithful, 
he felt a deep sense of relief. At last, his gods might start fulfilling the tasks for which they had been created. The overlord was sitting cross-legged and alone, surrounded by a void so vast that not even his gods could comprehend it. Of all the states of being he could assume, this one was his favorite, for he was at once in time and disconnected from it, at once the center of the universe and separated from it. Ao turned his thoughts to Toril, the young world that had consumed so much of his attention lately. Surrounded by a hundred planes of existence and populated by a variety of fabulous beings both sinister and benevolent, it was one of his favorite creations, and one that he had come close to losing, thanks to the inattentiveness of its gods. But in two of its inhabitants, Midnight and Cyric, Ao had found the fabric of the balance, and he had called upon them to right the world. Fortunately, they had answered his call and bound the fulcrum back together, but it had been a dangerous time for Toril. Never again would he allow his gods to threaten the balance so severely. Ao closed his eyes and blanked his mind. Soon he fell within himself and entered the place before time, the time at the edge of the universe, where millions and millions of assignments like his began and ended. A luminous presence greeted him, enveloping his energies within its own. It was both a warm and a cold entity, forgiving and harsh. And how does your cosmos fare, Ao? The voice was at once both gentle and admonishing. They have restored the balance, Master. The realms are once again secure.